We're going to start with, for those of you that don't have a hoop house, I want you to have one. It's probably one of the most enjoyable experiences of the winter to walk out into your greenhouse, be able to smell the soil, see flowers blooming, calendula, bachelor buttons, the dianthus family can all bloom in the wintertime along with the flowers of cilantro and the various brassicas. Be able to smell the scent of those, a few bugs even flying around. And outside, it's like 15, but the sun is shining. You know, the wind is blowing, but as long as the sun is shining, it's like being in Florida. It's pretty magical, and meanwhile, of course, you're growing tons of food. So if you want to make one, like I said, um, pri previous to the sound check, um, just go to our um, video from 2011, November 2011, where we show you how to make one using three-quarter inch conduit from any of the building supply stores. Rebar, you get enough rebar so that you'll be able to put the, your ribs over it to anchor it. You want to drive that rebar in pretty far, so don't stint. I would say go ahead and get three foot pieces for that so you can drive it in at least two foot. Um, just yesterday somebody else was talking about their greenhouse blowing away. You know, it's, it's incredible what the wind can do around here, so a little bit of overkill on that is probably a good thing. Um, anyways, you can then take that same rebar prior to using it to anchor your um, ribs and drive it into the ground in the configuration you need to bend your conduit. And then next to the end away from you, you're going to put one more piece of rebar so that your conduit is caught in between it. It can't move and then it has to bend when you pull it around the, around the conduit. Um, there's a little bit of a trick to the final push because of course it's spring so you got to get the feel for that. People with far more building skills than I do much nicer ones. Mine's got a little bit of a wave to it. I'm not as talented at that. But it doesn't really matter, the greenhouse still works great. So it really is um, easy to do, half a day. Uh, the one place where you need more than maybe one or two people is there's a top purlin, you call it. That's the top ridge piece. And that, the best, the best design came, was developed by, by my friend Greg. I had come up with using conduit and U-bolts, and that's a little rickety. A lot easier is to just drill at the right angle, and he shows you how to do that in the video, right? Holes that you, into, into a two by four, and then you simply hold that up and pop these ribs in. You, each rib is gonna be a half of the hoop, right? And you just pop them in. That can use a few hands. They are a little springy, and it can be a bit, a bit dicey there. So if you have a few hands for that, it makes it easier. It's, I don't know if it, does, does it have an A? Winter, is it probably? House. Is that the name of that one video? I think it's building a hoop house. Or if you just look up in the search bar, winter, winter gardening, winter garden, part, part, part five. Yeah. If you look up winter gardening, hoop house, any of those search terms, it'll bring up all that media, and then we don't have to forget the exact name right now. Yeah, you can yeah. subject search anything you want to learn about, but it should come up. It is an older one, um, but it still has what's has. It is the first one, first one ever videoed for oh. Living Web. Um, it was the first workshop we did under the name Living Web. We had a few workshops with the grower school prior to that. Anyways, that will give you um, the wherewithal to have that green. You can do that next weekend, and you could be planting it. You know, if you, have, if, you have, if you can do it over beds you have ready, you can plant it the same day. And if you get stuff in now, you'll be eating it, depending on the weather, late December to mid-January. Um, and that's pretty exciting. If by any chance you have seedlings, you'll be eating it even sooner than that. You know? um, maybe what you'll do is build it right over a bed that you already have established you thought you were going to lose. You know? um, all, of those, all of those are possibilities, and you can get going really fast. By the way, everything we're going to talk about today um, actually can be done without a hoop house. It can be done outside under tunnels. The thing is, it is much harder, much, much harder for you. Plants. They could do a little better under the hoop house because it's a bigger area, so the fluctuations are even slower. We're going to talk about how important making sure you don't have rapid fluctuations is. That's the key to winter growing. Um, and that's harder to do under outdoor tunnels, but it is doable. You can actually simply use the, um, the hoops, and we'll talk about all the different ones there are, um, and row cover and get the same impact outside except that you'll be very uncomfortable when it's 15 degrees out and the wind is blowing. You know, you will not be in that warm greenhouse. And indeed, 
you might have your cover trying to blow away as you try to harvest. Um, since this is about hoop houses, I won't spend as much time on that, but it is way harder to do it outside, so the hoop house is a better idea. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say if you leave here and go, oh, I'm going to have to do this next year, that you need to go there. You can actually go ahead and just do tunnels and start to learn this year. You might want to keep it a little small. In 2011, actually, for that workshop, we had most of the garden you see out there under tunnels with plastic and row cover. And it was a weird year. I don't know if you all remember, but it was a, an amazingly warm winter. It was actually warm enough that things did poorly in some cases because we planned on not having to open them up as much, and they actually got too hot. Um, that wasn't the big reason we stopped. The big reason is that we have greenhouses, and it's so much more pleasant. And my coworkers are like, do we have to struggle out here when we can just use the greenhouses? It's like, no, we did it. We have the video. We can show you we did it. You know, we can demo at any time. It's doable, but the greenhouses are better. Yeah. Um, so that's why this is about hoop houses. Um, and we're going to start, you know, we're, gonna, we're first going to talk about the different structures a little bit. But then we're going to start talking about winter production because that's where we are. But then we'll just take you right through the year um, and talk about a little bit about strategy. I mean, sometimes it's, it's wise to not um, push the season but try and extend the last season in your hoop house. Sometimes it's wise to push that season. Um, really, for me, um, the most important time in a greenhouse or a hoop house is the winter. The production is just so important to me. You know, I've never been a big fan of frozen foods or canned foods. You know, I did a lot of it when I first started growing and tried to homestead and stuff, and I was always dissatisfied. As soon as I learned that I could grow some kinds of vegetables, maybe not the same ones, but some kind of vegetables that I could cook fresh, I really stopped. You know, canned tomatoes is what I can in salsa. And we freeze blueberries, you know. I mean, if we had time, we'd freeze corn, you know. But that's about it, you know. Otherwise, I'd rather just go right to grow, eating the winter vegetables. And there's such a wonderful array. We'll cover it in great detail. Um, it's way more satisfying. So what you're looking for is hoop house management. Hoop house management at the bottom. Yeah, at the very bottom. Um, okay, so I actually have it memorized, so we can, I don't have to even wait for it to come up. The first thing I want to do is just get you a little clear on terms because it's pretty confusing. Hoop house, greenhouse, high tunnel, right? Essentially, for our purposes, they're all the same. They're an enclosed structure you can go into where you can use movable insulation to ensure that your hardy plants, which is what I'm going to recommend growing this time of year. I mean, you couldn't begin to grow the summer ones because you would have to start a long time ago. But I'm going to recommend that that's what you focus on this time of year anyways because they do best. They're going to taste best, right? All of them have some hardiness. Any degree of hardiness, if you can slow down how quickly they get cold, if they have time to move the water in their cells, that's why they're hardy, is they have the ability to move the water out of their cells into the intercellular spaces. If they can complete that job before the temperature gets to 32, they're not damaged. If they can't, they sustain some damage depending on how much water is left. You know? Um, and so that is all we're about. The first time that I had my lettuce crop covered and I was trying this and I walked outside at 8 o'clock in the morning before the sun had hit the greenhouse, opened it up and I saw a mass of popsicles. I was like crestfallen. It's like I blew it. I'll have to start over again. They're all toast. And then it came 9 o'clock and the sun shined and they were all growing again and fine. Mm. So they can freeze solid. They just don't want to freeze too fast. That's the key. That's why you use a combination of glazing, which can be glass or plastic, and I prefer pl plastic by far, except for the reality that if we were to hit a major interruption in our current lifestyle, plastic would run out, whereas if the glass didn't get broken, it'd be there indefinitely. You can get 10 years out of a piece of plastic if you have a little bit of greenhouse repair tape. Um, it's not the most efficient because it's used getting less light all the time, but you can really extend it. So it's not, you know, um, impossible to think that even if we couldn't get supplies, you could scrounge up enough plastic to keep a greenhouse going. Um, but for my purposes, the other advantage to plastic, since I'm not going to heat, is that glass is a way better conductor than plastic. Plastic is definitely not insulation. I mean, it's not going to really keep the heat in very long, but it's not going to move it out as fast as glass. Glass is just like, whew, you know, 
literally at the Highland Lake Inn, where there's this huge, tall greenhouse, you know, taller than it, than it needs to be probably for that situation. And it's glass. In the mornings, on really cold days, it is colder inside the greenhouse than outside before the sun comes out. Because it had this high ceiling, and there's rapid convection, you know, and so there's more air movement, and it's just more evaporation, and so it gets even colder than outside. Now, it still works fine to use row cover in there and grow stuff because that doesn't happen quickly. You know, so there's still the slowed down freezing period, and that's all that matters. It doesn't matter how cold it got there in the end. It matters that it not get cold too fast. That's the key piece. You got a question? What's too fast? How, how long is that? Are you talking about hours? Every plant, yeah, it's hours. Yeah, you want to slow it down to hours. If you, if you simply throw a row cover over your stuff, you know, this time of year, it's not going to freeze for way into the night. You know, it's just, it's holding whatever air, warm air you captured, and plus there's the warmth coming from the ground, and the white row cover is reflecting that heat back, and it just slows down the process. I mean, literally, in our cover crop mix out there, we're growing one cover crop, right? Facilia tanacetifolia that's not hardy after about 17 degrees. David Brandt, we had him here for a workshop on multi-species cover cropping. And he said, Pat, if you grow that in a good mix, it may well make it to the whole winter. Simply because it's surrounded by enough other plants, right, that the degree at which it gets cold quickly is reduced. You know? So th those kinds of things are what it's about. The good news is we don't have to time it. You, know? you simply put that row cover over the plants, right? The ideal time to do that, if you can ace it, and don't give up if you don't ace it. I've ever forgotten and gotten out there at 1 in the morning and still been okay, right? Um, but if you can ace it, the ideal time is when you step outside on a day like today and the sun on your skin is no longer warming you. If you step out at 3 and you feel that radiant sun on your skin, time to, time to leave the cover off. Step out at 4, 4.30, and it doesn't matter that the sun's still shining, you're not feeling the heat, time to cover it, you know? Now, days when there's no sun, it's good to let them get light for as long as you can, but cover them up, you know, about 4.30 anyways. Um, on the other hand, any time that it's going to be deeply cold and you have to be away and can't cover them, I'd say just cover them whenever you, whenever you can cover them, you know? It's not a disaster if they have to spend a day under the covers. We'll get to reasons why we don't want that to happen too much, a big one being that the more they're under covers, the more slowly they grow. But the, that row cover is your insulation, your movable insulation, your insurance policy that things aren't going to freeze too fast. You know? And you think of it that way. It comes off every morning. I, that, I realize that I don't emphasize that enough. And people just leave here, and then I talk to them later, and they leave the cover on all the time. You know? And then you know, Elliot Coleman actually writes and says that there's Persephone's time, and nothing grows at all from the, about the 10th of December to the middle of February. I present it with uh, a man whose name I'm forgetting right now who, n who knows him on the subject of winter growing at a conference. And I said, you know, I discovered that wasn't true. We sowed stuff in early December, and by mid-February we were eating it. So there's no way it didn't grow. And the guy said, Pat, you're taking your covers off every day. Elliot leaves them on all winter because he likes to play ice hockey all winter. <laughs> you know? So yeah, nothing grows if you don't manage the light. But if you manage the light, they, it, the stuff will keep growing. You know, so that's, that's the key piece, on and off. The, day, the, the days I give myself a day off are those bitter cold days where, and no sun. We get like maybe a week of it most winters, the last two years, maybe we got a little bit more, right? No sun in the teens, the plants never thaw out. There's no need to take the cover off. They're not going to grow anyway, you know? So give yourself a break and let it go, you know? I go away lots of times for the holidays. I just leave the covers on. You know, I don't, you know, if I have someone that can manage it, and I say get yourself salad and stuff, that's all the better. But if I don't, they do okay. There's a little bit more disease will show up without that light, you know, a little bit more um, opportunistic rots, especially on lettuce, but basically pretty okay. All right, so hoop house, working definition for here. Quonset hut shape is pretty standard. That's why I call it a hoop house. Actually, our plan is Gothic, and that's better, okay? I, I describe it this way because that's what most people know it as. Why Gothic is better than hoop is snow falls off of a Gothic a whole lot more quickly. A hoop house, you will be out there knocking the snow off or you'll come out to a crushed greenhouse if you don't when we have a heavy snow. 2009, the first of two very cold winters, 
early snow in, I think, maybe the beginning of the third week of December. might have been the end of the second week. I forget exactly. But heavy, wet snow coming down very fast. I was checking my email when I took breaks while I basically spent the afternoon knocking the snow off my greenhouse. And I started to see a whole discussion of people who had lost their greenhouses and what they could have done, you know, to save them. And the bottom line that everybody came up with is if you like if you make a simple PVC greenhouse that you know is going to collapse easy and stuff, then maybe this isn't true because it'll spring back anyways. It probably won't break. But if you have invested in making the hoops and stuff, that's a bigger investment than the plastic. And if you think you're going to lose your greenhouse to heavy snow, cut the plastic. Let the snow go through, you know. Just or release it. Maybe you can release the ends and maybe let it just be caved in rather than cutting it. Probably you can. You know, if you have a way to just release the sidewalls quickly and just let it collapse, you know. Um, anyway, so Gothic is better, but that's just your, your basic hoop house. What a hoop house is, is just a cheaper structure you can make, you know. Fancier ones are going to be able to be heated. A high tunnel, high tunnels are wonderful because they give you a lot of height, and we're going to show you here what you can do with that height. You basically can get tomatoes to grow 10 feet tall and lower them every time the bottom starts becoming, becoming less productive. You can do that in a hoop house, but you don't have nearly as much room to play with. You won't get nearly as much production. The average hoop house is going to be a little bit taller than you. you know, of course, you can make it any size. If you get it high enough that you could drive a tractor in or something, then it's actually a high tunnel. Um, they're more of an expense, but if you had a farm, I think they're worth every penny. I think you'll find you know, some of the most productive land you have is going to be in there. You know? So that's a high tunnel. Um, and indeed, are there any farmers here today? Okay, you can probably get one given to you. Literally. I got one to equip. Okay, right, exactly. Yeah. They pay to equip. Yeah, so, yeah, you can actually really maximize production there. But, of course, if you're using it in the winter, then you have to be ready. Excuse me, I know how to turn that off. There is no more chair. Sorry, we're light. Hey. Hey. Okay, so you might want to wipe that off a little more if you do. There's stuff back there to do it with. Okay. Okay. The thing about I'm going to go right back to the class, okay? The thing about having a high tunnel and using it in the wintertime is you're even more vulnerable to snow. They're not really designed for snow load, so you have to even do more to protect it. And there's many things you can do. Um, that discussion, I should really find that discussion on my old computer and we should print the whole discussion. It was really wonderful because everybody shared the mistakes they made, the, the hindsight, you know, good old 2020, you know? And so a standard practice for a greenhouse, actually the design that, that you'll see in that workshop is pretty bulletproof. It, it, it took the same snow with no attendance whatsoever. Not a large one, I don't know if it got bigger, if it'd be harder, but it was only about 15 feet long. It was that mountain air, and I didn't think about it until after I was done and exhausted from protecting my two greenhouses, and I suddenly thought, ah, the one at mountain air, and I tried to call up the security guard and say, can you go check it? They said, are you kidding me? We can't get anywhere near it, you know? I got to it like three days later, and it was not affected at all. Because of the steep enough roof, it had shed the snow. You know? But even still, I wasn't going to take a chance again. We cut, so what I like to do is, most people know people who have land that's had trees cut down on it, like poplars. And when you cut a poplar down, it'll send out many shoots. And if, you don't, if you're not a great forester, you may not get to thin those out until later. And so you can oftentimes get permission to go to somebody's land and cut saplings about this size. And so they, to me, are superior to a 2 by 4 They're bigger. And I like to just cut those. And then you need to put, get a board, right? A board that is like a one by and kind of big, right? Um, or maybe 3 quarter inch plywood would work. This is, can I ask somebody to just push the number one? I wonder why it wants to keep going off. Um, if it happens again, just do me a favor. Jump up and do it, you know? Just keep doing it until it shuts up. Um, Anyway, 
you want to place that board underneath, underneath the, um, the board that you're going to set between, set the, the piece of um, poplar that you're going to use between your rib and the ground, right? And I like to put them everywhere that there's a, um, a rib, you know? I like to put one of those under. Not, a, not all along the purlin, but under every rib, right? And if you do that and you set it on top of, the reason why you want to set it on top of a piece of one by is literally what happened to some people had done that, the snow load drove that piece of wood into the ground, you know? Uh, other ones, it shattered them. So that's why I say go to a, a you know, nice size, po size poplar seedling or maybe if you got a lot invested, four by fours. But, you know, it's good to have that set up. You may not be home. You know, I'll never forget, I was preparing my first hoop house the day before the storm of the century. Remember that one, 22 inches on my picnic table when I woke up in the morning? No thought that we we're gonna have that kind of snow. I mean, we knew there was snow coming and I was frustrated because it was so hard to drill holes. I needed to drill some holes into steel that it took me the whole day just to drill those holes. I never got the plastic on. I was so frustrated. Thank you. Because <laughs> had I woke up, my brand new greenhouse would have been flattened, you know? And I had no idea, you know? But best practice is to just go ahead either in a hoop house or a high tunnel, anything that's not heated, and just put supports under the ribs anytime that you cannot give it attention. You know, maybe when you're working in there, it may be inconvenient, you might take them down, but when it's not inconvenient, just have them up there, you'll be a whole lot happier. So that's high tunnel. Um, I think you get more production out of a high tunnel. I think you could do amazing stuff. You know, as we show you what we do with the, did with the tomatoes here, I think you'll be inspired. Or maybe you're already doing it, I don't know. Um, anyways, Greenhouse working definition for this workshop is the permanent structure. It's glazed with, glazed with either plastic or glass. If it's plastic gra glazed, it's often inflated. Okay, it's got a double wall and it's inflated. There's two reasons for that. The big reason, right, the, the one that is like, you know, more important in my mind is it makes it even more aerodynamic and less likely to be damaged by big winds, you know. We had a plastic greenhouse that we made for our heirloom tomatoes this year, and we had a microburst hit that, and it was in the hedgerow, you know, just totally torn up. And we were able to put it back together again, fortunately, because it was plastic, but it was totally torn up by the wind. The wind, you know, if you get a microburst, all bets are off for a greenhouse. I mean, they're not, they're not designed for that kind of wind, you know. Some people say it was a tornado. We don't know, but there were trees down everywhere, and our greenhouse was in the hedgerow. So for that kind of situation, um, you know, if you can inflate the walls, probably it wouldn't have blown because the wind can't get a grasp. It just blow, goes over it. You know, it's incredible how nice inflated greenhouses look. They also, by the way, are insulated, you know. My problem with the insulation is what often happens when it gets really cold and stormy? Power goes out. So unless you have a battery backup and you can run your fans on a battery, when you most need them, right, they're down, you know, both to the wind and the cold. So I don't really count on them, though we do inflate here, and it's nice to have them inflate it when, when you can do it. Um, me. Yes? Sorry, I don't understand inflating. Um, okay, well, I'll describe it to you. Okay. okay. Basically, you put a layer of plastic on, right? right? And then you seal, you seal that, right? To the, you know, you, usually you seal them down low mm -hmm. on both sides. You attach them to the plastic to, the, to a piece of wood or something. You know, we use this fancy metal strips that has wire, they're called wiggle wire that gets put in it, works faster, but I always use wood, you know. Um, and then you take another piece and you put it over that and you attach that too, okay? And then when you put the doors all and all that, you have, two, you have an envelope now that's pretty airtight, not totally by any means, but airtight enough because you have an actively blowing fan and it blows up and you'll see it out here. Um, they're, they're inflated by about that much and that gives a fair amount of insulation. It's much warmer in there. There's some folks whose name begins with W who, writes for, who write for Growing for Market Newsletter um, a lot. And they do a lot of winter production and talk about a lot of it. I think they're in Kentucky or Tennessee. They don't use row cover. They simply rely on the differential of that inflation. It's a, it's a, it's a cost effectiveness thing. They don't want to have to go out and cover every night. Right. And they're willing to take whatever damage the inflation doesn't protect them from. But they get lots of production because that's enough to slow down how rapidly things freeze. For those who arrive late, the key principle we're going to teach here and go over over and again is that if you want any plant that's half hardy even or at all hardy to be able to survive the deepest of colds, you don't have to provide heat. You simply have to use enough glazing and maybe an inflated greenhouse and 
movable insulation, such things as row cover, to ensure that they get cold slowly. If they get cold slowly, they move the water out of their cells. The water outside their cells works like an igloo, and there's no water, not enough water in their cells to rupture and freeze and damage them. So that's the key principle that we're going to, all of this is based on, you know, for the winter production part anyways. Okay. Um, everything else you can easily catch up on anyways, but that piece, if you don't have it, not a lot else won't make sense. So if you can, if we can, I hit this button here, right? So the little thing on the right of the mouse pad, it's like scrolling up and down on the right. It's a touch scroll on the right of the mouse pad. Okay. All right. To heat or not to heat? I'm utterly prejudiced. I don't want to heat at all. Accidentally, something I was trying to do, I, mean, I did voice to text to, to do this, by the way, and we'll probably see the mistakes in there, though I try to catch them. But accidentally, I picked up my, say, my saying, drives me nuts. And I almost left it in because it was in the perfect place. <laughs> it was like right after um, heat, where it says um, using heat in the greenhouse because it does drive me nuts. Those heaters, are a giant pain. I've never messed with one, but they are really finicky. They can go wrong. Either conk out when you most need it, or come on when the sun's shining, you know, <laughs> which can cause incredible um, spider mite problems if you don't catch it, you know. Um, anyway, so I just don't like them, and I actually think that if you agree with me that, you know, global warming is an issue and peak oil is something we should think about, I think it's actually a mistake to heat in the winter. Um, as I say here, an argument can be made that <coughs> using heat is less wasteful than hauling out of season vegetables from Mexico and California and Florida. And you know, I, ca I probably can't argue with that. It probably is more cost effective to use the heat, especially if you use movable insulation and grow the vegetables here. I just don't think that waste is okay. And I don't think those vegetables taste good enough in the wintertime to eat anyways. So I'm an advocate of like, you know, skipping the cellulose winter tomatoes, you know, and going right to the cold kissed, spicy and sweet arugula, you know. Um, to me, that's way more appealing, you know. So that's, that, that is, that's the strategy we've come up with here. When I first was starting to consult here, they actually had grown a greenhouse full of smarty tomatoes. They were able to sell well into um, December. It might have even been January before they ran out. But when we look at how much energy it took to do that, it's pretty hard to defend it, you know. So once, you know, I got people excited about the fact that we can grow tons of food all winter with absolutely no heat, it wasn't much of a stretch to say, done with the heating, you know. Um, is there a market for winter-grown vegetables that, you know, should be grown in the summer? Yeah, there is. Um, and if you want to use, you know, go to that market, then what I'm teaching you about how to grow that stuff in the summer can pretty much be applied. There won't be major differences. I mean, there'll be some little things you need to tweak. Um, about how fast they come, they come to maturity because of light and stuff, but there won't be major differences. So you could still do it. I just am not very enthusiastic and don't have enough experience to really go into it in detail there. You know, if you want to grow tomatoes in January, you know, um, I can tell you who to talk to. You know, <laughs> talk to me afterwards. I'll tell you. You know, actually nobody around here is, got, has, is trying to have tomatoes produced in January, but there are people who are actually planting them in their greenhouses in January to have them come in sometime in late April, you know, and that, you know, I actually respect the person who does that. You know, he does it, he does it, does it in a good way. Um, all right, so we do heat to grow seedlings, and that, you know, it's kind of outside the scope of this, but we'll touch on it for a minute because it's huge. Um, you know, that is, we all need seedlings, and we don't live in a climate that things are going to be productive enough for us summer crop-wise there's exceptions, things like squash and cucumbers and stuff. But tomatoes and peppers, if you don't have starts, you're going to be frustrated how late you're going to be eating those. You know? So you want to grow seedlings. And you could buy them, of course, but you rarely can you get the varieties you want. You know? And oftentimes, you can't get the quality you want. Um, and you can spend a lot of money on them. So growing your own is really is way worth it. And what I actually recommend um, to do that is rather than trying to heat a greenhouse to do that, Heat the space right under the plants. And then once again, use movable insulation. Make little hoops over that, the table that you're growing those on, right? And there's many different ways to do that. We have, we have a, a workshop, um, I think it's called... Um, part one seed study. 
Yes, part one seed starting that goes into all the infrastructure for that. So I'm not going to go, I'm not going to repeat it right now, but it tells you how to do that. But basically, I can give the example of the Easter freeze. Does anybody, it's starting to slip out of people's memory, but back in the, I think it was the second half of the um, early 2000s, um, something like two, 2006 or something, we had been in the 80s for part of March, and then right at the end of March, right on Easter weekend, we went to 15 degrees, maybe 12 degrees. Mm. It was bitter, bitter cold. I was doing a radio show back then, and we got a million calls about the dead um, Japanese maples. You know, they all, they, all the Japanese maples in Western North Carolina died. You know, it was just like that kind of cold. Um, I had seedlings going already. I was going to try and push them in, in a greenhouse. I was going to try and push tomato and cucumber production and things like that. I had tomatoes and cucumbers growing. I was not heating that greenhouse. I seriously considered hustling them all into my truck and hustling them over to my house and putting them in the basement because it was so cold. But it was just like, nuts, nah, too much. I can't do it. Plus, who knows what's going to happen when we're trying to take them outside. The wind's whipping. It's 15 degrees out. You know, I don't know if, get, if I can get them safely out of, the, out of the vehicle and into the basement. So I just went with another layer of cover over the hoops I already had. And some of those tomatoes were touching the fabric, and they got damaged. But it was minor. Otherwise, they didn't miss a beat. You know? All I had was heat cables underneath, nothing else. You know? It would have cost me so much money to heat that greenhouse, the whole greenhouse in that weather. It would have bitten deeply into my profits. It's not like I didn't have an electric bill. I mean, it took some heat to keep those tables going, but way less. You know? And so that, to me, is what I recommend the way to do it. Look at the um, seed starting part, part one. And, yeah. um, and you'll see all the different There's many ways to do it. You know? But that is a, a use that I highly recommend for a hoop house. You know, it can really. And I just talked to a woman yesterday who's growing seedlings, food for the hungry, and she's using lights. And they work. They definitely work. You know, you don't even have to buy the grow lights if you get a warm bulb and a cold bulb, cold bulb for a long tube for fluorescent shop lights. You can grow seedlings. Make sure they're really close to the light. Don't put them far away. She recognizes, and I've experienced. Those seedlings are never as strong as the ones that have had full sun. You know, if you're doing that, you oftentimes try and put them outside on the weekends when it's nice and stuff like that to make them stronger. If you can have them in a greenhouse, you do so much better. It's really way worth it. So that's the one use, the one exception I have to heating. You know, um, I would recommend highly that you, you, know, you do heat somehow that way. Um, I actually never recommend trying to heat the whole space. Um, I'm saying this, and I will tell you that we're going to actually um, not follow that. We're going to do the little note here. We're considering strategic heating. We're actually going to do it. I know now we've gotten it approved. We're going to do strategic heating for tomatoes, um, squash, cucumbers, peppers, and eggplant. We're going to do that heating so we can put them in the ground a little sooner, a few weeks earlier. Right now we're putting them out in early April because we have a whole lot of layers, what I call heroic insulation. Right, many layers so we can keep them from getting too cold. And if it were if the Easter freeze happened, we'd be in trouble. You know, it wouldn't work. We'd have to do something else. But um, what we are going to do is allow us to put them in in probably the end of the first week of March. That's going to be a huge difference for when they're going to come in because we're going to use heat. The heat we're going to use is from a biochar system. It is, you know, dynamically carbon negative. Um, and we have a great video that explains all that, but it's going to, it's going to, it's from a, you know, renewable resource from wood waste and there's char that's left over. You put that char on the ground, it's carbon negative. The life that grows because that char is so conducive to, to soil life builds on it and that makes it dynamically carbon negative. So it's actually ecologically fine for us to do that, you know, and that can allow us to supply, you know, those early tomatoes that we all crave so much, you know. Um, we're going to give them all the hungry, though, so <laughs> you guys won't see any of them. Unless you come to a meal here, we'll serve them, you know. Um, anyway, so, and we're doing that just to show the possibilities, the possibilities for biochar. That's another whole class, of course. But, you know, my dream is that within 10, 15 years, maybe sooner, I hope, I hope, I hope, um, there'll be small-scale biochar units and people like you won't have to worry about your high tunnel coming down because all you got to do is stay up during the night and fire your pyrolyzer 
and you know it'll melt the snow off, you know. <laughs> and and if it's in early December, you'll still be harvesting tomatoes, you know. And you'll be doing it in a way that's perfectly fine for the world. And early December, they still taste okay. You know, my advice is by the middle of December, there's so little light, switch to other things anyways. Yeah, they're red and they're wet, but that's about it, <laughs> you know. Um, Oh, trying to accumulate more solar? Yeah, sure. I think that, you know, I think things can be done. For seedlings? Oh, for seedlings? Yeah, totally. But you're probably going to need some supplemental on the really close, especially the days you didn't get much sun, yeah. you know, and then it's really cold, you know. So you want the backup, but as much solar as possible, for sure, you know. Indeed, I didn't do it because I, I had a job and I couldn't be there to, to do it, you know, but if you can, you wouldn't really want to have glazing within the glazing and probably get too hot for those seedlings. But about that time, about 3 o'clock where the light's getting less, you come in and pull plastic over those seedlings inside a greenhouse, you get even more heat gain. You know? And then if, you're sit if they're sitting on a bed of stone, which is where I put my heat cables, that's going to hold even more. So you can greatly reduce it. You know? And my favorite example of that was Michael Wells, who used to have Granny Rachel's eggs. I don't know if I remember there. It was the largest organic egg producer in Western North Carolina at one point. He took a winter gardening class from me back in the early 2000s and put up this great big plastic hoop house and called me up after he'd planted everything and when they were all mature at the end of December to say, Pat, I need help marketing this stuff. I've got a greenhouse full of bok choy, pak choy, Chinese cabbage, tatsoi, mizuna, red mustard, you know, and other things. But those were the ones that freaked me out because I didn't want him to lose money. And you know, we'll talk about it more when we get to it. But all those crops, right, once summer, winter solstice has happened, and if they've frozen, which in an unheated greenhouse they will do, and I knew his greenhouse was an unheated greenhouse, they're going to vernalize. They're going to be vernalized. And the message as the days get longer is make seed. So he could quickly go from a huge crop of highly marketable, greatly in demand vegetables to a bunch of bolted stuff that he couldn't sell. So I hustled over there really quickly. I you know, moved my schedule around, got over there to look at it and give them ideas on how to market it. And I'm looking at it, and there's no sign of anything bolting. And I would expect to see a few tot soys that are really quick to, to jump once they've had that light shift, once the days are getting longer. I saw nothing starting to bolt, and I'm starting to wonder why. I hadn't noticed the extra hoops, right? And then I saw a solanaceous weed. I'm like, it's never frozen in here, has it? And he said, nope. I said, I thought you weren't heating. I don't see any heat. He said, no heat. And then I saw the hoops. I said, how many layers are you putting on? And he was putting like four layers on inside there. And with that much insulation, no freezing. You know? So it's doable. It's how much work do you want to do. You know? um, and you know, I wish we lived in a culture or you know, in an economy where that work was rewarded. Because we really can't afford to keep wasting the energy we're wasting to save the work. Human, re human labor is a highly renewable resource, you know, <laughs> way more renewable than fossil fuels. But for some reason, we think we should waste fossil fuels to save human labor. Um, and if you're trying to make a living, you got to do that, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, it doesn't work to go to the supermarket and give them a lecture about how good the energy, how, well, how little energy waste it is, you know. Um, anyway, um, that's, why, that's how we will be using the heat. We'll use it for a few weeks to, as, the, as those warm weather crops are starting. And then we still have tomatoes, you'll see, and they're doing fine. And it's, it's frosted, but it doesn't freeze that fast in the greenhouse. We may even consider, depending on when the cold comes, how hard it is and what the prediction is, burning wood to keep the tomatoes going in this greenhouse. We're going to, by next year, be able to use the biochar heat in our Grandview greenhouse, very expensive, high-tech facility, um, to keep those going till about the middle of December. You know, and then, like, we don't think it's worth it anymore. You know? um, what I recommend if you're doing that, and I recommend a period anyways, we'll get to it, but it, especially if it's in that long, always under sell. You know, if you're bothering to get, because production is going to start to drop, it's not going to be as productive. You know? It's probably worth it because the demand is so great still for a tomato that has any taste. Um, grow cover crops underneath those crops. If you're doing it that late, don't miss the chance to be using that greenhouse for something else too. So under sow all of those late season tomatoes, all of those peppers. Essentially under sow whenever you can. You know, cover crops, you need it. And we'll talk about that more as we get into the management of the greenhouse. There's a whole section on fertility, and cover crops are key to fertility. 
Okay, so um, we mostly take advantage of the um, fact that all crops have their season. Cold weather crops are, you know, that's their season. And we use timing and movable insulation. I am sorry for that, folks. I have no idea how to make it not do it, you know. Um, um, there's something open or something, you know. We, we need to bring the alarm people in, though, and have them tell us how to make it not happen. Um, okay. So we rely on movable insulation. Row co Everybody knows what row cover is, right? Okay. Um, my personal recommendation is not Reme. Sorry, Reme. It's polyester. It tends to be, in my experience, not be as strong. It's also noted to be more abrasive. If you're covering things like peppers and stuff, that may make a difference. They might be. I haven't seen it personally, but I've read that that could cause a problem. I like the, the um, polypropylene ones more because they last better. You know? Um, what are we... Oh. Um, so I recommend the polypropylene ones. There are different weights, and they'll give you a little bit more insurance. I mean, it's not like you're going to get no damage. When it's, you know, 10 degrees out, places where that row cover, especially if it's lightweight, is touching lettuce and stuff, there's going to be little burns. But nothing that's going to be a big deal. You know, big deal if you're trying to sell it. So you might actually want to go with heavier weight row cover, you know. Um, but... And if it's heavy enough, then there won't be any damage, you know. Uh, or, I mean, Elliot Coleman also uses hoops within the greenhouse to make sure the cover is just over it, not touching. I, I, I don't really want to do that work, so I just let rest it on and I accept that small amount of damage. Even when I was selling it, I could, you know, my customers could tolerate that much damage, you know. Um, okay, so the one other point I want to make, I say there are other forms of insulation. The one that I think is worth noting I said that I thought somebody was doing tomatoes right here. I think that's Tom Elmore, Thatchmore Farms. And last I heard, I don't know if he's still doing it, but I suspect he is. And I don't think I heard this from him. I think it was repeated to me. But I think he said that when he used this movable insulation, he was making $99 an hour. And that's because he was using propane to heat a 96 by 30 foot greenhouse. And that's a lot of propane. And what he learned to do was he got concrete cover. This is like row cover with foam backing that's used to cover concrete when it's curing in cold weather. And that was the perfect manageable for him movable insulation to cover the outside of his greenhouse. So probably right at dusk, every night when it's cold, he goes out there and moves that cover over his greenhouse. He's not making $99 an hour for very long. You know? <laughs> but the amount of energy he's saving there, you know, is, I, don't, I don't know if he actually figured that out, but he's saving a ton of energy doing that. So that kind of insulation, you know, I've yet to do that. We've been doing other stuff, but someday I'm going to experiment with that. And I recommend you're checking into it if, you know, you're trying to do what you're doing, trying to grow seedlings without having to use any heat at all or as little heat as possible. Um, but so that's, you know, and there are other things you can use. More layers of plastic work for insulation. It really doesn't matter at all. But one, one tip I can give you um, one year, just trying to save our garden from frost, back before we had row cover very much, just, just row cover was new to us, we just had a little bit of it. And so we were using, you know, sheets, you know, humorous, you know, what our, what our garden looked like trying to keep the frost from hitting it, right? And um, one bed of basil was big enough that I didn't have enough row cover to cover it, so I threw pretty thick blue tarp over half of it and a lightweight piece of row cover over the other half. It came out in the morning, logic would tell me that that heavier tarp would have been where it didn't freeze and the lighter weight row cover would be where it froze. Black dead basil where the tarp was, fine basil where the row cover was. My conclusion, the black, blue rather, dark blue, is sucking heat, right? The heat's just getting sucked out of it, right? And the white is reflecting the heat back in. You mean yeah. in the morning? What? It was covered at night. It was covered at night, yeah, yeah. So the, is it sucking it at night? Basically, Without dark. light hitting it? Um, that's my guess. I mean, I know the, my windows, you know, in my house, sucking it out all night long, you know. There's no reflection there, you know. It's more conductive, you know, than the row cover, basically. You know, so I guess maybe that leaking is a better word than sucking it, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. But that plastic, you know, glass would be even more conductive, but that plastic is more conductive, you know, than that, that row cover even though it was the lightweight, it wasn't the lightest weight, now it wasn't insect barrier, it was four degrees or something frost protecting, but it wasn't the heavyweight cover. I didn't expect it to do much of anything for basil, yeah, you know? 
and yet the basal was fine under the row cover and not. So just know that if you're using insulation, color matters, you know. Um, and reflective, reflective, you know, when, if you're buying a tarp somehow to protect stuff, the silver tarps are way better than the blue ones. You know, they're going to make a big difference. It's going to help you a lot, you know. Okay, so that's movable insulation. Um, and it's, it's the key. I think everybody gets that concept, right? I mean, the, the more threatened you are, the more layers of insulation. It just depends on, that's why I call it heroic insulation, because at some point, you know, you may decide this is just too much work. I'm not going to try and save this crop this, in this situation, like peppers or something. You, know, you can actually pe keep peppers going way into the cold with movable insulation and a greenhouse. And there's a reward for that because they get sweeter and sweeter the colder it is. You know? So the best peppers you're going to grow all year are going to be your November peppers that you manage to keep going because you use movable insulation. You know? So it's, it's, it's kind of worth it. You know? Now, eggplant, I don't know if it's any difference at all. And I've noticed that we have, we have eggplant that's this tall in our greenhouse. You know? um, but the production at this point, I don't even know that it's bothered. I mean, except for the fact that we're just, just going to grow co um, cover crop underneath it. So there's no reason not to take, to take it out. And we're getting a little bit of eggplant. That's fine. But if I was looking at it for the productive value per foot in an expensive greenhouse, it'd be gone. It's just not producing enough this time of year. You know, it really wants that heat and humidity. Peppers, on the other hand, they're tougher than you think. They really hate the cold in the springtime. They can be stunted if they go below 50 in the springtime. But once they're in fruit, they don't want to stop, you know. And the flavor is pretty spectacular. So I, I say the movable insulation in that situation depends on how much you like, you know, sweet red peppers or sweet orange peppers. You know, you just have to make your own call on that. Um, okay, so because it's November, we're going to talk winter production first. But, you know, I'm thinking that Right here is a good place to stop and show you some stuff outside while it's still kind of nice outside. And if we break up the talking part, it makes life easier. So why don't we just know we're going to come back to that, OK? Um, and by the way, all of this, I'd hope to print it. And the printer's being recalcitrant. We got a new printer, and I got it to work the other day. And for some reason, it doesn't want to. But it's all going to be posted online, so you'll be able to see it all online. Um, and indeed, there's also a calendar that I did for the grower's school that's way more detailed than anything I have here. I'm going to get that posted, too. Um, and then if we have time, I realized I'd done another whole talk, and I have another whole thing like this. And we'll look at that and see if there's anything. You know, it changes every year. So we'll go over that if we have time. All right, so let's just head out. OK, so why, we're looking, why are we looking at a garden when we're talking about um, green hoop house production? Because everything that you see covered here and growing here can be grown in a hoop house. I brought two books down to show you. One is The Garden Problem Solver by Jeff Fall. And this was back in the 70s that he wrote this, or maybe it was the 80s. And it's a great book. I highly recommend it. But he's way more pessimistic about the possibilities of what you can grow in a greenhouse than I am. Through experimentation, I've learned that you can grow virtually anything in a hoop house. And so all the stuff that's out here can be grown in a hoop house. And indeed, when you get to our greenhouse, you'll see that a lot of our stuff is real small because we're going to first use the space out here and harvest out here and take the max and then have those crops be younger in the greenhouse. Now, at a certain point, younger is not a virtue anymore. If you are growing things like kale and collards, and I've learned the hard way, I've seeded those into the soil or put very little transplants out in the middle of December, they were the first ones to bolt. They got enough cold and they just didn't have enough resources. They weren't big enough, you know, so they just went for it quicker. You know, plants make seed based on what their possibilities are, you know. So, I don't, you know, we got our kale and collards in already, and they'll be fine. They will not, they're all going to bolt eventually. I just don't want them to be bolting in like mid February, you know, which my stuff that I had, you know, it was just getting ready to start producing and it was bolting just because it didn't have enough and it had enough of the shift in light, but not enough, um, you know, buildup of um, ma massive leaves and roots for it to, you know, think it was worth, the, you know, trying to push it longer. Um, okay, so. Basically, we have everything covered with row cover that we gambled need it right now, okay? So we'll look around. This is something that actually we, I don't know that we have them in the greenhouse right now. I'm probably going to transplant some in. Kind of missed a beat on that. But calendula, everybody know the concept of farmscaping? Anybody not know it? Farmscaping is growing plants, great diversities of plants, many of them flowering and with shapes that support 
incredibly diverse insect life. You have that insect life, you have balance. You don't worry about what bugs you have because they all take care of each other. You just create maximum diversity. So this time of year, plants that flower are put out nectar even when they're not flowering. Things like um, vetch, fava beans, bachelor buttons, they all have extra floral nectaries, right? So they're putting out nectar even when they're not in flower. Those plants are gold in a greenhouse, you know? And we're kind of behind on them this year, but fortunately I got seedlings out here, I can move them in. So you want to have those here. This time of year, you'll have calendula blooming. If you get your bachelor button in early enough, it will even start to bloom, not usually this side of the, of the, of the solstice, but very soon after um, winter solstice, it'll start to bloom. Things like cilantro, you know, they'll bloom. They'll take way longer in the wintertime, but they will bloom eventually, you know. Um, cilantro is one of my favorite for blooming, blooming quickly in most situations, but in the winter it's slower, which is nice because you get more leaf. Anyways, carrots, quite hardy. Um, in a greenhouse, you probably never have to worry about the, um, you know, and this is famous last words, right? I mean, the polar vortex the last two years was pretty brutal. We're going to see bigger and bigger shifts as our weather becomes less stable. There may be a deep enough cold where the carrots would take some damage without cover. But mostly in a greenhouse, you probably don't have to use any cover at all. You know, Out here, next deep cold, we'll probably put cover over them. Then eventually the tops will take some damage and then we'll just, whatever we haven't harvested, we'll put leaves over them. You don't want those tops of the carrots where they're sticking out of the ground to freeze because that damage will then go down through the whole carrot, it'll rot away. You, know? you won't lose the carrot immediately, but it won't hold nearly as long. So you want that kind of protection, okay? All right. Um, you know, you can certainly grow cabbage in the greenhouse. We don't. Um, we grow pak choy and um, Chinese cabbage. But cabbage, because it stores so well and because it is so cold hardy, we can keep it way into the winter outside. We tend not to use our greenhouse space for that. Um, we do have rutabagas in here too. I'll show you those. And they're doing wonderfully outside and with the cover will go far into the winter. And one year in Silo, I simply took plastic, leftover greenhouse plastic and laid it, didn't use any hoops at all, laid it on top of my rutabagas and they never froze enough to damage and they were spectacular in the springtime. All that cold, when they've had lots of cold and grown through the winter, they get, they get an orange color and the flavor is so rich, and there's none of that nasty flavor that comes from poorly grown ones. Really spectacular. Um, well, another one that's great to have in the greenhouse is borage. Um, as Brinkley Benson, who did a spectacular job establishing the farmscaping program at Virginia Tech, said, keep it in check. It'll take over very readily. It's a, it's a ready self-seeder. It gets big. It can take over your greenhouse, so you be in control, right? I mean, you get lots of seedlings, you decide which ones get to stay. You know, it does, just because it made the seedlings doesn't mean you have to let them be there. So these are the rutabagas. You can see that they're sizing up nicely. Um, for those who don't know it, rutabaga greens are as good as kale. So it's a double vegetable. You can really get a lot of food out of them. If you think you don't like rutabagas, which I didn't, I hated them. Eat some homegrown ones that had some cold. Change the story. It's a game changer. Totally. Um, I literally took to eating them for breakfast, that and roots. And my partner looked up at me one morning after eating a breakfast of that and said, my hero. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, we eat these breakfasts and I got energy all day. You know, um, just nutrient dense, you know, spectacular. We had parsnips that were winter, winter grown and rutabagas winter squash, sweet potatoes, things like that for breakfast. Woo, good stuff. Okay, so. When did you plant your uh, set, cabbage sets out? These cabbages went out the beginning of the first week of August. And they're long season cabbage. You know, we grow them for the big ones to make kraut with and have lots to donate, you know. And the um, rutabagas too? Rutabagas actually went in incredibly late. Yeah. I'm really impressed with how they did. I got them out on time at this four acre field that we have not improved nearly as much. They don't look near as good as these do. The fertility here, we do no till, maximize cover crops and stuff. I don't believe how those things jumped. They went in, I think it was the third week of August. I was way impressed with how well they did, you know? It might have been the first week of September, you know? When I saw their size, I did a double take. <laughs> you know? 
big time. Um, okay, so any questions so far? All right. Something that I didn't put in and I haven't done, but I've read about, and you might want to consider it, you can do strawberries in a greenhouse. And there's a specific one called Festival, a day neutral one, that a company called Cottle um, Nursery, C-O-T-T-L-E, um, they do organic production, they're on the coastal plain of North Carolina. They can sell you conditioned plugs that'll start bearing if you put them in in early September, I think, in December and bear straight through the winter. You know, as you can see, our day neutrals are bearing right now, but they won't bear like those conditioned plugs will. So you might consider, you know, a hoop house with strawberries in it. You know, um, I haven't gotten there yet, but if the spotted wing Drosophila keeps after me long enough, I'm going to do it. You know, because they're not going to be flying in the winter. You know, so um, it might be an option. Um, and so notice the cover crops. They should be growing underneath any of your um, summer cover crops. You want to just sow them under as the season you know, progresses. In the height of the summer, they're not going to do very well because those plants are going to be so thick. But as your season progresses, those tomatoes are going to start to drop leaves. There's actually even a term in the commercial growers world, I forget it, for the leaf drop that occurs no matter what people do towards you know, end of August into September. Tomatoes just start to thin out a little. At that point, are the peppers get taller, there's more light underneath, sow that cover crop. So when you harvest those out, you got to cover, even if you're going to go right back into another production, you've, had, you've gotten a cover crop to grow there. And you want to do that. You want that diversity. You want all that diversity of plant exudates feeding your soil life, not just tomatoes. You know, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with what tomatoes give back to the soil, but especially if you can't move your greenhouse, it's going to get old and diseases will take advantage of that. So you want to kind of... At that stage, plants. at that stage, those plants rule and the cover crop is okay. just like, can I please have some light? Can oh, I yeah. please get, you know, like, okay. you know, yeah, early enough you could cause problems. But no, I've never seen it. Be, I think actually it's helping them. Okay. It's creating that diversity. You know, I, I give this, if, if you've been to enough of my talks, you've heard this one before, but I have to tell it every time because it changed how I grow. And it's key for us to all know, right? Plants put 50, anybody else want to say it with me now? 50 to 80% right, of what they photosynthesize below the soil, yeah. right? Okay, 30 to 50% of that, they exude out of their roots to feed their microbial community. Mm. When I learned this, it changed everything I did about growing. Yeah. I got cover crops in a way like I never got it. That, that sun is your fertility engine, and it is pumping food into the soil all the time through plants. So the more plants you have out there, the more fertile your farm. Mm. So getting that cover crop established underneath is, it's a it's a major plus. It'll do really good things for you. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, you're speaking of chickweed. <laughs> Chickweed's a great. It is a wonderful crop. It's one downside is its incredible um, ability to pro proliferate. You know. I mean, it's you know. I had a a point in our garden in Silo where Diane said, "Can you leave the um, chickweed in for me to harvest?" And I realized after one season, can we just pick one bed we do that in? Because she couldn't keep up with it in one bed. And my whole garden was covered up in chickweed. But it's incredibly good for you, incredibly productive. I have nothing but praise for it. And do you know you can go into a store in some places and buy chickweed killer? A poison made just to kill chickweed. <laughs> anyway, beets outside. These will make some decent beets. Had we planted these in the greenhouse, and you see we did too. Much bigger, much nicer, you know, way more productive. A tip I always want to give whenever I'm showing beets, talking about beets, if you can't grow beets, test, test for boron. If you're low in boron, just figure out how to get some boron. It takes very little, you know. I mean, people that aren't certifying organic will often just use um, borax. You know, that, that is just, you know, it's just boron. And I think it's two teaspoons or ta two tablespoons. Look it up because two tablespoons might be too much if it's, if it's two teaspoons. In a, in a watering can, just water it over that, those beets when they first go in, and boom, you'll go from beets this big to beets that big. Mm -hmm. It's a huge difference, yeah. What are the bugs? There's, we have trouble with bugs on our fall beets. Are you sure it's... When we're just seedling. And it, they'll be coming up looking good, and then they're dying left and right. 
You sure it's bugs and not um, Cercospora? Because Cercospora is those red spots, and as they progress, they leave holes. And it's a major problem. If you're trying to get those beets in when it's still too hot and humid, it'll cause you problems. What time, what time of year are you putting them in? Yeah, see, I, I bet it's Cercospora. If you look close, I don't know, but now, okay, the other one? Yeah, here's, here, thank you. You can see the Cercospora right here. You know, Doc is, by the way, the vector. It's, it's where it hangs out. You know, it's the typhoid Mary. You know, so it's a, it's a serious problem. Um, the other thing that might be putting holes in your beets and chard, though? It's not so much holes as they just want to die. I think that's probably um, Cercospora. But if it were holes, especially if those holes are very neatly along the spaces between the veins, that's goldfinches. Goldfinches. Oh, goldfinches, yes. Goldfinches are salt junkies. And <laughs> chard and beets are quite high in sodium. So they can be a problem, you know. I mean, I have a hard time saying goldfinches are a problem ever, but, you know, <laughs> they can be a problem. You want to be aware of that. So. We have beets out here. We have, the irony is the beets inside went in much later than out here, and they're starting to catch up with the ones out here. You know? And that's actually, if you just do tunnels, if you don't get to a greenhouse this year, a major mistake that can be made, and I was consulting, and, and Rocco was doing the growing here, and he'd done a great job all season, and all of a sudden the fall production wasn't what I expected. And finally I came down and I realized the covers were off, and it was a day like this, you know. And I said, why? I mean, not the covers, the plastic glazing, the tunnels. The covers should have been off, right? But plastic glazing was on all these crops so they'd keep growing. And he said, well, Pat, it's not going to freeze. It's not going to be hurt. And I said, that's not the only reason that that cover's out there. It's because with the plastic over it, it's like being in Georgia. Yeah. You know, it's much warmer. You get more growth, you know. So you don't, you know, take that plastic off on days like today. You want that warmth. You want to push that growth. You know? Yeah. This fabric that you have on here, is that like a spun bonnet? That is the polypropylene row cover. Uh -huh. And yeah. you just leave it on there? No, it's only on because it's going to be so cold and it's Saturday. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> you know, but normally you would take it off during the day? You know, we, we actually are a little lazy. We, at this time of year, if we know it's going to freeze for two nights, we'll leave it on for those two nights. Because then there's going to be a prolonged period of warm and it won't have to be on. So we just save the work and we leave it on for two nights, you know. If you're really trying to maximize production, you take it off every day. You know, um, for light, but you know, it's a kind of a toss up. It depends on how cold it is because it's getting less light. I think about 15% less. Okay. But it's getting more warmth. So I'm not really sure right where that is. You know, with, with plastic, I'd know for sure you leave it on, you know, and you have it open on the end so it doesn't get too hot, but you let that light get through and the warmth happen. And you leave it on there when it's the coldest or like just all the time? Um, this time of year, you can just leave it on, you know, so you, you, that's what you would call a glaze. Uh, that's a glazing, yeah, right, yeah. That's you know, my it might be a misuse of the terminology, but this is this is the insulation, but we're using it in the over the structure like a glazing, you know. Um, that's just for convenience, you know. Um, we're not going to go to plastic, but if if you were trying to do production and didn't have all the greenhouses we're gifted with, um, then you would at some point slide this cover down so it was laying right on top, but then off it during the um, war, during the um, daytime and then have plastic over the top. And that's the plastic you'd leave on all the time this time of year, but keep the ends open. You know, I say all the time, freaky weather, we get up in the high 70s or something, like we did last Friday, take that plastic off. Yeah. You know, then it's gonna get too hot, you know. We have really weird weather in the mountains. You know? So you have to, you know, there isn't, there is no rule of thumb, you gotta kinda tweak it a little bit here and there. You know, but by and large, you can leave it on. 2011, for those that were here early enough to hear it, we planned on leaving it on all winter and we ran into trouble because it was so warm for so much of the winter. It just got too hot under there, you know? I mean, the little bit of too hot you can get this time of year isn't enough to hurt the plants, and labor-wise, it's okay to do it, you know? Um, if it's way warm all the time, then you're gonna have to put, take it on and off, you know? And then you quickly decide how much you like outside tunnels compared to taking that half day to make that hoop house, you know? Um, I'm a big fan of the hoop house myself. Okay, so let's see, I, I imagine there's other stuff besides beets down here. Um, um, okay, so Taylor was asking me, the thicker the row cover, the less light gets in, but the more heat, this, well, that's too, true somewhat. But if it's really thick, it's not, this, what's, where's the heat coming from? The sun. So really thick is probably going to keep it pretty cool, you know. 
Um, this, this thickness compared to insect weight, you'd go with this for the winter always, you know. It's, it's, you know. it's still allowing enough for stuff to grow. I mean, how many people have grown crops under row cover? Aren't you amazed at how well they do? Don't they just rock? I mean, you know, it's amazing stuff. Um, should we hit peak oil and not have all the things we have right now? One of the things I'll miss most of all is gonna be row cover. The versatility that you can do with row cover is incredible. Yeah. I like it fine, but there are other ones out there. I don't need to say it's the one, you know. I've gotten a few that weren't so good. I, I fortunately don't remember the name, so I can't trash them, yeah. you, know? <laughs> but, you know. Where do you find them? This one is readily available from Johnny Selected Seed, and it's also available, our similar ones are available from Fifth Season in Asheville, from um, Troy's Greenhouse in Burnsville. Um, let's see, who else? I think probably some of the bigger nurseries sell it now, too. Oftentimes they sell it in these packages that aren't cost effective. My favorite places are the places that have a roll and let you buy how many feet you want. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that fifth season does that for sure. They do. And, and Creek also does. Okay. And um, yeah, and I know that Troy's Greenhouse does that. So those are the places I like the most. And I don't know about row cover, but I know that Farm Tech does that online for plastic. You know? And so likewise all the places mentioned I don't know about Reams Creek, but the other places mentioned also sell plastic by the foot. And that's very useful for you all because if you're making a small greenhouse, you know, if you're going to buy it, normally you've got to buy a roll and you're going to drop someplace over $200, might be $300 because you're buying a hundred foot. Whereas you, what you can do is go to these places and turn their um, width into your length and just get as many feet as you need mm -hmm. as, far as, your, as far as it goes. So that, that works better. I don't know if this is still beets here, but we'll just look at everything a little bit and see underneath here. No, okay, this is collards, okay, and kale. Um, and, you know, they're just going to be producing for quite a while yet outside, you know. You can lift up that side if you want to see it on this side. You, know, you don't have to not get to see it, you know. And so, we, you know, we're taking advantage of that production outside now, and then later on our stuff that's inside will be harvested from. You know, that's how we get a succession. Um, we also have... By the way, I don't try to grow broccoli indoors inside anymore because we have a disease. I'm pretty sure the one that it was ID'd as, as being brock, black rot, and it just like gets in the, um, in the buds. And even if it just seems like there's a little bit, the actual taste and smell of it is everywhere through the head, so it's just not worth trying to grow it. I mean, now I can still get it outside, but pretty soon, that's going to become dominant, so I've given up. Until I figure out that disease, I don't do it. But you might not get it, and broccoli indoors can be really wonderful. My favorite is broccoli rob. You can get tons of that in, in, a, in a greenhouse. Incredible production. You could sow it now, and you'd be picking it, you know. Unfortunately, it also gets that rot. Um, we just had a hard lesson. This, I'm going to back up a little bit. This garden is incredible for mar microclimates and teaches you a lot about microclimates. Two thousand. 2014, um, I did the True Nature Country Fair, got home really late and didn't want to go out and tweak the covers, even though it felt quite cold. I thought, ah, it'll be good enough. It's not going to freeze, right? Sure enough, in the morning, this third of the garden froze hard. Lost things like roselle, you know, all kinds of special stuff that I could have easily saved by just yanking it out and putting it inside, you know. Didn't do it. So far this year, our frosts have been like, you know, 32, 31 and a half or something. Nothing much, right? Except for right over there. We had, you can, I think we cut them all out. We had ca cauliflower. And I worried they weren't going to make, but they were getting nice. I mean, they were like this. If you were like that, they should have gotten like this. They were really doing well, you know. I was quite happy with them. Looked at them Tuesday night and said, we should probably get those covered. And Jeremy's like, wow, I didn't know they were that good already. Yeah, we should cover them. Didn't think twice about it for that night because it was barely going to freeze, right? Looked at it the next day, all of it wrecked. Just much colder there. The cold is heading to the creek, heading to those ditches, and it just backs up into that cauliflower and nails it. You know. Meanwhile, last year, when all the stuff was dead on this side of the garden, there were dahlias and stuff up at that side that weren't damaged at all. You know. So, you know, microclimates can really, you know, really gets you. And if you're in a place with a slope, the last thing you want to do is have some kind of thick planting 
at the bottom of your garden because all the coal is going to back up from there up into your, you know. Allow, allow for that stuff to keep dropping, you know. That's the critical piece. Okay, so a star here. We're going to talk more about varieties inside later. Um, but a star for winter production, you wouldn't even have to cover it probably at all, but it will bolt as it gets colder, right? I mean, as the days start to get longer. Two stars here, right? Tatsoi and arugula. Um, I'm glad to offer a taste. I'll pick a few off. They are going to be so good right now. Something we haven't covered yet. Your winter production is spectacular for flavor, right? Things slow down. You concent you're concentrating sugars and, uh, and other nutrients, which act as antifreeze, but also are wonderfully flavorful. So I'm just going to pass out a leaf. Just take a little piece off and pass it on. Get everybody get a little taste of these. Tatsoi, T-A-T-S-O-I. Um, here, just pass those on, spread them around. Take little pieces off, everybody get a taste. We'll start now, start passing the arugula around too. This is the one that I would substitute for a wet, red, tasteless tomato every time. Looks like I gotta send some over the other way too, right? Thank you. Yeah, I don't wanna, anybody didn't get it, come on up and just grab a little piece. Just spread them around, take a little piece off, pass them around. So how much advantage is the cover for Tatsoi and arugula, things that are pretty cool? This time of year, if we weren't covering other things in this row, we wouldn't cover these right now. They wouldn't be damaged at all. They might grow a little faster because of the protection, but frankly, I wouldn't bother. Um, Tatsoi, arugula, cilantro, um, red mustard, those guys are really remarkably hardy. There's an exception. The exception is a November like last November, where we went into the teens really quickly. It's not only, and I, you know, I don't know the science on this, frankly, but I, observation, right, which is critical for growers, right? Yeah. Science is useful to a degree, but observation, that's, that's how we pull it off, right? Yeah. Observation is that those years, things that should be hardy get totally wiped out. And so it seems like they not only have to be able to be able to move the water out quickly on a night and have the time to do it, but they also can't be in too much of a summer mode when the cold comes. You know, the cells are just too big, they haven't got enough new, you know, density of nutrients, and they'll take damage. You know, if we plunge from, you know, October weather to December weather in early January, I mean early November, you know. So that, that can happen, and so then all bets are off with any of these. If it's like, you know, the 7th of November and the temperature's going to 15, you know, then, you know, some stuff will make it, but I wouldn't tell you what. The one that will make it for sure is mosh. People know mosh. We don't have any growing just yet, but I don't, I've never seen any cold hurt it. It's just the toughest, you know, most, most winter hardy, you know. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have it started yet, I don't think. Yeah? Do you know the cheapest place to get these bags to sand in them? Um, or just the bag itself? Feed and seed. Feed and seed place. Yeah, okay, so Taylor asked about the sandbags. And... For gardens, you know, it's, it's always like staples or sandbags or rocks or boards. I mean, there's a million ways to hold this stuff down. Some way more satisfactory than others. I recommend that you find one that really works because row cover in trees is really a drag and hard to get out. I've been, I've been there, you know. I belong to a community. I wasn't popular, you know. Um, five years later, there were still a few shreds in it. Anyway, um, we've gone to sandbags. They're more convenient. Like, you know, you want to try and pull a staple out when... It's 32 degrees out in your hands. You know, you, the gloves are too big. You got to take the gloves off, and it's no fun. The sandbags work great. The ones we bought, um, we got them at I think the local feed and seed. Um, not as good as the ones that we had when raised bags was still in business. They were more UV treated. They're breaking down in less than a year. The green ones, the few that are left around here, they lasted probably four years. You know, so you want to ask, you know, how well treated are they? You know, I mean, do they hold up better? You know. Tell me something good about Creeping Charlie right here. <laughs> Covers the ground. That's huge. It's put exudates in the ground. They're yeah. good, you know. Yeah. Um, can it be a pain in the butt? Yeah, you know. But, I mean, the one that I'd be harder pressed to say good things about is Buttercup, you know. Um, but every one of them are doing, you know, creating diversity, feeding different soil life, you know. Um, you know, 
it's not, you know, not not really a problem, but yeah, it's a weed, you know. Whoa. Yeah. Thanks. I'll, yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, I did an article for um, Mother Earth News. Well, I did it for the Express originally, and Mother Earth News wanted to pull the opening paragraph. It was about weed control. Uh -huh. And I said, before I go into how to control weeds, I want to pay homage to them. You know? They cover the soil when we're too dispirited or distracted to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that doesn't that happen? Like, you know, it's just been a hard summer, you know, yeah, and the just like, part of the year, you know, I think. yeah, you know, you just don't get out or there and get that no cover crop on. Those guys are out there. They're doing it, you know, they I mean, they're my my pharmacy, you know, there's there's so medicinal. I mean, you know, um, yarrow for cuts, plantain for stings. I mean, there's just there's tons of ways that they work really wonderfully. And of course, they go to flower quickly and their pollinators are working them. You know, you just want to learn how to make sure that you appreciate them but don't give them the whole store, you know? Yeah. That's, that's the, you know, you gotta find that balance. But they have their place, you know? Um, and I fought for and got the right to keep that part back in there. I said, to me, <laughs> that's integral to this article, you know? You. Um, you know, and I really don't wanna encourage a, like, you know, I hate the weeds attitude, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, the doc, it's, it, it's an arborage for a really bad disease for us. It's incredibly medicinal. It goes really right. deep, it's a bioaccumulator. You know, and the youngest leaves are edible and very tasty and really good for you for like spring tonic, you know, so we could go on. And, there could be a whole workshop on that one, you know. Um, let's try to jump over here because that's our garlic growing under there. Um, so here you can see I have my ace in the hole. I said we were, we were behind on getting our farmscaping in, but thank you, Calendula, tons of seedlings. So I'll be taking those and transplanting them into our greenhouses. And after Christmas, we'll be seeing blooms, you know? And so that's a, a great thing. Take advantage of the fact that both calendula and bachelor buttons are wonderful farmscaping plants, edible flowers. Bachelor buttons have extra floral nectaries also, and they're ready self seeders. So you can almost always find seedlings out in your garden that you can move into your greenhouse. And that's a great thing to do. Let's see what we have here. Broccoli, just starting to come in. Um, these guys will make quite a bit, quite quite a bit bigger heads. It'd be quite nice. Um, and you could do that in a greenhouse. They come in sooner, but just know, sometime by the end of this month, you may start seeing a disease that just we can't get ahead of. Hmm. You know, we haven't figured it out. Um, I'll let you know as soon as we do. I haven't quit trying. You know, outdoor broccoli. Outdoor broccoli too, but it's later. It's huh. later. It's more like. December by when it starts to hit out here. It's faster inside the greenhouse, mm -hmm. but it, it starts to show up everywhere. It might be that it's we've built up enough spores in there that it's coming out here too, Maybe. you know. I didn't have this problem in Silo, so I can't say that you're going to have the problem. It's but just keep your... Spore. Pardon? It's an airborne spore. Yeah. Frankly, I know very little about this disease. I barely got it ID'd, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, it's enough that like it's, you know, we stop trying. You know, we just like, we grow it now and then we have it they, on the other end, though, now putting it in, Rockwell's like, Pat, let's definitely grow it. We had a spectacular crop last year. And I'm like, wait a minute. That was a crop we planted out in early March, right, and harvested it in April. He's like, yeah, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Grown into the warm weather, no problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it does very well. I highly recommend that end, you know. I mean, mostly you just reverse what you do in the springtime, you know. But some things you'll change a little bit. Like, yeah, it's way worth putting broccoli in, even in February. So it matures into the warming weather, it'll do great, you know. Yeah. And you will get to it, but all that kind of stuff, it's a dance, right? Because you want your broccoli and you want your tomatoes, and you only got one greenhouse, right? Mm -hmm. What you have to learn to do is get those guys to live next to each other and then take the one out, you know. Even though it may have more side shoots potential, it's time to liberate that tomato and let it take off, you know. And so that kind of stuff, I'm just going to give you the ideas. You're going to learn to tweak that yourself. Every greenhouse, every appetite, right? Every work schedule. It's going to be different, but you get, when you have your greenhouse and as you learn to work with it, you're going to learn to incredibly maximize it. You're going to produce more food in your hoop house than you can imagine. It's going to be way more productive than any other part of your garden um, because of that control. So you're going to have to pay attention to fertility. We'll get, we'll get back to that again. Okay. Um, and here, I forget what's here. We'll just see what else is happening here. Well, this has all been harvested here. Oh, that's right. This bed, Jeremy actually said maybe we shouldn't bother to cover it because it's mostly been harvested. 
but there's still some nice pak choys and Chinese cabbages. We'll take a look at them up there. We just took a whole bunch of um, um, kohlrabis here. There's one left. Maybe we'll just give you all a taste of what a good cold weather kohlrabi can taste like. And of course, once again, the leaves are as edible as kale. Yeah. So you get a double vegetable. I remember first introducing, introducing this to the market and people were like, what in the world is that? And now it's like, you know, everybody grows it, people love it. But at first it was a little overwhelming to people. It just looks kind of strange, you know, if you've pulled, especially if you pull off all the things and they have just these little nubs sticking out. Um, does anybody not know kohlrabi? All right, well, you're gonna get to try it now. I think it's actually best just raw, personally. Um, we'll let you get the first taste. Um, and then, Somebody really good with a knife, is able to pay attention to the fact that this is a serrated knife. If it cuts you, it won't stop bleeding. Can you just cut thin little slices for everybody? Just pass them out. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah. Um, what do you think? It's nutty. Nutty and kind of sweet, right? Nutty and sweet. Yep, yeah, that's, that of course, if I haven't gotten that across yet, this time of year, you like sweetness and vegetables, grow your food in the winter, you know? It all gets really sweet, you know? Really spectacularly. Okay, so we'll walk up this way, and um, while while being fed, I will open up and show you what's left of the bok choy and pak choy, and um, Chinese cabbage. Nope, that's more collards. They're here though. Nope, more of those. Maybe it's this bit that has those in. Yeah, I guess actually it's this bit that had them in. Okay, yeah. Um, mostly harvested out here. You can see our remaining pak choy. This is a, why it was left as it's a wimp. I just pulled one out of my um, fridge last night to cook. It was like that. You know, they can get really spectacular in this kind of weather. You can see what the Chinese cabbage look like, and there's some still happening here. Um, not many, though. I know why Jeremy said let's not bother to cover it, but I was like, ah, I still want those, those guys. You can see why that wasn't taken, just not quite there yet, you know. But, um, if you look at the size of some of these rosettes, some really nice big ones can happen this time of year. Yeah. Um, okay, a little um, tip. If you're driven nuts by flea beetles, you'll have them in the greenhouse too. But a greenhouse is an easier place to apply the not easy to do, but very effective solution, which is beneficial nematodes. If you apply beneficial nematodes, in the fall for your spring, spring crops, and in the spring for your fall crops. When we've been successful, and it's so far about 60% of the time, but we just got brand new functional overhead sprinklers, and it's all about having the right rain to get them in, our irrigation, I expect now to be able to hit 100% success. Um, basically, you could plant things like arugula, Chinese cabbage, purple pak choy, what are they but flea beetle magnets, right? Yeah. I mean, neon sign screams, come here, eat me, right? Not a hole, not a hole, not a flea beetle. Maybe three, four weeks into their growth, you'll see a flea beetle or two showing up. They wandered in for someone from somewhere else. So it is the solution, but the, the, to be able to, yeah, you, wa you water them in, in the fall for spring, in the spring for fall. They don't stay at the levels you need to get protection, you know? And there's a whole, pardon? We tend to do two applications just to be sure. You know, I've ever had one application work. It'll also work for things like carrot rust fly and cabbage maggot and stuff like that. All those soil borne pests can be controlled with nematodes. Where the key thing. Where are you sourcing the nematodes? Well, we buy, we buy a compost tea that they're in and we brew them. Um, that may be beyond the, the abilities of some people. So if you want to do that, if the man's name is Charlie Clark. If you punch in Charlie Clark compost tea, you'll be able to find him. But I should warn you, he only sells big units 
And then if you're only brewing five gallons, you got to break them down. He doesn't even want to talk to you about breaking them down. Right. You know, he's a, he actually does it for, for golf courses. Uh, the yeah. cutting edge work on this kind of stuff is being done by golf yeah. courses. They have lots of money, right. you know. As my friend John Nielsen has done consulting says, farmers always want the two cent solution, you know. It's like, <laughs> that's because they have two cents if they're lucky, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. But, um, so the other source that's really good is Gardens Live. And that, you just buy a sponge and you just like put them into your, yeah watering can and water them out, but you want to make sure they're watered in in less than seven minutes. And it took me years to learn that. It's a lesson about using your purveyor as a consultant. Because my, my, my salesman, he's dead now, um, but he was a great um, purveyor of beneficial insects. But it took me 12 years to get all the information I think I need about ben beneficial nematodes, right? A key thing, which I learned when my irrigation pump died, and I asked him, if I could wait to water them in in the morning, he said, yeah, but if the sun's up, remember this, seven minutes of ultraviolet light and they're sterilized. How they work is by swimming inside the insect and laying eggs that then, and laying bacteria that the bacteria grows, the eggs hatch, they feed in the bacteria, the bacteria are eating the bug and that's how it works. If they're sterile, they don't lay eggs, it doesn't work, you know? Um, and then a good 10 years later, after telling my friends at Goldfinch Gardens, that they could do this and they could water them in. They just had to have rain. Um, Cedar, diligent farmer, she turned out she was out there late into the night spreading a lot of money they'd spent on nematodes into the ground in the pounding rain. Pounding rain's no good, it's too much. They're not, they're not yet able to swim and adapt themselves and they get washed away. It needs to be a moderate to gentle rain. But when did I find that out? After I told her she could do it. In the rain, not in the pounding rain. And my lesson there is anything that you're spending money on and you're buying from somebody who knows their stuff, let them be your consultant. Yeah. Ask them yeah. to tell you everything they know. Yeah. How can I do this wrong? What will make it work better? How can I take care of it? You know, just, you know, that, I, I learned that from a, a man who sells spading machines. He said, unfortunately, in my biz, we have to be consultants. You know, and it's like, I, light bulb. Mm -hmm. They are, you, they, you, you yeah. got, you're giving them the business. They're your right. consultant, right. you know. And so maybe not later, you know, if they're good, later too. But at the point of sale, take advantage of that. You know, you can learn a whole lot. Okay, the last one, I don't know if I'm going to find any to show you, but do people know purple pot choy? You know what? I think we have to uncover it to show you if you don't know it. Um, do me a favor and just lift sandbags up. Be ready to put them down. Wherever you're standing, just lift the nearest sandbag. See if we can spot a purple pot choy and then just stare down the line here. I think they're... No, this is all cabbage. Yep. Okay, we'll try further up. I think I think they're fur close, further up this way. Um, I adore purple pak choy. Um, it's not only utterly lovely, thank you, um, and it is gorgeous, but also it's so tender that you can use it in salad. You know, um, and it pretty much keeps its color when you cook it, which for purple vegetables is pretty rare. As the spring and fall. As the spring and fall, yeah. And if I was in Silo, even in the summer, but down here, too much heat, you know? So Paul is leaving those leaves down there, part of your no-till approach? Um, yeah, it is kind of, yeah, it's just like leaving it there, because what else are we going to do? We had to haul it to compost, it'll rot there just as well, yeah. you know? Um, I've looked at some of those leaves and thought if I had time, I'd be making kimchi out of them, yeah. you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, um, yeah, well, they'll, they'll insulate the soil a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mostly they're going to feed the bugs. Anyway. If we take a break, I might come out and cut a pak choy and show you. It. You know, it's just, it's, I just adore them. They're just, one of the, they're kind of relatively new vegetable, that and the, the red mizunas. Both of those vegetables, I really, I love the innovation with those, you know. They're really quite spectacular for looks and taste. But they, we missed them, they're further down, I guess, you know. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe they're over here. No, that's kale. Ah, they're out here. That's the problem with covers, you know. Um, when do you set them out for fall? Pak choy, you can start setting them out as early as the middle of August. Uh -huh. Flea beetles will tear you up if yeah. you haven't done something about them, you know. Uh -huh. Other things you can do, right? If you don't have it together to do the nematodes, you can cover with row cover. There won't be as many. You can spray them with surround. Do people know what surround is? Mm -hmm. Okay. That'll help, you know. That'll, that'll slow down the infestation. I won't use it anymore, but it's allowed and organic, and it does work, and I've done it. That's pyrethrum. Pyganic is one of them. I just know that it's a powerful nerve poison. Yeah. Yes, it goes away quickly, but years ago we all thought rotenone was fine, and now I know 
of people who have been probably got their Parkinson's from Rotenone, you know. I wasn't nearly as careful as I should have been, you know. I, invincible young guy in a hurry, you know. Um, not a good plan. And so I don't, I just think, that, you know, people have inadvertently killed their kids giving them a shampoo with a uh, pyrethrin-based um, lice, you know, lice, lice treatment. And kids have inadvertently killed their pets doing the same thing. Just over the overuse of it, it's that strong. You know, if it's that strong, it may be allowed. There's a good reason why it's restricted, and I don't need it. You know, someday I'm going to find someone who wants to have about that much in a container. You know, it's like, you know, don't buy it. I'll give it to you. You know, but it will work. I mean, you could spray that once. Also, though, neem and neem, I'm way okay with. You know, if you put neem out and then cover with row cover, you got it. You know, and neem, it's really important to know, neem is the only organic pesticide I know that can work as a systemic. So you can drench with it and you got complete control, you know. I do that early. I don't want to be eating the neem later on, you know. I, I don't know that it's harmful, but I just, it doesn't really appeal to me, you know. Um, but if you drench with it, you'll have that protection early and then you get the row cover over and you'll be pretty good. Nematodes are better. Yeah. Nematodes are yeah, way better, yeah, you know. Absolutely. Will you apply this in the, in the greenhouses uh, via the overhead? Uh, irrigation? Well, we, don't, we would probably um, apply them with a sprayer, but then use the irrigation to wash them in. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you could run them through the irrigation. Yeah. You know, and we may eventually do that someday, you know. Um, I know Jake's farm did, their, did it through the irrigation and got major control on their farm. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you know, I remember hearing Richard McDonald talk about that. He helped him to figure out how to do that. Yeah. And where are you getting your um, nematodes? We get them from Charlie Clark in our comp. We put them in our comp. They're in our compost tea, and we brew them. You know, we get these tea packages from them. But you can also get them from Gardens Alive. There are other places too. On um, Biocontrol Network, there are a bunch of different purveyors. I think they're all pretty good. Um, but I'm a big fan of the um, ones in the tea. Uh, where are you guys doing your tea here? Uh, that I, I'll be glad to show anybody after the workshop. It yeah. doesn't fit in here, but there's. A, oh, I got a picture of the brewer. Like we'll show, we'll show the picture. Yeah, I put it in. Yeah, because tea to me is a big part of the disease control in the summertime. Yeah, not a big issue in the winter, but in the summer, especially if you're growing in the same greenhouse all the time. The only place I ever see soil diseases as an organic grower is in a greenhouse where I'm growing the same thing over and over again, right. and I'm getting such massive production that the plants are stressed. Yeah. You know, um, you know, and I'll I'll talk more about that. Yeah. Um, that's something we learned. You can get out. You can get out. It's okay. <laughs> No one has to be trapped. Uh, what are you doing with your leaves right now? Um, those leaves, a neighbor who used to burn them, yeah. found out we wanted them and he delivers them now. Yeah. He, he struggled to burn them because they're not easy to burn. I was just watching that pollution, you know, and just like 26 times more greenhouse gas, you know, the methane that's in that smoke, you know. So he just drives in and drops them, and those aren't where we want them. We're going to have to move them. Hmm. But we're very happy for him to drop them. We'll move them. Sure. What I propose we do is just lay them out in the paths. Just cover all our paths with them. They'll take care of the weeds, and then next spring when we need mulch, we'll just reach down and put it up in them. Okay. You know, and then the soil will be nice and bare, and we'll try sowing clover in the path and see yeah. if we can establish clover. You know, so okay. yeah. So they, you know, sometimes the mistake becomes an asset. You know, yeah. you, know yeah. you get to make lemonade. You know, yeah. um, so and you always you want to be thinking about that rather than just frustrated. Oh, you didn't put them where I wanted them or something. It's like we'll make that work. You know. It can happen. We'll glance in the seedling production space, um, but that's really not the main subject of this. But and so far, this is unheated. It has the potential to be, be heated, but we probably won't heat it. Um, okay. How, how many people have not tasted mosh? Because I have seedlings here and I'd love for you to taste, but I don't want to do too much damage. So if you've already had it, please don't be slighted, right? I just want to give like leaves for you to get a little taste for the people who have never had it. So raise your hand if you haven't had mosh. Okay. Get everybody in. Move in enough that everybody can get in. i got to see everybody and hear everybody. Okay. Now, one more time. Count off. Say one, then... Three, say three, four, come on. Four, five, six, seven, eight, 
Okay, about eight. Okay, that's not too many. I don't mean to slight everybody else, but you understand, I hope, right? Yeah. I just want people who have never had it to get to taste it. Um, what I love the most about it is the floral finish. I used to say aftertaste until I read somebody berating a, 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 a poorly written wine review. You know, it's like, that's finished, <laughs> sir, not, you know. <laughs> so now it's the, the finish, not the aftertaste. You know? Okay, so far I got just whoever started, just like speak out if you're next, say me. M A C H E, and there's one of those little um, things over the top of it. You know, what do they call those? Umlauts or whatever? Doesn't it? They say nutty in the catalogs. I don't get nutty at all. How many more do I need? Right. I only want to give it to you if, you. if you've tasted it before, please don't take it now. You know, this is just for people who have never had it. Because this is kind of cruel to the plants. So how big is that get? Um, depends on your variety. You can get anywhere from this size to that size. You know. And the nice thing is that even when it's bolting, it doesn't get any change in flavor. You know. I get some nutty from that. Pardon? I get some nutty from that. Okay, good. I'm glad you get nutty. This is another one that's very productive in the winter too. And that's um, New Zealand spinach. Personally, I'm not a big fan of it. You know, I don't like its taste very much, but it's highly productive. You can really get a lot of a lot of food out of it, and it's got to have protection. But with protection, it'll do perfectly fine. Um, and then you can see the kind of things we're putting in this time of year. Probably the only gamble, gamble is the fennel, but it'll probably work, you know. Um, and then, of course, you can be growing in the cool weather. You can grow your ginger way into the winter, you know, if you have some layers of protection so that it never goes below 50-ish. Now, you know? all these things are going to go in a greenhouse, not out here. Um, they're all, yeah, nothing. We're not planting anything else outside. At this point of the year, I mean, you could if you didn't have a greenhouse, but since we have a greenhouse, it's just way easier to put them, you know, okay. and the ginger is going to sit right where it is, you know. Did you start these things from seed here? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're all started here, yeah. We don't buy seedlings, with the exception of the long season cabbage from Troy's Greenhouse, because one year we had crop failure, and people loved how well it did so much, they just can't let go of it. They say, can you get more of those seedlings, Pat? You know, and it's like, I think we do as well ourselves, but I love Troy's Greenhouse, I love Wade McCurry, and we give them the business, you know. And they work great every year. He's always got them ready exactly when we need them. I think he sold like 11,000 cabbage plants this year. You know, people in Kansas County grow their cabbage. You know, all right. So this is, you know, this greenhouse actually does get heated. Um, we're actually going to move all these seedlings over to our new greenhouse and use the biochar heat. And those are on tables that have had recycled um, solar water heaters. You know, those kind of black things with all the tubing in them. Once they start to get leaks, you can pick them up for like 40 bucks or for free. And we just patch them and invert them, put them, lay them flat on the table, run hot water in them and put our plants on top of them. So it's a fast, yeah, easy. Bottom heat, bottom heat is where it's at. And then hoops over that to hold the heat in. You never need to heat the greenhouse. And that's in another house here? That's not on this property. We, we're not going to have time to go over there, I think, unfortunately, today. You know, that, I wouldn't include that in the tour because it is not a hoop house by any means. It's a very expensive, big, state-of-the-art. You know. You'll see it in other, other videos. You know. Um, and we actually haven't moved the plants over there yet. We're still working out the, making sure that they have continual supply of heat. You know, I don't want it to go up and down for the plants. You know, all right. So let's move over to the next greenhouse. This is you'll get to see the um, still producing tomatoes and the incredibly productive system they're on. Yeah, I made it finally, but I had an incredible toothache. Oh man, um, sorry. And just basically up all night, and then just had to sleep. Yeah. But you know, I got there Saturday night. You know, oh, so goodness. did you enjoy it? Oh yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. I didn't steer you wrong on that one, right? No, no. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Okay, so you know, the idea of these are all like seconds, you know, but um. And this is marmorated stink bug damage largely. But anyway, this is the kind of size you can get, kind of quality you can get. This greenhouse is pretty interesting because 
Um, sometimes you can say things a lot and people don't register it. And so people really like staking tomatoes, but they, for the fact, we grow indeterminate tomatoes by and large. And you can stake them, but then you have to add another stake to that. And if they're doing well, then they start dropping down over it. And in one row at Grandview, our other greenhouse, about the third week in November, the whole row just collapsed. It really can't handle it. You put them on this and they really go, you know. But you also have to know what tomato you're putting in here. This is defiant and it's a determinate tomato. So it's kind of a waste to have it in here and have it on a string because it's never getting any taller than this, you know. Whereas these guys, you know, these guys, when they get up to there and we can't reach them anymore, we push that side little loop that's sticking out of wire in and it lowers them. And then we can actually bury the vine, and it's like having a new plant. We did Corinto cucumber in the other greenhouse um, that we're not, not going to get to today. And if it hadn't been taken out by a sneak attack of squash beetles, I, I release a predator every year for squash beetles. But this year, they didn't show up until so late that our predator had starved out and wasn't around anymore. And then they bloomed, and we, they wiped out our, um, our cucumbers in the middle of, April, middle of September. If they hadn't, we might be pushing 3,500 pounds production. As it is, we're pushing 3,000 pounds for one 80-foot row. 3,000 pounds. Corinto's a variety. If you're going to grow tomatoes in a greenhouse, I recommend you get these things, right? Even if you're only this tall, it's still going to work, right? You just got to lower them more often and bury them more often, but it's going to work. And you don't have to bury them, but if you do, you're like, they're going to root along that stem and it gives you a whole new plant, you know? But either way, you lower them, you keep the same plant going the whole summer. And Corinto, incredible production, yeah. Uh, how do you do with the blight? Like if you're in cover, the blight is way less of a problem, but in a terrible year, blight is everywhere. The sprays are way more effective inside. Yeah. You, by and large, can keep them going. Though, you know, some years, you know, 2003 being an infamous, infamous one, you know, I think 2013 being another, you know, unbelievable one, you know, it's just like, if you're organic, you're probably going to just throw up your hands at some point, you know. Um, even the conventional people, I think, throw up their hands in years like 2013, you know. So what do you use as a, do you like the copper? Or um, copper's our very last resort, our last resort. We don't like copper at all. You know, it builds up in the soil. It's hard on plants, and we don't serenade. like using it. We use Serenade, Sonata, Regalia. Regalia you apply ahead of time because it helps the plants to resist it. They have higher levels of phenols. We use, um, let's say, Serenade, Sonata. We use Oxidate if we think we can't get control at all of the out outbreak, but that, we don't like that because that kills the other life. If we're using Oxidate, we're going to come back with compost tea. We do regular applications of compost tea. You could also do things like Actinovate and tri Trichoderma in your tea, and they will be effective for a little while, even though they do better in the soil. So it's a whole mix. And there's another, oh, double nickel. That's another, double nickel and Regalia are both preventatives. They're both like raising the resistance level, as is the compost tea, you know. And two times we made tea that totally, one time totally killed the blight, and the other time 95%. We just, it was right at the end of the season, and we, I wish it had been in the middle so we could have kept making the same tea and learned more, but we kind of lost the knack, and now we have to find our way back. But someday, compost tea is going to do it, I'm confident, you know. We're not there yet, though. So anyways, the varieties in here include things like Timar, Timaru Mushu, Muchu, um, Monero. Monero is my star for this year. I wish I could find you one. Um, I might run up the house and get one. Monero and Marglobe were, were brought out by, introduced to us by Johnny's. I don't know who developed them. But both of them were crossed with heirlooms. They look like dead ringers for heirlooms. The one looks like a Cherokee purple. Produces way better than a Cherokee purple. Doesn't taste nearly good as a Cherokee purple, but tastes way better than any other greenhouse tomato especially if you let it get dead ripe. It's really impressive, the flavor. I mean, they were always our first. We don't grow heirlooms in the greenhouse. We have a special, far away, isolated place so that the blight doesn't come from them to other things. And they didn't get in until June. We've been eating tomatoes for five weeks by June. And so I was eating so many Moneros. And they had to sit on my, de my counter and get dead, dead ripe. But then they actually tasted like a tomato. You know, tasted good, you know. Um, the Mar Globe was a disappointment. It looked just like Mr. Stripey or one of the other yellow pinks. Gorgeous tomatoes, right? Flavor wasn't there, you know. So I, I don't really recommend that. We'll probably grow it because we grow greenhouse tomatoes and 
only a very few of them taste like much anyways, you know. They're still way better than anything in the stores, and so we'll probably grow it. But the ones I recommend most are probably the Tom Mim Moro Moru R U Mucho M U C H O O and the Monaro. Both of those are in Johnny's and they're both really excellent. Big Dina, I didn't pay attention. They said it was great flavor too. We tried it at the new greenhouse, but I've never gotten one focused on it and said done the taste test, you know. What you need to know this is a key piece. Now we're kind of we'll go over this more when we get to talking about summer and the, in the in, when we're sitting down again. But if you lower these, we made a mistake at first, right? We would come in, take off all the leaves where we're going to lower them, right? And then lower them and bury them right away. Now we just still have a plant that's reaching up to here, but we took off this many leaves, right? And now it's got to make photosynthesis for all the tomatoes that are around there with that many less leaves. I noticed this was a problem because those Monaros didn't taste near as good. And I was trying to figure out, finally, oh, we're taking the leaves off. So what we do instead now, and it took a while to get folks to get this, right, is we lower them and just let them lay on the ground with the leaves. And they'll photosynthesize laying on the ground, you know. And then once they've gone back up and filled the whole string out, then we bury that, you know. Then we lower it again and the whole process starts over again, you know. The cucumbers, we probably buried those vines 60 or more feet this year. I mean, we were low, we couldn't keep, every two weeks, you know, not even two weeks, 10 days, Got to lower them again, you know, just like could hardly keep up with them how fast they were. And the production is just massive. Corinto. We tried a whole bunch of varieties. All of them had their own attributes. My favorite cucumber by far is Diva. It was okay in the greenhouse. It was kind of productive. It went longer than any other one. I'll give it that, you know. Um, and I always want to grow some Divas, but for production, for feeding the hungry, there's nothing wrong with the taste of Corinto. And it three times, if not four times more productive than anything else. Just incredible production, you know. Um, anybody got any questions about how this system works? <coughs> you get that if you're doing this system, you don't grow determinate tomatoes, right? But you sucker it all summer. Um, not all summer, no. Um, we sucker as we need to. See, it's not suckered right here, you know. Um, what I really try and teach people is if they let one get away and it's getting too big, they want to come in and break a whole branch off. That really is robbing the plant of a whole lot of stuff that it put in. Instead, you just come in here. Okay, so here's a sucker, right? Getting kind of big, you know, kind of problematic, right? I just come in, I find the growing center. It's, no go it's not going anywhere. It's done, but it still has all those leaves to produce, you know? And indeed, it might produce some fruit, too. So you don't take the whole thing off. You just hit the growing tip, knock it back. Yeah, yeah, just take that off, and then you didn't have to do that damage, you know? I mean, just, I don't want to be that brutal to my plants, you know? Any other questions about tomatoes in here? Doesn't it make you want to have a greenhouse? Yes, yes, you'll do way better with blight, you know? I mean, and you know, grow some heirlooms too. You know, my favorite for in the greenhouse heirloom for productivity and relative disease resistance is Prudence Purple. You know, there's a whole debate ongoing in the Fedco seed catalog. There are the Prudence Purple people and the Brandywine people, you know? I'd be a Prudence Purple person. Do I love Brandywines? Are they not one of the best tasting tomatoes you've ever had? Yes. Do they not get blight faster than any other tomato in the world? Yes. Are they not the wimpiest tomato you've ever seen? Yes. In this climate, I'm sorry. No thanks. You know, we don't grow brandy wine. It's just too much trouble. Yes, it's great. Even in the greenhouse, it goes down too fast. Prudence purple? You know, it's not as good as a brandy wine, but it's close enough for me. Way more disease resistant, way more productive. You know, one last thing I'm going to say about that, because maybe I won't cover it as much up there. This year, I began to learn how to graft. I'm going to start tomatoes real soon and practice grafting all winter. If you're growing them in a greenhouse, graft them. You know, you're going to get that much more production. Maximize your space in a greenhouse. You know, Maxim And maybe this year you don't want to graft them. You can buy grafted plants. If you're doing a small-scale greenhouse, the investment is probably going to be minor, minor compared to the increase in production. You know. Um, all right. So we're done with tomatoes. When will these be done? Tomatoes? Hard, hard freeze. I mean, you know. Because we have cover crop growing underneath, right? We don't have any other plans. Only the, only the weather will take them out. We'll let them produce until the weather takes them out, you know? And actually, we could turn the wood, like I said, if it was going to be one night going to like 21 or something like that, 22, probably have to get below 25 from the die in here, right? If it was only going to be one night, we might fire up, fire up the boiler and keep them going. If we thought we had another 10 days of production, we'd look at the, you know, there's a lot of food here, you know? Um, if there's that much food, we might think it's worth doing that burning, you know? 
Below 25? For here? Where and you heard that for this, for this area? Because last I heard they were high tw high twenties. Have you ever noticed that the weather prediction keeps you comfortable until the last minute, and then it's like, no, it's going to plunge. You know? <laughs> I mean, did they do that on purpose? Did they just hate gardeners or what? I mean, if we know that's going to happen, why don't they know that's going to happen? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well. Oh, it yeah, that was planted this year. Uh, no, those figs will probably get killed by the cold. The one and the other one had already, you know. Um, you'll see a bigger one in there, and those figs are all kind of wrecked already. But figs are definitely a part of year-round greenhouse production. Oh, okay. This is pretty strong, but we still want to burn the heat for a heavy, you know. That's the one time we'll heat to keep the snow off, you know, because you can't knock it off of this one. But these are way stronger. See how close the um, ribs are and all? They're designed to take quite a bit. You know, but 22 inches, all bets are off, you know. So y'all, anybody that wondered is, understands the inflation now, right? You can see how it's inflated. You can hear those little fans going there doing the inflation. Is this usually open and yeah, why? That is probably a misfunction, you know, is what I guess. But don't force it. If it, if it close easily, you can do it. But don't, yeah, it might be a misfunction. Yeah, um, it shouldn't be open now. See, and that's the wiggle wire. You can buy that. But I just used, um, basically for the, I bought, you know, um, one by for the uh, place to attach it, or even even three by, but, you know, one inch, one inch thick. I actually had milled um, locust. And then I would walk around with permission in the lumber yards and pick up their stickers, you know, not from the tree that would, but from the rest of them. They were free. And I just come in with a screw gun and put it on, and that was, you know, the poor man's wiggle wire. Not quite as fast, but pretty darn fast, you know. Um, and so that's what I'm saying. In really bad weather, if you had the presence of mind, you might be able to just release your sides, and it might just all collapse in rather than having to cut the plastic, you know, if you can't keep ahead of it, you know. Um, but I would be watching. If that wasn't working, I'd come back with a knife, you know. This greenhouse costs a lot more than the plastic that covers it. Try to get everybody in, then close the door. Let's keep the heat since it's supposed to get so much colder than they said it was. Keep moving, get in, get the door closed. Okay, great. All right. So this is, by the way, we're incredibly creative with our names for these greenhouses. That one bay one when you first come in is number one. <laughs> Guess what the next one is? Number two. And this one is number three. And the one at Grandview we call number four. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Meanwhile, the people that run the retorts for the biochar system have like Tinkerbell and all these other names, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, we're number one, number two, number three, number four. But you can see, remember I said that the beets in here were getting ahead of the other ones. They went in quite a bit later, but this controlled situation out there, they're not covered most of the time mm -hmm. and it's much colder. So they're going way more slowly than in here, you know. Um, all this direct seeded? No, these are, we, we do not tend to direct seed much of anything. That doesn't mean you shouldn't, okay. It can work fine to direct seed. We find our style of how we deal with weeds and stuff, right, and how we get to establish stuff and how we like to work stuff, that we like plants way more. So we, we did direct seed beets when I first got here. And then I started some flats because I knew they'd work. And everybody liked how they worked way more and said, can we just do nothing but flats? I'm like, I rock with that, you know. Beets are a slow germinator. They can, the weeds can really get ahead of you, you know. In, in the early spring, if you're planting outdoors, 
two starts. Mm -hmm. They really hate the insult of that early cold. I mean, the ones you plant way early will be wimps compared to the ones that went in later when it's a little warmer, you know. But if you put seedlings in early, they'll get the advantage of having that nice flavor of all the cold, but not be damaged by it. So these are all from starts. The lettuce is from starts. Um, lettuce, I mean, we could still have it outside, but like I said, they can take some damage from that touching kind of freezing, and in here there's no damage, so we don't bother. You know, every year people kind of check in, so Pat, should we cover the stuff in here yet? Even if it goes to 25, no damage in here. It'll be yeah. fine. It's a big enough area, inflated walls, it's just not going to get cold fast enough. Will things be frozen solid? Absolutely. But will they be damaged? No. You know? um, pretty interesting right there, those are turnips sowed in there, and actually my favorite, the baby white turnips, the seed, I got, I, bought, I got a half a pound a long time ago at, from Choice Greenhouse. It's a variety that you can't easily get untreated, mm. but he's got the connection, so we got it. It's called White Lady, mm. and it's finally running out of viability, so it's not a very good stand. But you can see the red ones are doing great, and yet there's all that buckwheat in there, too. Did we do that on purpose? No. <laughs> Definitely did not do it on purpose. Are we bothered by it? Not at all. In fact, it's in bloom. It's, it's a, remember I said I didn't have the calendula and stuff in here yet? Yeah. It's the food for the beneficials. Now. Could it become a problem? Yes, but what will happen before it comes a problem? Freeze out. It will all be gone. You know, and I got a picture, I'll show you where it was much more thickly in a beet bed. And then it all froze out and the beets never missed. It was the beets, so to speak. They just kept going. You know? They totally rocked. Spinach does spectacularly well in a greenhouse. Our favorite variety for production in the winter, space. And this is Pat, a little slow in the uptake. I got to meet Elliot Coleman. He'd seen some of my stuff. We were comparing notes. And he recommended space to me in 2000, and I didn't try it until 2013. Wow. And then I was like, why didn't I try this? The leaves can get huge, really big, really productive. I highly recommend Beautiful. space, yeah. It's, you know. Otherwise, I like Taihe the most. Both of these are hybrids, by the way. Um, Winter Bloomsdale's a fine one. I don't, I don't want to put down the um, heirlooms, but for, our, for in a greenhouse space, I tend to use hybrids. I'm not saying you shouldn't use heirlooms, you know. And for tomatoes, for production, I highly recommend you have at least some of the, of the hybrids. But you might want some for the taste, too. You can never, and ultimately, if we can't get seed, we'll have to be dehybridizing those hybrids in a scramble, and it won't be as easy. So having some Winter Bloomsdale, some Bloomsdale long-standing seed, too, is a good bet, you know. Um, that's a lecture I have to note and pay attention to because uh -huh. I can't say that I do really. Um, you can see that we have where these crops are is where we took out early summer crops and put in cover crops. You know, and it's an ongoing process. All this stuff here was in the bed growing and was just mowed and then raked out of the way. And for the lettuce, it never needs to go back in because it's covering up. But for the beets, we'll eventually come through and mulch these as it starts to get weedy with what was in the middle. So our our practice for the greenhouses and outside, our fertility system, is totally no-till based. Nice. The, the only till, reason we might till in here is because of one insect pest I'll tell you about when we get up, up top again. Yeah. And so we might have to till because of its cycle and its ability to survive in the top inch or two is an egg, which nematodes can't attack. Um, that's the vegetable we will, I won't make it a, a riddle, but I'll tell you more about it later. But aside from that, we haven't tilled in this greenhouse, you know, since 2012, when we, a couple beds needed potassium, and we worked it in with a tiller. Not a, a power harrow, rather, not a tiller, which is not quite as hard on the soil, you know. What did um, you do in the very beginning to build the bed? You know, I wasn't here in the beginning for this, so I can't really say. But I imagine what they did was simply work with the soil that was here. I remember Rocco, when I first got here, telling me that this, the fertility in here was really special, the soil was really special. It's some of the higher ground. The thing to know about this entire property, soil. in 2015, I mean 1915, it was a lake, the whole property was, oh. as it was in 2016 until a hurricane, a very big hurricane that did huge damage all over Western North Carolina. The dam broke, there was a mill there, and there was loss of life. Oh um, and they never re made it as big again. So this was once a lake bottom. So we have some fairly fertile soil to work with. You know? um, what we do is cover crops and then compost done as a planting mix. You know, we don't really apply compost otherwise, but we almost always put a little bit of compost and a small, very small amount of nutrients compared to the big wheelbarrow full of stuff. I mean, you know, a wheelbarrow um, is 27 cubic feet, and the most we might use of anything will be like a quart and a half of alfalfa meal. 
you know, we might use a half cup of azomite, you know, might use a half cup of um, the pasteurized poultry, you know, you know the micro starter, one of those, you know, harmony or one of those chicken manure kind of things. Just a little bit with a lot of life goes real far, you know. Um, though this time of year, totally backed off on all that nitrogen with the exception of maybe a very small, like maybe a half cup or a quarter cup of alfalfa meal to that whole wheelbarrow. Because as the days get shorter, plants can't use that nitrogen. On cloudy days, they can't use it. It builds up in the leaves and it can be toxic to us. You, know, you, can, get, you can get nitrosamines. If you um, instead wait till the end of a sunny day, they'll use them. But if you were using tons of nitrogen, they might not. You know? And I saw the example of that. I was visiting our farm in Florida and they had cover crops they were feeding the cows to and they had, well, we were, the, we were there for the polar vortex. It was wonderful. <laughs> we missed mm -hmm. the whole thing, you know. But it was cold and windy down there too and gray as can be and rainy. And even though it was Florida, um, their oilseed radish, forage radish, which they were having the cattle graze on, had so many nitrates that an older cow died from it. You know, she just couldn't take that many nitrates and it killed her. You know, and the guy, Jamie, who does the work down there, had the test. He could test it and tell it was the nitrates that did it. So, yes, there can be time. And in northern Europe, babies have died of blue baby syndrome. So much nitrogen in their blood that they couldn't get oxygen. Oh, wow. So, you want to be aware, harvest at the end of a sunny day and go light with the nitrogen. You know, don't overdo the nitrogen in the winter. Once you're, you know, when you're planting in January, you won't be harvesting till March, don't worry about it. The days are long enough again. But if you're planting in December and you're going to be harvesting before the middle of February, pay attention, you know. And if you're planting right now, pay attention because the clock for that kind of starts at the end of the first week of December and kind of ends about the middle of February. And there's variations that actually that death, that was at the end of February. I mean, if you remember when the polar vortex it was, you know, or, or the third week. So there's still some levels, you know. Um, and even more so there. They were doing some pretty heavy um, compost tea, you know, and using small amounts of nutrients in the compost tea and stuff, really pushing those cover crops. And mostly it works fine there. They don't usually get that kind of weather. But in that situation, it didn't. Okay, so turnips there. By the way, the white turnips and the red turnips which you kind of harvest more like this size to that size, right? No bigger than that, more like this. Their salad quality, they're just incredible. They're like, you know, juicy, sweet, buttery texture, just amazing, right? Uh, a gentleman one time on a tour at the Highland Lake Inn bit into one in freezing cold weather, which I took the mulch off to get for him, bit into an ice cold white turnip and said, why bother to grow apples, you know? He was 85 years old and just, amazing. you know, just big bite out of it and like, why bother to grow apples? That good, right? So productive that you can seed them so thickly that if, if my fingers were the kind of the rows, you could have one growing here, one growing there, one growing there, all on all the fingers. You could have other ones growing in between on top of them. And they all produce. You just have to thin very carefully. Take the bigger ones, let the next ones come on. So you don't have to, you know, you can sow them really thickly and just come back and thin. And Jeremy was just saying that again yesterday as we were harvesting because he said, should we harvest those? I said, yeah, let's take the big ones, the little ones that get big again. And if we wanted to go back out there and look, you can look at the red um, turnips. They're just all like, you know, there could be like a, an area this big that can have like 25 turnips in it. You know? mm -hmm. And yet, you know, they, get, they each get their moment in the sun. They each get to get big if you harvest carefully. Sometimes you're trying to pull one, you pull another one. You know? Yeah. Totally similar. They're my poor man's, yeah. And you can, you can call up Wade, I can give you the phone number, and he'll mail order them to you. You know, anybody want the phone number? 828-682-6439. I'll, I'll give it to you later when you get a pen. Don't worry about it. You know? I got it memorized. Do you have any white fly? You know, at the Grandview Greenhouse, we had a Wi-Fi infestation that we could not beat, and it didn't stop production in the least. We had so much fertility that it wasn't a problem. Mm. You know, um, you, our problem really, white fly is easy to control once you identify whether you have greenhouse white fly or sweet potato white fly, because they're mm. different predators. The predator works fine for both, and Carcia formosa is the one for um, the greenhouse white fly. I forget the one for the. Uh, it's a little, I think it's a tiny little ladybug, but you have to have the right predator, and even Craig Monet, our extension agent, you know, it, I caught a couple and got them to him and they, they had disappeared by the time he tried to get them mailed off, you know. Oh. So he couldn't, you know. And I just, 
It's really hard to tell. The one, I think it's the, I'm pretty sure it's the sweet potato white fly, white fly has the wings that are kind of like at an angle, and the other one are flat out more like a, like a plane, okay. like a paper airplane. But it's really hard to see that, you know, even with a lens. And so I just wanted confirmation, and I haven't bought them, you know. Meanwhile, um, for, for um, spider mites, I've, re I've, re I've, re I've introduced the predatory spider mite, which I didn't think did very well. But then this year I introduced um, the Minute Pirate Bug, and it was very effective with that, and I think also is pretty generalist. And so I think it was also feeding on the eggs. You know, it eats really small stuff. But I think we got, you know, because our problem went away this year. Last year we couldn't get rid of it. Both spider mites and white fly were a major problem, and yet the damage was incredible. There was some discoloration on a few tomatoes, but really the problem, the damage was minor, and it was because of the incredible fertility. You know, I mean, it had to be that because otherwise they're a problem. You know, yeah. even though there'd be clouds coming off and stuff, they weren't hurting the fruit. You know. So you never um, use insecticidal soap. We do use insecticidal soap. We used it several times for the marmorated stink bug. Yeah. There's uh, not a lot of things that control that uh, joyful uh, little newly arrived immigrant. Yes, I'm anti-immigrant, but it stops with bugs. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do not appreciate yeah. the recent arrivals of spotted wing Drosophila. Marmorated stink bug and a few others, you know. Did you have those in the greenhouse? They were they were everywhere on the property. Yeah. They get yeah. into everything. They just they're just. But that's different than the harlequin. The harlequins. Are yeah, it's family. different. They they're both tough though. All the bugs yeah. are tough, you know. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about strategies for harlequin. I can tell you the marmorated stink bug. I really was on. Marshall does our spraying, and I really nagged him to do it a lot. And what he did, it was just where they were intense, where there were lots of them, right? Mm -hmm. Which was in the beans and a few other places. Um, and what he used was surround mm -hmm. and neem. And neem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that combination, we basically got a pretty good grasp, grasp on them. This is the first year they, that they really established. And the minute I found any, I had them spray surround. Yeah. And they never really established as much where he got the surround well applied. But it, it's hard to get surround into a depth of beans. you got to jam your nozzle in yeah. there and really, you know. So he finally did, and then we started to get a grip. But it was hard. You know, they were, they were a major challenge, you know. Um, yeah. The harlequin bugs are tough, but there's some strategies, and we'll cover them when we're sitting down. You know. Um, anyway, you, you can notice behind you there, kale and collards, um, and they'll be coming on. We'll be planting more of those. The things you saw in that greenhouse will be getting planted in here. You know, um, any bed that doesn't have cover crop on it will be planted before before long to winter vegetables, and then we'll start flail mowing some of the beds that have cover crop in longest. We use the fabric now. I've ever used straw. I think straw does a better job, but fabric is faster. And we'll just cover those, yeah. and we'll make sure they're good and moist. And then within a few weeks, that cover crop will rot away, and we can come in and plant. You know. After you flail mow, or you're not going to flail mow? No, we'll flail mow them. If we don't flail mow them, they won't die. They'll just they'll linger under that cover crop. They won't yeah. grow really, but they'll linger. But if we flail mow them and then cover them, they'll die. You know. Um, and by the way, there are cover crops that die easier than rye. I don't re recommend rye where you're going to try and kill it before it's season. Yeah. You know. If you do want to try a rye to kill, try the, a bruisey wren. It's, it, it doesn't go dormant, so it's, it's further along in its cycle. And the further along in the cycle, the easier they are to kill. Right. You know? um, but I, barley and wheat are a whole lot easier to kill. Oats are much easier to kill. So I recommend them for where you're, trying to, where you're planning on killing that cover crop before it's going to flower. Once the cover crop's going to flower, they're wimps. Any, you can kill any of them. Right. But until they're going to flower, they're hard to kill. So I'd stay away from the rye and the vetch. Oh, they are. Yeah, I mean, we're not, we're not getting full benefit if we take them out now. But the thing is, you're always getting benefit, right? You're getting tons of benefit because they're always putting exudates in. So you don't go, oh, I'm only going to have it in for six weeks, so I'm not going to grow it, you know? It's like, yeah, if you happen to have it in for the in full season, you get much more benefit. But you've got benefit all the way. Bare soil is nothing natural, yeah. you know? What would you say is your number one cover crop? I don't have a number one. I really don't. What's my favorite cover crop? I can give you favorites. But that doesn't mean I use it as much, you know. My favorite is probably Facilia tanacetifolia, um, tansy leaf Facilia, pretty unknown. I think I wonder if we have any growing in here. I'll have to look and see. Um, we probably do in the mix over there. Um, it's in the same family as borage and comfrey. Very deep rooted, bioaccumulator, incredible forage crop for insects. They really adore it. In fact, they warn you not to let it be in bloom if you need other crops to get pollinated, because it'll, it'll so attract it. And in Europe. They're growing it by the acre because the exudates are so dynamic. According to Dr. Lane Ingham, it's not a legume, yet it fixes nitrogen. 
Interesting. So, and it's an okay forage too. I mean, animals can eat it. Mm -hmm. So it's a really fat, so it's my favorite, you know? Wow, it does a lot of different things. Yeah, well, and indeed, uh, the, you know, most of the cover crops, there's uh, more stories oh, to yeah. them. You know, oats, you let them grow idea. up and go to the milky stage and it's an incredible tonic, you know? And you make a tincture. Facilia tanacetifolia. You would never do a grow with just one. You don't want to do that. You want that diversity. You want as many as you can grow. Okay? So I don't want to give you one because that's for sure you should have at least a, a grass and a legume. If you don't grow the legume, you're not going to be fixing nitrogen. And why would you not fix nitrogen? You know, there's so much in the air, you know, it's not in the soil. You make sure you inoculate it, you're fixing that nitrogen, right? Now, if you grow a grain with it, that grain's going to use nitrogen. What happens? Those bacteria have to make more. So you definitely want to grow both because that synergy is dynamic, right. you know. Um, so that's the reason for, for two. You grow four or five and you've got many different more exudates, much more fertility. Each one's filling a certain niche, maximum use of solar light, you know. Don't, don't ever, get out of the one mindset. Let it go. Yeah. But the vetch, is it not, is it not as invasive? Is vetch going to seed is a big pain. Uh. I, I would say the vetch, grow it only where you are going to be putting later crops in. So you can be sure that it's dead and you can plant on it. And go ahead and do something to kill it before it sets seed. Unless you don't mind having vetch come up for the next five years. Yeah. You know? Or 12 years or 20 years because it's got all those hard yeah, right. seeds and they just keep coming back. On the other hand, it makes a mat that's very suppressive to weeds yeah. and puts a lot of nitrogen in the soil. Yeah. I use less of it than anything else because of its bad habit. Right. Likewise, I use way less of the non abruzzi ren rye because of its vigor. You know, yet vetch and rye, if you get the book Managing Cover Crops Profitably, which you can go online and get, you know, you can read the whole thing online or download it, right? The stars for our region for producing biomass and building fertility, you know? So it's always a balance, you know? You, if you're really trying to recover a place, then probably the best thing to do is put in vetch and rye and not push the season, wait for them to be ready to kill. You know, they will eventually die if you hit them when they're going to flower, you know? And then they'll leave a whole lot of biomass and do a lot of good. So there you wanted a simple answer, and I can't give you one. You know? If you're in a small greenhouse, you don't have a flail mower, what do you do to, to kill the cover crop? Um, you could use a weed eater. The problem is it's going to throw it all over the place. You know? yeah. Then just rake it back in place. You, know? you could use a lawnmower. You, know? you could use a lawnmower with a bag and then respread the stuff. You know? um, if it's really small, you could use shears. You know? If it's the kind of greenhouse you're going to see in that design, which is like you know, maybe from that post to the post right right there and not you know half as wide as this shears would do it you know yeah. wouldn't take very long at all when i was trying to manage those cover crops without a flail mower at the um mountaineer garden i used a hedge trimmer i went yeah. through two before i gave up on it you know <laughs> they they just not meant to cut something that thick so they eventually died but it was a rechargeable head it did a decent job you know probably at the rate that i was going through them was cost effective mm -hmm. you know um but actually, another thing you can do is if you had a bunch of leaves, you could simply come in and bury that cover crop. You know, Just bury it sometime in February or something like that. And then when you're ready to plant, it's going to be basically dead. It'll come back if you give it any light. But as long as you make sure that once your plants are in, you know, it'll work that way too. I'm doing a whole class in May. I'm still developing the systems, actually. But I got you know, an example. I wish I'd showed it to you out there. One example is going to be you plant a cover crop that you know is going to win or kill. And then you can plant in it. And if people want to go back and look at it during the break, the last full lush bed of cover crop out there is all cover crops that will freeze and die sometime this winter, mm -hmm. unless we have bizarre weather like 2011, because they can't take temperatures that are in the teens. You know? yeah. So it's like spring barley, Facilia tanacetifolia, oilseed radish, and fenugreek. You know? And so that mix is as diverse. Once again, I went for as many things as I, know, as I can find that, can not, that will do that, right? I didn't want just one or two, right? That mix, it's wonderfully lush. It went in at the perfect time, you know, and it got really nice and big fast. And now it's like this. Mm. And by December, it should be like that. I hope it doesn't freeze till the middle of February. Yeah. You know, and if that happens, it'll be huge. And then there'll be all that biomass, you know. Now, if I want to ensure that it dies on my schedule, what I might do is come out and put real cover over it. Maybe even give it a little bit of fertilization, you know, during a warm week and push it. And then on a brutally cold night, even though it's barely in the teens, pull that cover off. You know, 
pretty cruel, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Probably not as cruel to the overall environment as tilling your soil. You know, that's a whole lot more damage. We have not tilled anything in here since 2011, with the exception of two beds over there. We we don't we have a power harrow, and we power harrowed, which works like a tiller, right? But only the top few inches to incorporate a potassium potassium sulfate where we were low in potassium. We just did it for incorporation. We don't till. And I guess I'll just cover it right now. We may till because of the, the vegetable weevil. The vegetable weevil is a winter pest. If I could just put it out there long enough that somebody th realizes there's a market for it, there is a beneficial nematode that's active in the 40s. And if they would just make those commercially available, we'd never have to till. Wow. Because of that would, the problem is the, the weevil doesn't hatch out of its egg until after the temperature has dropped below 50. Meanwhile, the nematode's gone to sleep at that temperature. Right. You know, and it can't, it doesn't, it, it has to go inside a, a larva. It doesn't do anything to eggs, you know. So we don't have a control. And that weevil can really, it looks like somebody took a shotgun to these leaves, mm -hmm. you know. And they're very hard to see. They're kind of clear little bug, little worms, you know. And so last year we got control, decent enough control using neem and spinosad. But we may decide at some point that it's okay to till this whole thing once because we'll break the cycle for several years, yeah. you know. And that's actually, you know, one tillage once every four or five years, not nearly as big a crime as all the time, you yeah. know. So. It seems like the fumes have filled up in here. If you, if you open it. Yeah, all the doors are open, the fans are going. Yeah, no problem. Usually if, when we'd be doing that, the sidewalls are up, you know. Mm -hmm. We'd be doing that earlier in the season. So, yeah, not a problem. No, I would not recommend having this closed up and till all the beds in here. Mm -hmm. You may never get to finish, mm -hmm. you know. But in this size of greenhouse with the doors and stuff open, it's not a problem, you know. We just tend not to do it. We flail mow. That's a, that's, that's a walk behind tractor, you know. And so we do that regularly in here. We flail mow a lot. And we just got a roller. We're going to start rolling cover crops down too, you know. Um, and that always takes a walk behind tractor. But no, the fumes aren't a big problem. We got the fans going too, you know. It's like there's lots of air exchange, you know. A smaller greenhouse might be more of an issue. Something to pay attention to. Any questions about what you're seeing? Oh, by the way, those chards over there? They've been in the ground now for about three years. You know, we just hadn't, they don't want to die, and we haven't worked hard to kill them. So they can easily be long-term perennials if you let them. You know? um, and there's always volunteers coming up from there. You know? How old is this fig tree? This fig tree was here when I got here in 2007. You know? um, it's, I'm going to guess it's at least two or three years old, older, older than that. You know? By the way, anybody that, you know, it's a little off topic, but since you can grow them in your greenhouse, not totally. You all know that when these go dormant, if you just trim them as you need to, you know, if we don't trim it, it'll grow through the roof, right? right? Trim them as you need to, take those pieces of wood, get some heavy soil that holds water for a good long time, shove them in and firm them in like a whole bunch in each pot, and let them sit and make sure they don't dry out. Keep them moist, right? Sometime the next summer, you'll start to see green sprouts on the tips and stuff, and then you take them and pot them up, you have new fig trees. Wow. That easy. They're so easy to propagate, you know? We always have like, you know, a whole mess around to just stick in here and there. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the room and look a little bit more at the handout and maybe look at some pictures. What was that implement behind the track? Oh, track you said you use in that? Flail mower. A what? A flail mower. A flail mower. And what yeah, does so that do? They basically have these kind of cutting um, things that are on kind of like chains. Just a just chops everything up, chops it up fine and drops it where it is. Prop, preps your bed. It doesn't prep the bed. It simply chops up your cover crop. We don't prep the bed. Yeah. You know, prepping the bread just like actually does soil damage. You don't need to. You know? Yeah. Um, okay, so is everybody ready? All right, so um, why don't you ask, ask your question first and then you ask your question. Any other questions can be, we'll take some questions right now. Okay. Yeah, Mike. My question was, who, who do you recommend for suppliers for things like, uh, well, all, all the different things Imp you get, like okay. remay that are not uh -huh. remay? Uh -huh. So you heard us, we covered a little bit about the remay out there in the garden, right? right. So you heard those people. Should I go over them again? If you want to, anybody want me to hear them again so I can write it down? John, okay. Johnny sells it. Um, Fedco sells it. Um, Farm Tech sells it. Um, most of the catalogs sell it. You know, it depends on how much they're into that business, how good the prices are. If it's just a sideline, they, you know, the rule of selling stuff, right, is like the more trouble it is to your business, the more you charge. So 
if you're into selling a lot of it, then you're going you're gonna to have a more competitive price. So you want to shop. The prices can vary quite a bit. You know? I can tell you right now, if you're going to use the staples for them, do not mail order them. Do not mail order them. They are ridiculously expensive, plus they're heavy. They're available at all the feed and seeds. If you happen to be driving on 19, headed towards Burnsville, the cheapest supplier, and I'm glad to pick up a box for anybody that wants me to, is Parker's Farm Supply. They're consistently below $30. Other people are $39. Just the staples? Just the staples, yeah. Well, they're like this, you know. Have you ever seen one that's kind of rounded at the top? Yeah, I've seen them. I don't know that. It's so nice. They, they, they pull out easy, yeah. But they're pretty expensive, I think, too. The oh, ones I've sure. seen. Yeah, it's a, it just depends on how much you. I'm thinking volume. If I ever find out, you know, I'll make sure we post it as a resource, you know. Okay, so that's row cover, right? Plastic, likewise, the same sources, you know. Like Troy's Greenhouse and probably Fifth Season, they'll order the exact size you want if you want a big roll. Otherwise, they'll sell it by the foot, which is really very useful, you know. What plastic rods you got out there? The plastic rods, the place I know that you can get those, and I just know we can get a mail order, though Fifth Season is a distributor, so they could order them in and you can pick them up there, and that would save on shipping probably, is Seven Springs Farm Supply. Does everybody know that supplier? They're an important one to know because if you're going to be buying bulk, you can get your best price by getting on their mailing list and they have trucks coming down. Yeah, there we go. Just pass that around if we can, okay? They're going to and get, go ahead and get the uh, information for contact. And let's just start it back here so it, we know it gets, if you just send it that way and then get it all the way around. And then get it back to Jim. It's Jim's, right? Okay. Um, they will send a truckload down and you get in on that and you know, if you try and mail order a, ba a bag of amendments, you're going to spend almost as much on the shipping as you do on the amendment. Whereas if you get in on that order, it's going to cost you maybe six, seven bucks for your entire order on shipping. So it's a very good deal. You have to you know, put the order in and then pick it up when you say you're going to pick it up because it's going to be at places like Madison County Extension. And they're not going to tolerate you're leaving it there for three weeks or something. You know? So you've got to be responsible. But it can really pay off. So just get on their mailing list. You'll see when they're coming. And that's a good way to get that, you know? Yeah. Have you had any problems with your uh, rods? Um, eventually, they offer more and more splinters. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, they're fiberglass rods. Wear gloves. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, the new ones are coated. Yeah, for a while. Because yeah. mine are great. How old are they? They're new. They were bought this spring. Call them up. They'll replace them. There's something wrong. You got a dud, a dud patch. I mean, you know. Yeah. Unless you've been doing something well, else know, to them. I, uh, after I was only using insect, uh, mm -hmm. and they started breaking as soon as the heat started to warm up. Yeah, those are, those are duds. And uh, yeah. then I put them in the ground along the asparagus just to mm -hmm. like, hold it up. You mm -hmm. know? They, they haven't broken, but as soon as you put something over the top. Yeah, no, they're, they're supposed to take weight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've never heard that before. Well, they sent, he sent an email out about it early spring, and I hadn't really used many of them at that point. But well, I, got out of, I bought 50, I think I got. I talked to him. 20, yeah. 20 talked 20. to him. Yeah. He, hopefully, if he's a smart businessman, he'll make it right. Well, you know? he, he even sent out an email. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so it sounds like it was a dud batch. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where you get fly. And all, they sell most of the amendments that we use, you know. Alfalfa, all those things I talked about for amendments, they carry all those. You'll see it in there, you know. They carry cover crop seed. It's going to cost you more than if you're getting it local because you're paying shipping. But if you get it on the, on the shipment, it won't cost you that much more, you know. Um, we actually, and they do sell smaller quantities. We like to buy our seed now from Walnut Creek in Ohio. What I really love about them is all these unusual mixed species, the legumes, they, they give you the right inoculant. And the list, I mean, the, there's so many different inoculants you need, it can really be overwhelming. People tend not to do it. And if you don't do it, you're missing out on this incredible dynamism, this, this ability to fixate nitrogen that's very major. You know? um, and if you're getting a bigger quantity, they'll also inoculate it with um, mycorrhizae for you. And that really rocks. If you can get both done, you're doing really good stuff for your soil. It's that really was Walnut, Walnut, Walnut Creek in Ohio, the Brandt family. If you, if you Google them, you'll find them. Yeah. I'm sorry, what's your question? The turnip seed, the white turnip? Uh, yeah, that is w Wade at Troy's Greenhouse, 828 682 6439. Why, do they save their own seed or something? No, he just really knows the industry. And in the wintertime, things are slow. He just gets on the phone and goes to work. You know? So 
And so he just figured out who produced it. And then when that seed salesman came in, he leaned on him and leaned on him and said, I got customers need this untreated. You got to give me untreated. And the guy's like, I'll tell you what. We'll pull off a couple pounds right before we start the line, right when we first start the line before we turn the stuff on. So that's why it's such an inside thing. You know, it's like he's got to actually have enough, con you know, he buys enough seed. I mean, his seed orders are like tens of thousands, if not, you know, you know, thirty thousand dollars worth a year of seed. So people pay attention to him, you know. And he just gets them to pull it off before, you know, before it gets treated. Okay. So, uh, otherwise, I don't know where to get white lady untreated. It's all treated, you know. Uh, they're all hybrids. Yeah. They're, if you want to try an un un hybridized one, you might try Tokyo Express. I think it is, or something like that. Um, Tokyo something or another might be similar, but I tried white egg one year and was bitterly disappointed. Really very variable and unimpressive quality, you know. The, you know, I think they could be dehybridized. You know, I've had them volunteer and be pretty close, but there's a certain edge of quality that's hard to, you know. And turnips are very hard to keep true. I mean, there was the first one I learned was Presto from Nickel Seed out in the West Coast, and I basically introduced that to the area. I turned people on to the concept of baby white turnips. And within three years or so, after I noticed that some purple tops were showing up and some variation was showing up, they weren't carrying it anymore. And I asked them, I said, could you not keep it true? And they said, that's exactly what happened. They just couldn't maintain the, you know. They're, they're expensive because they take a lot of work, you know. But White Lady is a better deal. It ain't cheap, but it's a better deal than Hikuri. And Oasis is the one that um, Fedco carries, you know. Fedco, by the way, talking about sources, my two go-to most used seed companies are Johnny Selected Seed. I have that catalog with me here somewhere. Unless somebody picked it up. Oh, there it is. Um, Johnny Selected Seed and um, Fedco. Both of them are, one's a cooperative, the other's a worker-owned business. I like that. Um, and they do very good customer service and they have top quality and they give you tons of information. They have charts, you know. They both have seed specs, so they tell you all about what to expect from the seed, you know, at the beginning of each category. They, you know, um, Fedco has a chart that shows you what temperature is the best temperature for them to germinate, when to plant them, stuff like that. Lots of good information. Real attention to high quality, high quality crops. I mean, they pay a lot of attention. They take feedback. And so Fedco is a little slower to change. They're a collective, you know, collectives tend to have a lot of independent minds and so they're slower to, you know, our cooperative rather. Anyway, they didn't come up with a, um, a white turnip for quite a while. And they kept getting requests because people were having to buy a curry from Johnny's and they wanted to buy all from Fedco if they were you know, diehard Fedco fans. Finally, they came up with Oasis, which is about the same thing. Both of those are two of the most expensive seeds you're going to buy, worth every penny. But White Lady, if you hook up with Wade, is more cost effective. You know? um, OK, so other suppliers, let's see. For the beneficial insects, um, I'd say if you're gonna if you're gonna grow cucumbers in the summer, you're gonna have problems with cucumber with um, squash beetles rather. New Jersey Department of Agriculture, Dr. Tom Dorsey is the head of the department, and get together with a few people because it's gonna be at least 60, 80 bucks, and you'll share them. But the um, wasp from India called Pediobius foveolatus. Um, and that's actually written down here, so it'll be, on, it'll be online. You'll be able to read it. Um, and you want to release that when you have at least larva or eggs. If you have only eggs, you get the mummies of the parasitized bean beetle larva. That's what it does, is it parasit parasitizes the larva. And then they hatch out about the same time that the eggs hatch out. But if you have the larva already, then you get the live wasp because you want them to go to work right away. Timing is critical. Be on top of that scouting. And this year, as I described, they got me because between the polar vortex and our use of them over other years, we had so few bean, beetle, bean beetles and squash beetles early on that the population had crashed of the predator, and then the um, squash beetle boomed and took out our cucumbers. Can you repeat yeah. where the supply? Dr. Tom Dorsey, the New Jersey Department of Agriculture, tell them you want the bean beetle predator. And it's pretty interesting. They ship them to you and bill you later, I mean like months later. Because they think they might ship you more, and they're not in it for the money. You know, they're, it's a service. You know, um, they privatized it for a little while, and it didn't work nearly as well. And I guess the people who were trying to do it for profit weren't making enough money, and they gave up on it. So now it's back with the Department of Agriculture. And it, it's, I've been getting them since the mid '90s from them, and they work really well. 
They send them on time. They'll help you figure out how many you need. Works really well. Um, the biocontrol network is another source for beneficials. Like, let's say you have aphids in your greenhouse and you haven't got enough farmscaping or it's too cold. You know, the aphids can reproduce way more quickly than anything else, so they can take advantage of warm weather, right? So you have a few, a few days of warm weather, you have a boom of aphids, and your predators haven't even woken up yet, right? Now it's getting cold, and they don't get out there, so they don't prey on the aphids. Aphids are easily controlled when you have good balance in warm weather. But in the cold weather, they're harder to control. You might want to order uh, a quart of ladybugs. Keep them in a cold place, um, and they will just stay asleep. And then on warm days, you go out and you put a couple around each plant, and they'll crawl up and eat the aphids. You know? That can be very cost effective. If you have, for, a home gar for a home greenhouse, you're probably not going to bother. What you want to do is talk to your neighbors who are being dr driven nuts by ladybugs and say, I'll take them. You know? Here's my dust buster. Vacuum them up, put them in a jar with some straw, put a piece of cheesecloth over it, moisten that cheesecloth, let them go up there and drink on that cheesecloth for a little while and then stick them in the fridge or a cold garage. And then never release them all, release a, a small amount, like two or three per plant, on warm days. You know? And with luck, as the season starts to warm up, you'll start seeing ladybug larvas in there. And ladybug larvae are the teenagers, the hungry teenagers. You know? And they'll do big, you know. The, both of these other ones, first chance they get, they're gonna fly out because it's not their native place to be, you know? And you'll lose them. But they'll fly out and hang out in your garden for a while, so it's not bad. But the teenagers can't fly, you know? So they're stuck there until they can grow their wings, and they got to do a lot of eating before they grow their wings. Yeah? Earlier you mentioned mycorrhiza. Where, where, where do you find Fifth season carries it? Yeah, it's not cheap either. So no, okay, so here's a strategy for you. Um, one of my favorite winter crops is an allium, evergreen hardy bunching onion, right? Get yourself a bed of them going, right? But inoculate them with mycorrhizae, right? They're perennial. They're a bunching onion, right? So they'll you know, put one in and don't pick them until there's like three or four or five, right? Then always leave one and the bunch will keep coming back. Well, that mycorrhizae is staying there, right? Now, major planting season time, go in there and harvest a bunch very carefully that you can replant next to your plants. Mm. The mycorrhizae on the roots of that onion are going to migrate off and you're moving them in, you know? The other thing that may or may not work, I kind of think it probably does, but I haven't done the research to prove it, is you're storing compost or leaf mold, store it under a tree that has the same mycorrhizal relationship as vegetables. And you can go to the website, Mycorrhizal Applications, and find a chart that shows you that, okay? I'm pretty sure we have one up on the wall in the greenhouse there. So I happen to know that for sure, hollies and willows, okay? Um, I'm pretty sure maples too. I'm pretty sure not oaks and not pines, right? But um, willow is really a special tree in many ways. I could go on for a long time about it. It has extra floral nectaries, right? It blooms early, so it's feeding the beneficials early with blooms. It has both endo and ectomycorrhizae, both the ones for trees and the ones for vegetables. That's what I was going to say. They, they tend to sell them in endo or ecto. Yeah, you want the, you want the endo for vegetables, by and large, I mean, almost virtually, I can't think of one that doesn't do endo for vegetables, you know? And uh, actually, most of our trees do, too. You know, ecto is a smaller number of ones, you know? Then there's also the um, ones for the ericaceous plants, like the blueberries and the heaths and stuff like that, and, and the azaleas and all, and that's rhododendrons, that's another whole category, you know? But that's out of the realm of greenhouses, so we're gonna leave that alone for now, you know, and just stay with the greenhouse ones. So use an onion bed to keep that going. You know, a perennial onion bed, you're gonna always have those mycorrhizae growing on there if you establish them well in the first place. And then move the onions around, you're moving the myco mycorrhizae around, you know. Um, and the other thing to know is if you stop tilling, don't use Roundup, don't use chemical fertilizers, the mycorrhizae are gonna be there, you know. You don't have to worry about it. Years ago, I was all excited about mycorrhizae. I used the heck out of it after seeing Dr. Elaine Ingham give a talk. She then came to where I worked for a conference. I got her to come. And we're, in the, we're, doing, we're talking about how to get mycorrhizae established. And I asked her, you know, am I doing the right things to establish it? She said, with all the other stuff you're doing, don't even worry about it. Don't buy it. You've got them. You know? If you're doing all the best practices of an organic grower, you might use that mycorrhizal inoculant once, and you're done. It's there. You're not going to lose it. You know? It's going to be there. You know? On the other hand, she said that 
um, devil's advocate, right? And I wanted to know if she could explain to me why that was the first year I'd ever had four foot tall peppers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Um, so, you know, best practice, we actually do use it. But, you know, if you're taking good care of stuff, and we'll stop at some point. We'll, we'll, we have microscopes now. Meredith has learned how to use it. I missed my chance this weekend. But we're going to eventually learn to be able to see that they're there. And then we don't have to keep, keep doing it. But till then, we, we kind of like doing it, you know. So mycorrhizal applications is a place to buy it too. They have lots of good information. Um, Dr. Mike Amaranthus, great name for somebody in the garden, <laughs> garden business, you know. Um, the man who discovered, who, who put out the theory of farmscaping and named it, his name is Dr. Bug, Dr. B-U-G-G, -G, you know. Um, anyway, are there any, can anybody think of any, um, any supplies that I didn't mention? You want to know how to? The heat tape. You don't heat tape, OK. Um, Gleckner is a place where you can buy it that's actually it's designed for that, OK? Um, and it's about 80 bucks for, for what will make you a, a 3 foot by 10 foot table, you know? Um, it doesn't come with a thermostat. You need your own. If you go online, I'm pretty sure, don't we have that resource there? Did, for the seed starting thing, didn't we post the resources for the, all the addresses and stuff for getting those things? Yeah. So it should be in our resource page. Um, we got them from um, the company that's got the great big fat catalog that you have to, you can't, yeah, Granger, you know. And you have to have a business to buy from them, but you can invent a business, you know, and buy from them. Um, but we, I can t it tells you exactly which one. You know, it's a remote bulb thermostat. It, it can, I was able to do three tables with one thermostat. You know, um, it works quite well. You know, anyway, if you don't want to find Gleckner and buy that $80 one, you can sometimes get a slightly better price um, for ice melt cables from Lowe's or Home, Home Depot. But you cannot walk in the store and buy them because we don't have enough ice threatening our gutters here in the south. They have to order them in from the northern stores. Or if you're traveling north for the holidays or something, you can pick them up there. The thing to know, right, about those tables, right, this is, that's all in the thing. But I'm going to say this because I was giving a talk on this at Southern Sog in New Orleans one year. And as I was walking in to give a talk, the guy said, I made one of those tables, but I skipped the gravel. I burned my house down. Whoa. Use the gravel or the sand. They can short out. They can overheat. And if they're on gravel or sand, no big deal. Right. You know, if they're on wood shelves, bye-bye house. You know, so... If we're going to mention those, use the gravel or sand, you know, absolutely. Okay, anything else on supplies? All right, so you had a question about drip tape. And we use drip tape in the greenhouse, so it's fair game for this, for this talk, right? Um, tea tape changed my life. You know, I started gardening in North Carolina in the second half of the 80s, and I don't know if you lived here then, but we had some wicked droughts. I mean, they were major news. And indeed, all the... Um, you know, um, what's the name of it? That tall grass with the plumes that's all along the highways. That all came in, thank you, from very, very wonderful Midwestern farmers who gave hay to Southern farmers who couldn't feed their cattle. Um, and the droughts were that bad, and it was very hard to be a grower. And irrigation was really hard to do. And then I learned about tea tape, and everything got easy. It's really wonderful stuff. Now, you need a good enough size garden. I think the figure is you need 700 feet for it to work well. You know, so if you don't have 700 feet, you might have some problems. I've known people to make it work for even this smaller amount, but just got to do with how much pressure there is and stuff like that. Supposedly 700 feet is what you need. But T-tape, it's called T-tape because there's a supply line and then your drip tape, right, which is this very cheap stuff. Most people throw it away. I try to use it for several years, but like 100 bucks will buy you a mile, you know, a mile's worth of it, right? It tees into that feeder line, okay? It tees in with little fittings that cost someplace like 50 cents each. They're not cheap. We have these more fancy ones that are more like 75 cents each that you can shut off. You don't need those. You can simply, if you're shutting off one bed, you can simply get a tube that goes in one hole and into the other hole and the water just goes you know, through the tube and never goes out anywhere. You know? Or you can use, uh, you can also, the way you seal these tapes is you take a piece of the tape itself and you fold over your line, and then slide that sleeve over it, and that's how you close the end. You know, I don't know that they even sell things to close them any other way. You can just stick a short piece of that in, and that'll that'll shut your line down too. You know, so suppliers for that, um, 
WP Law is a mail order supplier. Um, I think most of the places around here like um, uh, crop, crop Production Services in Hendersonville, um, they supply those supplies. Um, you can get them mail order from the catalogs, but they're too expensive. Just buy them local or buy them from a dedicated supplier like um, WP Law. For years, I recommend it 1-800-SAY-RAIN. And that's because I can remember it. They're in Louisiana. They're, from, they're more shipping, and WP Law is a North Carolina business. You wanna buy, might want to buy from them. But they get good service. You know? It costs a little more to ship it. What's great is all these people are great consultants. They really will help you to set up your system. You know? And you need that if you're going to be using a pump or something. You need to know what your, you know, what your um, flow is on your pump. You might need a pressure regulator. You want someone to set the system up for you. You don't want to just like wing it together yourself. You'll have problems. You know? But it's not hard. One thing I'd say, if you're drawing from surface water, well, two things. One is that there's a disease you have to worry about. And I can't tell you a way around that, unfortunately. And the other is you're going to need a filter. And a lot of people are going to push a sand filter. And a sand filter, there may be situations you need it in. I have not come upon that need yet. Sand filters are like $1,200, $1,500. For a couple hundred bucks, you can get a spin filter. Now, a spin filter has to allow some of the water to go back out again. And it simply, by the force of the water, spins around and with centrifugal force, throws the stuff that you don't want to the outer edges where it flushes back out. And so, you know, for a couple hundred bucks, you get the same effect for most people that a um, sand filter is, I'm going with the spin filter, you know. Um, I thought I died and went to heaven when I got that system set up. It works wonderfully, you know, it puts the water, it's really nice. You get the um, six inch spacing and you can use that as your planting guide, you know. You turn the water on long enough to make a little circle everywhere and then you just plant where that circle is. You know, the water's going to get right to it, the spacing's perfect, you know. And if you got three inch spacing, you put one in between, you know. If you got foot spacing, you skip it. You got 18 inches, you know, you can figure. Most of us can do that math, you know. It works pretty well. So it's a, it's a really nice system. I highly recommend drip tape, um, T-tape. You know, it's, it's pretty perfect. There, there's two kinds of supply lines. There's three kinds of supply lines, actually. There's, we use this rigid, but you don't want to buy it at the hardware store because it's too hard. It's purposely meant round, I think it's inch or inch and a half or two, in, two inch supply line. When I had my farm, I needed a lot more water to go out there. I used blue lay flat vinyl that inflated when you used it, right? Then my friend um, Michael Wells, who had Granny Rachel's, who I mentioned earlier with the greenhouse, um, he actually gave me some three inch vinyl, very soft and flat. I mean, you know, pi not, not vinyl, but PVC. So all three of those work. I mean, the size of it depends on how, many, how much area you're trying to water. Um, but you, and then if you're going to do this right on any scale, they're probably 40 bucks by now, but there's this tool that used to cost 25 bucks when I bought it. And you look at it, why is it 25 bucks? Because very few people buy them. You know, that's why, you know. But it's this little tool that's got a, a kind of like cutting edge on the end, and you can slide it through that fitting that's going to go into the um, feeder pipe. And then that fitting is a lock sleeve that you then open up and put your tape on and lock it back on. Trying to make a hole on your own that's the perfect size can take a lot of skill and time. This, you just shove that thing in and shove that um, fitting in there and pull it out and go on to the next one. Worth every cent, even if they're 40 bucks by now. If you're going to do much, they're worth every cent by far. They really pay off in a big way. You know, I highly recommend them. Um, yeah? You said something about uh, problems with surface water. Okay, yes. Thank you for reminding me. No, not rainwater until it runs over, over ground. If it comes off your roof, not a problem. The problem is one disease, Phytophthora capsici. Phytophthora capsici is um, in the same family as late blight and downy mildew. You know how nice they are, right? Phytophthora capsici probably makes them look like the good guys because it gets in your soil. It does not go away. And it is pathogenic to peppers, the family of peppers, you know, so all solanacea, particularly peppers, cucurbit, particularly summer squash, and I learned much to my chagrin after I planted where I'd had it, um, beans. Um, and it's also a bunch of weeds that it can host too. It comes in with flood water, and it's, getting, it's spreading more and more all the time. 
So it's yes. okay. I'll, I'll try. You yeah. know, and the good news is Google will correct me, right? P H Y T O. It's like P T H T H T H O P for top thera. Yeah, yeah. And then cap C C is C A P S C A P S I C I. Thank you. Yeah, I knew there was a it was a double vowel of one sort or another. <laughs> spelling. I want a spelling bee in third grade. That grade. That was my peak. You know, it's been downhill ever since then. You know? um, okay, so that disease lives in the soil, comes in with rain. We got it in a bed out here in 2013. We have enough soil diversity that its MO was atypical. The pathologist was surprised that it was that. She thought it looked like it, but she didn't think it could be because usually it kills everything in a matter of days. It can kill acres in a matter of days. It took the whole summer to kill two-thirds of a bed of Anaheim peppers. She said probably five to ten times in that conversation, you must have amazing soil. You must have incredible soil. So build that soil diversity. It is your solution yeah. to even the worst diseases. Okay? Um, I just was, gave a talk here a couple of weeks ago or a month or two ago on brassicas and revisited growing brassicas to suppress soil diseases, and they might help if you get it, you know. But it is, I mean, a lot of us have no choice but to use surface water, and so you just have to be aware of it. Do not go to other people's farms and track their dirt into your farm, you know. You can spread it. Do not share equipment without cleaning it. I'm into sharing equipment, but clean it really well, you know. Um, tools, hand tools, hydrogen peroxide will kill it, you know. Um, find a way to make sure you don't spread it. It's a bad disease. We were scared enough by it that we went ahead and captured our spring. It was captured already, but we got it so we have a 1,400-gallon tank in the ground, and we're going to water with just spring water because it's just a bad disease, and it's here. You know? And I can't give you any other solutions to that except for soil diversity and maybe growing brassicas there in the wintertime. It's actually, me they mentioned it as one of the diseases that was suppressed by the brassicas. Yeah? Not use, not use um, surface water, you know, lake, pond, and stream water for irrigation, um, and not track other people's soil in, and hope like all heck. The spring water's fine, yeah. It, it's surface water's the problem, yeah. Rainwater's fine, yeah. Rainwater, once it's run over the ground, if that ground is contaminated, is not fine, you know. I think you have to kill it. I don't think filtering, I, I don't know for sure, but I'd be surprised if it was, you know. So you'd have to have some kind of extra treatment layer. Yeah, I'm not sure what that would be. You know, I don't know, you know, of, I've never heard of somebody having a solution whereby they could use surface water and not be assured of avoiding for top the capsici, you know. Um, it's a serious problem, and it's been getting worse. The more floods we have, the worse it gets, you know, the longer it's around, you know. Um, I guess, oh, I, I can say that um, the higher the volume of water, the less likely you are to get it, you know. So, you know, taking it from a small pond or a big pond, you're going to do better from a big pond, you know. Um, and then maximizing your soil diversity and, you know, I don't really encourage lagoons as a cover crop because of harlequin bugs. You know, I want my cover crop to be in longer and then that's a place for the harlequin bugs to get an early start. But not legumes, I'm sorry, brassicas. brassicas. But for if I if I have a guy for top of cap CC, I'm gonna plant brassicas in that bed. Because it supposedly does have a, a mitigating effect. You may not get rid of it immediately, you know. I mean, we had it and I inadvertently planted beans because when I last had experienced it, beans were not one of the susceptible crops. And it was susceptible. We expected those beans to die and they did fine. I mean, we have done so well that Jeremy this year said, Pat, can we plant squash here? And I said, please, no, let's not. Let, let, let's not go there, you know. Let's make this, we're going to make it a perennial um, herb bed and farmscaping bed and just try and keep it isolated that way, you know. But 2013, it showed up in a few places on our farms, you know. Um, it hasn't spread. That was, really, that was that really wet year, wasn't it? God. Yeah, that was a bad year. You know, was a bad year across the whole state. I talked to farmers all over the state. Nobody did well. You know? Okay, so I think that, does that take care of questions? Did I, did I give you enough information about the T-tape? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, let's harlequin, go. Harlequin, you were, you were yeah, okay, harlequin bugs. We'll cover that now. Um, they're a tough one. They're a really tough one. The best solution is rotation. If you don't have a big garden, good luck. You know? 
I mean, going from that side of the room to this side of the room is not going to stymie a harlequin bug. And a lot of people have gardens smaller than that, you know? So then you can't do that. But rotation, if you can do it, like we have this garden out here, right? And then there's one house, and then there's another house, and another house, and those two other houses, their garden's behind that. And that's far enough away. There's both physical barriers and distance that they don't benefit from being next to the other one, you know? So we make it that brassicas in this garden in the fall, no brassicas in this garden in the springtime, brassicas back there. And we rotate that every year, you know? And if we do that, that is huge towards solving the problem. The other things you can do, scouting is critical for harlequin bugs. Pay attention, get out there, use your peripheral vision, you know? That's how you see these things, right? Yeah. You know, um, know that where you see white, whitish damage on the leaves, if you flip it over, you're going to see a harlequin bug. You know, they leave, they leave a mark, right? The key thing to know is they're gregarious. They hang out together on purpose when they're first invading a new area because there are wasps that lay eggs in their eggs, right? And they can keep those wasps away, but then they don't have any time to feed. So they have some designated babysitters that protect the eggs while they feed and they switch around. Life is way smarter than we know. You know? I mean, we think that you know, we're so smart and the rest are all just dumb. No, 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 no. They, so they, but you know that strategy now. You know that if you hit them when they're in that gregarious stage, they're all in one place to kill them. Now, Charles Church, a wonderful grower who has since passed, um, used to grow up in the Boone area, right? He would plant fields of things like broccoli and stuff, right? and come back, and where, he did it with a transplanter, right? So you always have some that don't take. He came back and direct seeded mustard in there. They like mustard way more than broccoli, right? Mm -hmm. So he would let them build up in those mustard patches and then flame those patches. Wow. And he got big time control, you know? Cleome is more attractive to them than, than brassicas. So if you grow Cleome and go out there in the morning when they're moving slow and have yourself like a, I'd say a bushel basket kind of thing, with soapy water in it and just whack that whole Cleome hard over that basket full of soon to be dead harlequin bugs, you know, because they can't negotiate the soapy water and get back out, you know. Also, you know, um, soap, insecticidal soap is effective against the young ones in particular. It's more effective if you add a little bit of alcohol, you know, isopropyl or when I did it at Pine Lake Inn because I wasn't going to bother to try and figure out whether it was approved. I just figured I'd use food grade. If you can drink it, it probably could pass certification, you know. Um, and so I just went to the um, bar and said, give me your strongest, you know, vodka, and just add a little bit of that into my, um, you know. They had to look at me a moment. It was like, for the, for the soapy water here. You can put it in the soapy water, you know. <laughs> it's okay, you know. Um, and that helps it to work, you know. 20% um, stronger than label. Technically not legal, but, you know, I don't know. You know. You, anyways, I have that information. I actually haven't done it, but 20% stronger than the label supposedly is very effective. You know, and just spraying them with the soap. You won't think it works. Charles Church told Richard McDonald, doesn't work, Richard. He said, track that beetle for a couple days. They don't die quick. It's not pretty. You know? It basically is like napalming them. You know? Their outside is burned away and they dehydrate, but they do die. You know? um, it does, by the way, hurt the beneficials. They say, oh, soap doesn't hurt the beneficials. It may not hurt them as much, but they will take some damage too. So that's why you want to try and concentrate rather than just go, I don't want to bother, look, I'll just spray everything with soap. It's harmless, right? Not true. Not harmless. So try to, try to target it to where you, you can, you know? You know, we one year, they'd gotten ahead of us and all that, and Jeremy and um, Tim just decided we're going to get control. And three times a week, they just handpicked. They spent about 45 minutes over the whole crop, a lot of crops, right? But they got fast. They learned to spot where they were with the, you know, the little marks on the leaves and all that. About two, three weeks of that, and the problem was solved. You know? It's all about no mercy early on. Do not let them get ahead of you. You see them, you go to war, and you wage relentless war until you know you've won. You know? um, they get ahead of you, you know what they can do. It is not pretty. You know? And... I'd say if you can't rotate, I wouldn't try and push the season. I wouldn't start planting brassicas out till the middle of, October, middle of August, you know. Um, and the greenhouse, I'd wait, you know. I'd wait till later, you know. Just 
they're going to have a, they're, they're, the warmer it is, the more they're at the, the advantage. The cooler it is, the more you're at the advantage. So you got to learn to just play with that and make it fit in your system. What wasp were you talking about? Um, I'm talking about a bunch of wasps. I talked oh. about Pediobius fovulatus. That's a wasp, right? Oh, the one you were specifically I don't know the name of it, unfortunately. Richard didn't even tell me the name, but it is the, there's a wasp that preys on the harlequin bug, on their eggs, you know. So if you punch that in, good old, you know, yeah. Google, you can probably pull it up, you know. Then when you find out, send me, you know, okay. <laughs> then I'll know it next time, right? And then it'll take me five years to learn how to say it, you know. Five more to learn how to spell it if I'm lucky. Um, but yeah, um, that's probably the best bet for that one, I think. It's not an easy one. I would never claim it, is, it was, but if you stay on it, you can do pretty well. If you have a smaller garden, it's harder than if you have a bigger garden. I just read English sparrows and mockingbirds feed on them. So now, can you bring in specifically English sparrows and mockingbirds? No, but what does that tell you? Maximize diversity. Create many, many ways that you have every sort of life. Long time ago, I gave up trying to, and people want me to do it all the time, give you formulas, what plants to take care of, what pest. I throw my hands up. I can't do it. I can tell you, maximize diversity. They'll figure it out. I didn't know the mockingbirds controlled harlequin bugs, but we got them here. You know? We're a bird-friendly place. You know? um, I saw them feeding on my feeder last winter. It was like, okay, you're here. You know? I didn't expect you, but I'm glad you're here. You know? um, English sparrows, I like to bird. I can't even tell you what an English sparrow looks like, to tell you the truth. You know? Just, I'm not that excited by sparrows. You know? <laughs> um, anyway, any more questions, or can we go back to the... All right, now we probably have to cover some time, but it's always pretty hilarious. I mean, Meredith, didn't you ask me if I was going to be able to have six hours worth of stuff to talk about? <laughs> I think you did, didn't you? Yeah, right. <laughs> no, no, I got, I, I'm, I'm going to be pushing it. Okay. I actually have, as I said, you can go online and see it. I did an incredibly comprehensive calendar that lists very specifically the vegetables and stuff that do well in the, in the fall and winter, right? But the, I, gave you the, I give you the families as we come into it now. It's like, you know, the brassica family, you know, Cabbage, broccoli, arugula, totsoy, mizuna, turnips, radishes, cauliflower, um, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi. I mean, the list is really long, right? I mean, there's a wonderful, wonderful array of brassicas, right? All of them, boom, thrive this time of year. My exception is for me here, for us here, the broccolis, once it gets into December kind of stuff, we start to get that rot, so we back off on those, you know? But all of those do really, really well, okay? Composite, right? Lettuce for sure, right? It's going to really boom. It's going to do great, right? But also, radicchios, chicories, escaroles. You may think you don't like those. Grown into the winter, right? Harvest it in the winter, way less bitter, way more bittersweet, and then a good Italian recipe. You can expand your taste buds. You can, you can, you can get the benefit of great continental cooking in your own kitchen. You know, um, really try them. They're really good for you. They do really well. The um, radicchios actually are perennials. You could, I've had some gorgeous ones. Castle Frankel is this cone-shaped one, or more, I guess it's more like, like, a, like a romaine. You rinse it under a little bit of warm water, by the way. The warm water pulls out some of the bitterness. Rinse it, any of these under warm water, and then make that in a place where you're using it with fresh fruit. All the chicories combined with fresh fruit makes the fruit taste way sweet. Turns out if you look at like that, that one ice cream in the store that's like, you know, if you didn't taste it, you know, you'd think it was the, the dream ice cream because it's only 150 calories for the whole pint. If you look at its container, one of the ingredients is chicory. Mm -hmm. Because chicory makes things, mm -hmm. something in chicory makes things taste sweeter. Mm -hmm. So if you combine chicory with herbs or sweet beets yeah. or sweet carrots, the synergy is spectacular. So experiment with them. It's a way, you know, we're always looking for how to diversify, right? For our soil and for our own health, right? We eat way less diversity of foods than we did when we lived a more natural life. Oh, and we have way less health in many ways. Now, there are certain things that we solve by living this lifestyle. But the more diversity you can increase, the better. So check out those chicories. There's a long list. There's also like the tray beans that you, know, you plant them really close together so they blanch each other. But then you come in, you cut the heart out, and it regrow. And it gives you that fine, yellow colored, really frilly stuff that's in salad mix. Mm -hmm. Really nice. Mm -hmm. And really productive, too. I highly recommend that you delve into the world of chickens. Um, 
Okay, and then the chenopodiums. Okay, chenopodium is um, beets, char, spinach. You know, they're really stars this time of year. They do really, really well. I mentioned in the greenhouse that space is my favorite spinach this time of year. If you want massive production from chard, grow some of the color because your heart has to sing too. But make sure you grow some green because the green is way more productive than the colored ones. Right? But I mean, if you're growing chard, how can you not grow some rainbow chard, right? I mean, each one you can just look at like it's a painting. You know, it's incredible. Um, also, perpetual spinach is a chard but it doesn't have the stem, and so it's more productive that way, and it tends to be lower in oxalic acid. I've lost track because I don't mind oxalic acid, um, but there are spinaches that make the same claim to fame. So if you're bothered by that bite from the oxalic acid, you can find varieties. Check out Johnny's and Fedco. They both talk about it, I'm pretty sure. There are ones that are not as high in oxalic acid. You can grow those they do really well. Um, spinach. You can do successions of that. Like you can get some planted. You know, I wouldn't even bother to have it in the greenhouse. I plant it in September to start coming in in a big way in October. Meanwhile, I get planted some out in mid-August outside to be eating outdoors production. You know, and then you can keep doing successions and just the longer the season, right? Um, I mean, the, the more we get into short days and cold weather, the slower it's going to go. So you just want to give it, give it more time to get started. You can have successions. You can pick probably, and still think it's worth bottom to pick, this time of year, three to five weeks from a well-established patch of space, and you're just going to pick tons of spinach each time. It's really spectacular. I mean, I'm a much bigger fan of raw spinach than cooked spinach, and my partner really likes to cook more. And it's a real dance, because I want my raw spinach, she wants to cook it. I can get so much from these patches in the greenhouse that I can have all the raw spinach I want and she can have all the spinach she wants and it works great. I mean, they just really produce wonderfully. I highly recommend it. You can just get a lot of food from them. Beets, if you are not going to be able to manage the temperature well, if it's going to get pretty darn cold in your greenhouse, I'd stop sowing them sometime about now and wait to sow them again sometime in the end of January. Because I've just noticed they slow down enough that they will sometimes go to seed before they make a ball. I actually didn't think you could grow them, plant them any, any much later than the middle of October. And then I got down here and we were planting them later and I said they're not going to work and they did. And I figured out it's just it's warmer in those greenhouses. You know? um, and also there's more sun here than there is in Silo. Silo is right up against the mountain and we get more. You know? So it depends on your climate. You just have to watch it and see. Likewise carrots. I've been places where I really wanted to plant my carrots in a greenhouse sometime in September, or they wouldn't work, but I managed to plant them later here and have them be fine. But then also, what I learned here, didn't know when I was planting in Silo, is you can plant them right after solstice, and they'll work fine too. You know? They'll be slow to germinate in that cold soil, and I highly recommend stale bedding. Do you all know about stale bedding? Stale bedding is when you prepare a bed, right, and then you let it go stale, you don't use it. Of course, what's gonna happen? Weeds. Weeds, big time, right? You then come through and use some tool that does minimal soil disturbance. We use a flamer. Do not use a flamer next to your plastic, right? <laughs> yeah. We all know that one, right? Okay? All right. But we use a flamer, right? But you can also use a really sharp, like, collinear hoe or some hoe that barely hits the surface, right? Um, you don't want to disturb it so much because it'll bring up more weed seeds. And you just kill all those weeds, right? And then maybe water it and let it happen again. And then, if you really want to ace it, Plant your carrots, right, or your beets, or your onions, right? Slow germinating things. I wouldn't bother with things like turnips and arugula because you can handle the weeds in those. They outgrow them so fast, right? But those slow germinators are going to cause you problems. Plant a small amount at the beginning of the bed the day before you're going to seed the rest. And then, this is only if you're going to flame, by the way. You can't really do it otherwise, right? Well, you could hand weed it, I guess, still, too. Then, when you see those germinate, watch carefully. The day they germinate, flame or hand weed that bed one more time. Why would, why would it speed up hand weeding? Because you don't have to worry about carrots. There's no carrots, right? They're not going to be up until tomorrow. So you can just come through and pull every green thing that you see, which is a lot faster than trying to tell, is that a carrot seedling at that size or a grass, you know? I mean, they look pretty similar, you know? But if you flame, move fast, because those things are right at the edge and you can hurt them. If you move fast, you can wipe out all those seedlings. Now those slow-growing things are on the same 
stage, right, the same, at the same start as the weeds. And your weeding is way, way easier. Much, much easier. It really is a very effective way to weed carrots less. Carrots can take them. We didn't do that out there this year. And I, I remember Jerry saying, we've got a stale bed next year. Because you know? we spent a lot of time weeding those carrots. Mm -hmm. you know? They take a lot of time. So try stale bedding. I highly recommend it. Do not use your flamer next to your plastic. Remember I told you that. <laughs> plastic burns really well and is toxic. Okay, let's look at this now. All right, so we covered heating, winter production. We got started there. I don't think I've got to do this one. Okay. So everybody got the, like, why you can do this right is the hoop house slows down how fast stuff freezes, and then the row cover even more slows it down, right? If you don't use that row cover on really cold nights, you'll start to see some bad effects. It's not that fast. I mean, you know, you, you'll be lucky. It won't be as bad as you think, but the more you slip up and miss that row cover, the more you're going to see damage. You know? It's not like everything's going to die the first time. The greenhouse itself is going to give a lot of protection. But if you really want it to work, Use the row cover too, you know. And don't, you know, be like 11 o'clock, forgot the row cover, oh, it's too late. No, it's not. Get out there and do it, you know. Just, it's never too late. Go out there and put the cover over it if you forgot it, you know. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make a difference, okay? Um, all right, I just covered all those guys pretty thoroughly. I didn't need this handout, do I? Um, okay, the miscellaneous highly productive ones, and I stuck celery in there because I always forget to talk about celery when I'm talking about, I don't even talk about the, great, I, I, I do need the handout. I forgot to talk about the carrot family, right? So carrot family, I always forget to mention celery, and let's, yet it's my favorite winter vegetable. It's, I mean, it, the difference between celery grown, it's not my favorite winter vegetable, I take that back, but the difference between celery grown in the winter in the greenhouse and celery grown outside is massive. It's incredible. You almost always get some overly strong flavors outside. It's almost always a little bit tougher than the stuff in the stores, right? You grow it in the winter in a greenhouse, and I've actually been able to sell it for 75 cents a stalk. Wow. And I've had people take a sample taste, come and buy a stalk, and then come back and buy another one. You know? And they, I didn't have enough plants. They wanted to buy a bunch. It's like, I can't do that. You know? I'm just taking stalks off and letting it regrow. Because I just stuck a few plants in the greenhouse the first time. But I, I'm sentimental. I couldn't trash these plants. I had four <laughs> plants that I need, more than I needed. So I stuck them in pots and never got around to planting them. It's like September, I planted my first stuff in the greenhouse. I'm like, oh, stick them in and see what they do. By Thanksgiving, spectacular. Way too good for stuffing. I mean, literally, you know how long it takes the average person to eat a stalk of celery? I just give people a stalk, and a moment later, I look back and it's gone. So you got more? And they all say, what's the variety? What's the variety? It's like, I don't think it's the variety. You know, I do have a favorite variety, I'll tell you, but I think it's the conditions. It's that cold weather, no stress. Celery doesn't like that heat stress. You know? right. Really spectacular. Really low fiber, too. Like, that's why they eat it so fast. And the variety I love most is Ventura. But Tango is what you can get from Johnny's, and I think Fedco, and it works well enough. But to me, Ventura is the best adapted celery for this area. Know that if you're starting celery plants and you want to start plants, you want to start them about eight to ten weeks out. They're very slow to start. So that's something you're talking about July then probably? Yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. Um, and I forgot to do it this year. I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and now to plant out like the solstice. Would you dig one up now and move it? I I would, sure, they're still gonna die outside eventually. They're kinda of hardy, the cover will last a while, but you know, they will die. Yeah. So I dig it up, I take as big a root as you can, you know. I'll stick it in there, I bet you yeah. like it, you know. Yeah. And then, of course, let it go to seed. Be a spectacular, beneficial insect plant. Use flowers in the springtime. Mm -hmm. And nothing else around you can probably save your own seed. You know? wow. So it's a pretty, pretty amazing plant. It's real prone to disease, even in the greenhouse. You know? Don't eat it. If it's diseased, don't eat it. People have been known to get sick working in fields of diseased celery just working in. Wow. They make some powerful toxins to fight off the disease. Wow. It's not the disease, it's the plant's response. Okay, so I did mention carrots, kind of. This time of year, right now, I would probably plant the fast carrots. You know, I would not plant my two favorite big carrots, slow ones, are Bolero and Sugar Snacks. Both of those I like them probably because they're resistant to Cercospora and Altenaria, two diseases that really ruin the flavor of carrots and damage the foliage. 
that's not really much of a problem in cold weather anyways, but I just like, I've got, that's what I have. That's what I grew up for the long season ones. I put those in in September and they'll work fine. By now, they're not going to be big enough before they start to bolt because of the impact of solstice, okay? But you can replant again in early January and they will finish out before it gets too hot. So you can do it again, but not right now. Otherwise, things like Yaya, what a name, um, Nelson, and Mocha are all ones that are readily available and fast. You know, um, Carrots in the greenhouse, any carrots grown in cold weather. I should have pulled one up for us to try, actually. Um, maybe I'll go out and get one. Really, they just get sweeter and better. You know, Even ones that you grew in the summer that tasted terrible, you let them get a bunch of deep cold, and all of a sudden they start tasting quite good. Um, okay, so that's carrots. Um, you can also grow parsnips in the greenhouse. I wouldn't bother. I think they do fine outside. The trick to parsnips is letting you get plenty of cold before you eat. Um, but, well, the reason we grow a couple of parsnips in the greenhouse is to let them go to seed. Because when they go to seed, they make huge flowers that bring in tons of beneficial insects. And then they'll reseed themselves all the time. We actually have a little patch in the back of that number two greenhouse. And they do that every year. And they're just like our major insectary that time of year. Okay. Um, Mosh, miner's lettuce, and, and I don't know if I spelled Minuta right. It's in the Johnny's catalog. Somebody can look out for me. Um, somebody, anybody interested in looking up Minuta? Um, salad green? Just look at the, the odd greens that will be in there. I probably spelled it wrong. Now that I think about it, I thought I had it when I wrote it down right. Anyways, Minutia, I think it is actually, anyways, is a cultivar of plantain, the common weed that is good for bee stings and all that. Doesn't look at all like it. It's, it and it's kind of crispy in texture. It's really a fun green. I recommend it. It doesn't lend itself well to cut and come again. The quality goes down really fast. So it's more about maybe cut it once and then harvest it one more time after that, but then have a succession coming out. But it does really well in the cool weather and it's very productive. Okay. It's about yay big, really neat, toothed looking leaves that are crunchy in texture and add nice loft to a salad. So I recommend it highly. And of course, it's nothing we usually eat, so that's very good, you know. Thank you. You're looking for Mizuna? No, no, Minuta. Minuta. yeah. It's, it's an unusual green. Yeah, Mizuna I got. Yeah. See if you can find it. If you can't, don't, don't sweat it. All right. I'll still pass you. All right. Um, anyway, um, Mosh, y'all got the taste, right? I told you that it's, you know, one of the hardiest greens you can possibly grow. All right, it self-seeds readily, so it'll come back easily. Um, and it also keeps its flavor even when it's going to seed. It's, the texture's buttery, it's a wonderful green. If you're looking to grow large volumes of greens, it's not your plan, you know? It doesn't get big. But it sure is tough and bears like crazy, okay? Um, and we'll, we'll do just as well outside, though it won't grow as much because colder, it's not gonna grow as fast. But you can sow it outside, it'll be the last thing to go down, it never goes down. In the cold. Miner's lettuce, almost that. It's almost true, but it needs a tiny bit of protection. A little bit of row cover or something, it would boom through the winter outside. In a greenhouse, if you're not careful, it'll take over. It did that at the Highland Lake Inway. It was like, the chefs were like, what else can we do with this stuff, Pat? That's all you got. So, you know, I made the mistake of taking my, um, the, the matriarch of the family, Tresca Lindsay's direction seriously and not pulling any of it. And it all went to seed. Just was the worst weed you ever had. Tons of it. It's in the same family as purslane, so it's probably high in omega-3 fatty acids. It's really got a wonderful texture, a mild flavor, and does not go to, to get bitter when it boils. So it's very productive. In, the, in a greenhouse, it wouldn't need any other cover. You know, Outdoors, you might want to put a, a bro cover over it. But in a greenhouse, that's all it would need. I saw a plant survive outdoors with no protection just because it was under the deck of the loading dock at the Highland Lake Inn. You know, well, that was enough protection. So it's pretty darn productive. It's called miner's lettuce because it's the green that the 49ers fed on when they went to California chasing gold. Uh, and then, I guess that's it for those. Those are the unusual kind of odd ones that you can grow besides the families we just covered. Okay. Um, no, as it gets colder and the days get shorter, um, that's not a very good sentence. But anyways, as the days get shorter, the production is going gonna, is gonna to slow down. It's not going to drop, but it's going to slow down. And of course, the nitrogens, are, nitrates gonna, are going to store in there. So you want to be careful to pick on a, a, a sunny day at the end of a sunny day. But 
basically just allow for it. But, you know, you'll, you won't be able to do it the first year, but over time, you'll figure out how much more you have to seed ahead to have the same crop coming in because it's growing slow. You know, I'll put, you know, I'll, I'll do one planting in early September and it'll get me a lot of production for a long time. I might do three or four plantings in mid-October to mid-November for the same amount of production. You know, it's just I'm going to need more plants to get the same amount of food. Um, and that, by the way, is a tactic. Let's say you go home, you've got a bed, tomorrow you go out and buy the materials and you get gangbusters on it and you have yourself a greenhouse by tomorrow night, right? You're going to plant it right away, but you don't have any plants, so you got to direct seed everything. If you're direct seeding, and this will show up later on, I think I put it in there. Direct seeding things like kale and collards, be one every foot at the most, right? Or 10 inches, right? So you might seed a clump, and make two or three seeds every 10 inches per foot. Don't do that. Go ahead and broadcast it down there. Let it come up thick, right? And then just harvest all the stuff in between until you have one space where you want it. The first ones in space, right, are the one at that 10 inches that you're going to let stay. And the first things you harvest are the ones around it, so it's got the advantage and starts getting bigger. And then keep harvesting away from it so that what you're picking is not impacting the rapid growth of the, the one that you're going to keep. You know? But it's a way to maximize your space. It's a greenhouse, right? You want to get as much stuff growing in there as you can. I talked about mulching in between things. If I had a small greenhouse, I'd just be putting another succession of plants in between things. You know? I'd be pushing that. You know? And I would make sure I always grew my cover crops and did everything else I could to build fertility so it could support that level of production. You want to put the most effort into that greenhouse space because it's, it's your most expensive space and it has the potential to give you the most production by a long shot. Okay? All right. So let's see here. Got that. And I already explained the whole process of vernalization, how things can go to seed, right? Um, Am I going anywhere here? Yeah. Okay. I'm going the wrong way. Okay, that's what it is. I wish I could use an arrow. Why can't I use an arrow? You can. You just have to be. Use the mouse to grab the bar on the right. Just pull it down. Oh, okay. It helps look at the computer. You can't. Oh, right. Pull the bar over there. Yeah. All right. Down. This, my folks, my friends, rather, is my greatest weakness. I am no good at this stuff. Okay, you just click on the button. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay, onion family, I gotta spend a little bit more time on that. Not much, though. I covered that pretty well. All right, and I already gave, gave you the idea, right, that you may not, even though you could start planting stuff for winter production, or late fall production earlier, you may not because you're still pushing your tomatoes and your peppers and you got stuff in the garden that's going to be fine until the middle of November. So you've got to look and, you know, and learn where to take the one out and put the next one in. And you could play with it. You might decide, I'm going to keep every, thir every you know, third pepper or tomato, pull out the rest and plant fall crops in between. You know? So I still get some peppers and tomatoes, but I'm, I'm giving in to the reality that fall is here and I want to have fall production. Yeah. So you just decide, you know, you play with it, and decide how to get the maximum value for what you want from your greenhouse. Um, you know, for, we're, we're fortunate that we have a lot of greenhouse space, so we don't have to make those decisions. We can just pick a bed and say it's going to be for the next crop. But you probably will have to do that. You probably won't have unlimited greenhouse space. Um, all right, so I didn't mention onions, and that's one of those ones that does well this time of year. The things that the onions I would grow in a greenhouse would be green onions, and my favorite by far is evergreen hardy bunching because I can let it go and it'll, and it'll give you a fine green onion. You can just grow it straight as a green onion, you know, and pull every last one and it'll work fine. But if you choose to leave some, then you have a perennial crop, right? Um, chives, they'll go even. You know, chives are one of our longest bearing food crops. I mean, they won't go down until hard frost. And you'll see them coming back up with the first thaw in February. You know? So they really give you tons of production. You're going to add a few weeks on either end in a greenhouse. So that just means even more chives. Yeah. 
Uh, it's a great way to have onions with virtually no work at all. The one downside of chives is they can get an aphid, and they can be a vector for an aphid that's specific to onions that can drive you nuts. Oh. If you see a black aphid on chives, I would actually recommend digging out that bunch of chives and getting rid of it. Wow. You know, those aphids are really hard to control. The one way to control them that I found that absolutely works is to cover the infected area with row cover and order pre-fed lacewing larvae. <laughs> now, why are they pre-fed? Because they'll eat each other if they're not. But they're that voracious, right? The problem is most predators don't like to eat those aphids, I assume because of the high sulfur in the onion. Oh. You know? So nothing much will eat them, and they just, they boom. You know, aphids are easy to control because everybody in the world likes to eat them, but not these guys. Uh. I've gotten control using ladybugs and putting row covers so they had to stay in there, they had no choice. Yeah. That's called in training. You make something learn to eat something. You know? I mean, you may not like liver or Brussels sprouts, but if you were starving to death, you would eventually eat liver or Brussels sprouts because right. you had to. So that can work too. You have a question? If you do the, the row cover, how long do you uh, leave it closed? I left it on for, I think, about a week. You know? And then I just looked under there and I didn't see lots of aphids and I carefully opened it up and they were gone. And the ladybugs were reproducing in there. They were larvae, you know. It was like, you know, it did it, you know, it worked. Um, but the pre-fred lacewing larvae don't even need the cover. You, know, you just put them down. They don't care. They don't care what they taste like. They're hungry, you know. They're going to eat them. So, yeah. Now, you mentioned earlier, this may be very basic, but you mentioned earlier that you wouldn't want to eat, uh, was it celery, that becomes very toxic if it's got a disease? Yeah. Because of what plant's doing. Is there anything else that we need to be concerned you know, about? I would have recommend not eating disease plants. Cucurbits. If they taste bitter, done. Yeah. You know, they're making things that are not good for you. Right. You know? But I mean, I say I recommend not eating disease plants, but of course I pick broccoli and there's always altinaria on the leaves, you know? So but I guess it depend on how disease looking something is. If something really doesn't look healthy, it's probably not good for you. you know? I'd stay away from it, you know. But cucurbits and celery are the two that I know. You know, and the cucurbits, I think that, from my understanding, when they taste bitter, you know that there's things in there you don't want to eat. You know, so stay away from it. Um, and then celery. You know. That actually was in an article by a guy named Bruce Ames, who was using celery as a reason why you shouldn't worry about pesticides because plants were toxic too. Uh -huh. <laughs> cool. This is back in the uh, early 80s or something. But I still remember that person. I never heard that, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, celery is a swamp plant, so it's got a lot of ability to take tough conditions, and yet it also, to me, is one of the easiest ones to get disease. It's really prone to get after yellows. After yellows is a, is a virus type disease. If you see contorted looking celery, like the leaves are contorting and stuff, we don't want to eat it, it's disease, and the disease is mm -hmm. aster yellows, and that is, it's out there in our goldenrod here. And so I'm torn, should I wipe out the goldenrod? I'm not going to do it, I love the goldenrod for its beneficial insect stuff, yeah. but I'm probably always going to struggle some with aster yellows because of that. Aster yellows, I could never avoid it, and it got on my lettuce even, it was everywhere, if I tried to grow the cultivar aster, asters. The wild aster, for some reason, no problem. But if I grew cultivars in the aster family, but not kind of specifically asters, right? Yeah. All those fancy China asters and stuff, I always got aster yellows. Yeah, and I don't grow them. And so, ever. I don't know about, about toxins, but I know about disease, it gets it real easy and you don't want to eat them. On the other hand, it's way worth it. If you get a great celery, it's really, you know, even the summer celery, it's, it's, it's so much more flavor than the ones in the store. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, let's see. All right, in the winter, pests really aren't a minor problem. I talked about the vegetable people, right? What I didn't say is what we do to, to stop it. We spray any crop that we think we can easily clean off the surround. We say spray surround. Now, surround makes it hard. Does everybody know what surround is? Yeah. Okay. Surround is super fine kaolinite clay, and it is sprayed on with water. And in the summer, we'll get to that in a couple of Time is playing. In the summer, um, it's great because it's white, it reflects heat, it cools the plant. Even though there's a barrier around the leaf, it's causing the plant to be cooler and therefore it doesn't shut down in the heat of the day and it photosynthesizes the water. So it's a really, you know, I use it to relieve heat stress. 
Yeah. That's not what it was labeled for, but it works great. I really love it. If you're in a hot place, you'll love cilantro. You know? I've actually sprayed it on the inside of the greenhouse. You know, the outside would just wash right off. You know, if you aren't into organic, you can buy something that is brilliantly designed to coat the outside of your greenhouse with white and then with the first frost, wash off. But it's not allowed in organic, so you can't use it. But you can use surround on the inside. Just remember to go in there and wash it off once the light's starting to get dimmer. You know? But it'll help to cool things off. That's not what it's meant for. What it's meant for is to block the spiracles, right? The breathing holes of insects. So it gets on the leaves, and then when they go through it, it rubs off on them, and then they can't breathe, and they don't want to be there, and they go away. So it can really reduce insect pressure. They are way less prone to get out of there if they were there first. You know, they just kind of they don't they don't want to let go. They know a good thing. They want to leave. But if you put it there, they're not nearly as prone to to try and come in and get established. So. I'd recommend it for any number of insect problems, including um, including vegetable weevil. It can reduce the damage. On the other hand, I'm probably not going to spray it on my spinach because I'm not going to be able to wash it off very well. Now, the good news is you can eat it. It says so in the bag, and I believe it. It is just clay, and clay will not hurt you. In fact, some people eat some clay it's just to you know, help carry toxins out of their body. So you can eat it, but it may not be appetizing if there's very much on there. So I wouldn't use it on things like spinach, and the weevil will attack spinach. So what we do instead is early on, we hit them hard with neem and spinosad, and that seems to give us control. But I really think that ultimately what we need to do is either find a nematode that can attack them in the stage in the ground, or do a once every few years shallow tillage in the late summer and kill those eggs. And then knock them back. Because they've gotten to be a problem. And when I give no tail talks, I talk about how, you know, everything you do can improve things in some ways, but it's going to create new problems. You know? There's like something to fill every niche. So if we stop tilling, cutworms are more of a problem for when you don't till too. Because oh, yeah. they like grass. You know? So you're going to have more cutworms than you'd ever have otherwise. By the way, they can be in the greenhouse. The easiest solution for cutworms, Bacillus thuringiensis, everybody know BT? Yeah, BT. It's not labeled. For some reason, they don't label it for cutworms. I don't know why. But it totally works. I mean, it's, they're in the Lepidoptera family, the butterfly moth family, and they take one bite, and their darling little stomachs get paralyzed, and they're done. You know? And they don't manage to kill a plant with one bite. You know? So it's the solution that I, I used to know how to like, dig around and find a cutworm you know, and kill it. And now I've gotten terrible with that. Whenever I try, I don't manage to find it. I don't know if I don't have the patience or what. But it doesn't matter, because I just spray the BT, and it solves the problem. You know? So. I forgot to mention cutworms on there, but they are a problem. Not in the fall, they're a spring problem. A spring, early summer problem, by and large. Yeah. What's the plant symptom of that? Oh, a cutworm? Mm -hmm. It looks like somebody was clear cutting your crops. Oh, you yeah. see that? down below. Chop it off of the ground. Chopped off of the ground. Yeah, it's pretty heartbreaking, you know? Peppers, you know how expensive pepper seed could be? They yeah. love peppers, boy, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just chop them all down, you know? Um, but also, it could be a, a mouse. I mean, they can, they'll attack a plant too, you know? Yeah. Um, can't guarantee that it's a cutworm, but it's likely if they're chopped off like that. It's very likely that it's cutworms. You know? Okay, so BT for that. BT also, if you need it, though, you probably don't if you're doing farmscaping for the, the, the lingering cabbage moths, cabbage um, worms, which they're going to be gone sometime in December or something, but they could still be out there doing some damage now. You know? Um, and if you really have a lot and you can't control them, then BT will do it. But when we get to see the slides, we're going to fly through the slides, the slides by the way, because there's not a lot of time to do this otherwise. Um, you'll see that there's, there are wasps, the conid wasps, that parasitize those guys. And if you allow them to establish, they'll give you the control you need almost always. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then aphids, I, I haven't really talked about aphids much. Farmscape. Farmscape, farmscape, farmscape. Um, so we have several videos about that. If you, you know, I'm not going to go into great detail here. It will give you your solution. I have learned to think of, of aphids as one of my beneficial insects because they're the meat source for all of my predators. Uh -huh. you know? I enjoy a nice little bloom of aphids in the springtime because it's not long after I see them that I see Braconid wasp, I see serpent fly, I see ladybugs, I see all their larvae, and I know that those populations are booming and as we open up the greenhouse, they're flying out, and I'm getting an early start in control. In the, in the dead of winter, they can be a minor problem, 
Soap will work. Oftentimes, just spraying them hard with water, or like I said, having some ladybugs waiting to release for the warm days. You can get control. If there's going to be an extended period of warm weather, <coughs> ignore my relaxed approach to them right now and hit them pretty hard, because you're probably not going to get the controls going. But coney wasps will get going in about 10 days or something, and they'll start to hit them really hard and get control. But you might get a lot of damage in a hurry. So you know, a couple of days of warm weather. Just take some water, wash them off, you're fine. But if it's like you know a really warm week and you already have an aphid problem, then they're going to explode oh. in that time period if you don't have ladybugs or something. Then you probably want to go to soap. Soap will take them right down though. You know, and it's all about keeping their levels controlled. You're never going to kill them all, but just know that their reproductive strategy is such that they've been photographed giving live birth to aphids giving live birth. And these aphids. If they like where they are, they don't take any time for sex. Oh. Right? It's immaculate conception. Right? <laughs> Parthenogenesis, right? They're not wasting their time on, on sex. Right? <laughs> They're just reproducing as fast as they can. They can go from zero to a few hundred thousand like just that. Just like that, yeah. yeah. So it's about, by and large, natural controls, but then being ready, once in a while you need to take out that big gun and fire away for a few minutes. You know? But not very long, and then you can go back to natural controls. Okay. Um, that's what I can think of for pests. I hope I'm not forgetting any, but really, I love winter production because they're so few pests. It's one of the great joys of it. What about mealy bugs? Mm. Mealy bugs, I have them in the house. Have you had them in the greenhouse? Yeah, I got them in the greenhouse. Then I'd say it's beneficial. I'd say you want to go to farm saving green time. You know, I would. Um, I think so. I think, you can, I think if you go online, you can find specific predators to them. Soap will help, but as you know, if you don't get every last one, they're back in no time. Right. You know? So you really, all these really intractable, small little pests, the most effective way by far, unless you want to go out there and use a big gun, and just thought of something you might be able to use that way, big gun wise. But it's way more dynamic to find a predator. Because its job, its livelihood is to eat these guys, you know, and you get balance. You never get rid of them, but you get control. You know? And so finding the right predator so, is the way to go. And I just look up natural controls for mealy bugs and see what's out there. You know? I've just never had a problem, probably because I've been farmscaping for 25 years. You know? So I forget the problems I had back then. You know? <laughs> the farmscaping does most of it. I won't say it does everything, but it does the huge proportion of it. You know? In fact, Marsha, who works with us, came from a conventional background. And the first year he learned composting, he couldn't believe it. He kept not believing it would work. And he just like, he was so sold on it that he's in a video where we all agree he's a better proponent of, of compost tea than anything we ever saw. He totally got it, right? The next year he was ready to expand. He said, I should be spraying for bugs. What should I spray for? I said, well, let's go take a look. And I walked him through the greenhouse and I walked him through the garden and it's like, I looked at, you know, a few cucumber beetles. You know, the last two years, that was a different story because of the polar vortex. But really, they were pretty much controlled. You know, occasional aphid here and there. A few bugs here and there, really no problem. And I finally said, you know, I don't think we need anything right now. And he said, that's insane. <laughs> that's insane. That's crazy, man. I don't have to spray anything for bugs. I don't believe it. You know, because he'd been, once you start spraying those big guns, you have to continue. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, you have no choice because there's nothing there. What's the first thing to come back? It's the, it's the herbivores. You know, you're not going to get the predators until you have enough herbivores to bring them in. You know, but for you, mealy bugs, if they're driving you nuts, do a drench with me. Oh, okay. you know? It's a systemic, and that's going to take, because your problem is you can't get every last one. You can spray it with soap, but there's always some that still makes it. You know? And that should do it for you, I think. But then still look for the biological control. And know that as you follow the principles of farm scaping, you no longer need to do the specifics. You, know? you don't need the one plant, because you have so much diversity that you get that control. Anyways. OK? Yeah. Could you please briefly repeat the name of the person's formula for compost tea you talked about earlier? Oh, it's not a formula. It's a package. Oh, it's a package. Okay. They send you the package. And okay. it's pricey, by the way. So it'll cost you like 60 bucks for to do like 120 gallons. But you can do okay. five-gallon batches okay. and get a lot of applications that way. Okay. You know? And it's Charlie Clark. Charlie Clark. Yep. We should actually find his number and put it on the resource page. But mm -hmm. if you Google Charlie Clark compost, compost tea, tea, you'll get him. You know? Thank you. Um, okay, so I think that pretty much takes care of bugs. Um, and then, like I said, what we use by the, is farmscaping by and large. That's our number one go-to control, right? Um, BT for like cutworms and the lingering few cabbage worms, right? 
and then Spinoza and Neem for like those tough winter ones that we have to deal with. I mean, I'm sure that Neem would deal with the aphids too, by the way. It's just an awful, it's expensive stuff to have to use on such an easy problem, you know. But for, for vegetable weevil, we actually had to use Neem and Spinoza to get a grip. But then we did get a grip. You know, I think it took two applications, it gave us control. I'm actually better about, feel better about using that in the winter because there's very few beneficials out there to, to yeah. be impacting. Yeah. So I don't mind doing it as much. And we always use, when we use a spray, we always use a spreader sticker. We use Thermex 70. It's a yucca-based spreader sticker. And that just assures that it stays on there longer. It doesn't break down in the UV light. The thing about organic sprays is they don't last very long. Right. That's a really good thing, but it's not a good thing when you're trying to get control. Yeah. It lasts a little longer. It's a good thing to get it to last a little longer. Yeah. Thermex 70. And Seven Springs carries it. It's pricey, it's like 35 bucks for a quart, but you're using like a quarter teaspoon per gallon. So it goes pretty far. You, know, you get a lot of use out of it. You want to be sure to apply it last if you're mixing, because it foams like crazy. You know. But it does a good job, and by the way, it also does other good things for the plant. It has polysaccharides that are good for the health of the plant. You know, they take in foliar-wise. I always try to spray, by the way, in the cool of the evening and the cool of the morning. Right? You want to be below 70 if you can, or 72 at least, so the stomata on the plants are open, because I never spray without also doing foliar feed. Even in the winter, a very light foliar feed is not going to be too much nitrogen, not going to hurt, and it's just, if I'm doing the work of spraying, why not do a little feed too? You know? But I would use probably one-third as much fish, and I wouldn't do it if it was going to be cloudy. If I had some sunny days coming up and I was spraying anyways, I'd use a little bit, a little bit of fish seaweed just to give it a little boost. It just helps out. Um, and in the summertime, I spray for vine borer, which we use in a greenhouse, so you need to know this, right? You control vine borer, spray twice a week at the base of the plant with soap and BT. Now, when I do that, I'm using a, a sprayer that does misting, so it's getting up and hitting all the bottoms of the leaves. I do it in the morning, so I'm doing fish and seaweed, too. I have squash plants that are, you know, huge and incredibly productive. And meanwhile, the soap that's in there, that's landing on the babies of the squash bug, those little white ghosts. And it hurts the adults a little bit, but it wipes out those babies. Yeah. So I end up getting control for both. And by using that fish seaweed, I'm getting a big jump in production too. So I recommend, you know, if you have to spray, I try to spray as little as possible. I hate spray. Yeah. I'm very happy that Marshall's more comfortable with it. Um, okay, so let's see, that's it for that. Focus on succession planting and cotton. I don't know if that's what I've seen. Um, cut and come again. That's my voice to text. Cut and come again. Um, cut and come again production. You, you all know about cut and come again? Okay. Now, cut and come again is things like lettuce. Spinach, tatsoi, mizuno, all those salad plants, right? All of them really bloom if you just grab them up in a bunch, right? And cut them, leaving about an inch, inch and a half or so. You want to be sure that their center, that growing center, hasn't been cut. They may recover from that, but it might, they might not. And if you just cut them to that point, it's incredible how quickly with that whole root system, they're going to just put out a whole lot more growth. You know? And so what I like to do is grow them close enough together that by cutting one, I'm releasing the next one. You know? And in no time, it's filled the space. And then when I come in and cut that one, I re-release the other one. You know? And that can give you incredible production. Tango lettuce, um, for years, they published it, but then they weren't getting the same results, and I know why. I assume that's why they took it out. But I gave a, I complained to them that they still weren't giving tango its due. They were carrying it, but they weren't saying how good it was. Tango lettuce that I had planted in October and didn't harvest until February, so to establish a deep root system, I was able to cut it once a week and take it to market. I got regrowth within a week that time of year. That's how, how fast and productive it was. Now, actually, I cut the whole patch. I didn't have a lot of greens. I really relied on that, that tangle, and it produced like crazy. You know? So you, you do it right, you can get tons of production. Yeah. Can I ask for clarification on that, because I'm not familiar with what you're talking about? That middle stem, are you saying you leave that and then cut all it's the way around? It's not a stem. It? Or not no, stem, no, but that it's middle. It's a growing center, like on the rosettes of things, you know. Like most, most of these kind of plants, these leafy plants, mm -hmm. if you look at them, 
there's a center. Eventually it becomes a tip and it goes to seed. Mm -hmm. But when they're rosettes, it's just kind of a center. Okay. And that's where all the leaves are coming out. That's where the growth is coming from, right? So, so you're so saying you're leaving that part. Leave that, right. So it's really easy because you just grab the whole plant up, right? And you're holding it. Mm -hmm. And then you just cut above that center. And you have all the stuff that you're holding. You throw in your bowl okay. and you're leaving that little center. Okay. You know? And so it's pretty darn easy to do. If you just take the outer leaves, the message to the plant is you're dying. Go to seed. Yeah. You know? okay. Right. Whereas if you cut it back, it's like, oh, i got to start all over again. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's got the root system, so it will start all over again. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. I yeah. got it now. Yeah. Is that the same with collards? Collards? No. I think you're going to do better off to, you know, I'd say the reason to cut the whole thing, and it probably with a good plant and the right varieties, you'll get regrowth, um, would be time. If you're trying to harvest and make a living, being able to cut those times, and also they'll keep better you know, on a thing like that. That's a nice package to sell. If you're going to market, and you cut the stem, it's not nearly as likely to wilt as the individual leaves are. You know? But for production, I'd say with that one, taking the outer leaves is going to be, the bigger outer leaves is going to be your best production. Yeah. You know? Because it's, it's going to go to seed based on day length and the size of its whole plant. It's not going to go to seed just because it's more like the lettuce family and stuff. It's going to go to seed from taking those outer leaves. You know? um, but I know people that cut it off and they get regrowth. You know? It can work. It's, I would like, you know, probably Google that and look for varieties that most lend themselves to that kind of thing. And they'll say it. I've seen it in catalogs, you know, you know real good for, for topping out or something like that. You know. um, okay, so let's see. And then um, successions. Do people have kind of the idea? What I, have I given you enough of an idea about that? I mean, you really, the ones you like the most that are the cut and come again type, you're going to ace it if you really aren't top of your successions there. Um, and it might be that, you know, um, you have some point like broccoli or kohlrabi in there that, when you're, that are going to be done at some point. They're going to be gone, right? Coming in and sowing successions or planting successions in amongst them, the successions are going to be kind of slow at first, but then as you take those out, they're just going to take off. You know? So it's a way to get maximum use out of that space. I'm presuming that most of you are not going to have as many greenhouses as we have. So you need strategies to really make sure you get the most use out of this incredibly valuable space. Um, any questions there? No. All right. Um, yeah, and I talked about sowing the, the kale and stuff close together. Um, and then as we shift from winter to spring, right? Um, this is a time when you can really do that kind of tweaking I just talked about, right? And that is, you had a heated table, and you started, when I first got to, New, to North Carolina, right? It was a gorgeous January day, and I couldn't wait to get gardening, and I started tomatoes. Mistake. <laughs> you know, I had to pot them up so big by the time it was warm enough to put them out, you know? But literally, if you have a greenhouse, you might strategize to start them sometime in February, right? Graft them, right? Sometime towards the end of February. Step them up into a four-inch pot, so you're putting a grafted big plant into your greenhouse in mid-April, because you're going to do the heroics, right? You use wall of waters. Do people know what wall of waters are? Anybody not know? Wall of waters, you can get them at um, garden stores. I think even Walmart carries them. They're basically a cone of tubes. You fill the tubes with water, and a plant will not freeze down to 17 degrees in there. So you can put things like tomatoes and squash out way early. Now, I wouldn't do peppers and eggplant, because though they won't freeze, they'll get cold enough, they'll be stunted. Right. But you could plant out things like tomatoes and squash in March, right? And have them, you're going to take up a fairly big footprint with that wall of water, though. So you might try some other heroic way, many layers to keep them from, get, from freezing. But if you put that big grafted plant in in March, you're going to be picking tomatoes in May. And they're going to go until November. You have them on a string, you'll be able to lower them. You'll be picking them from May to the middle of November, probably before they freeze out. You'll get a lot of tomatoes, a lot of cucumbers that way. Yeah. Well, okay, you're growing seedling tomatoes, and then you're grafting what to what? You're grafting, you buy, right, a tomato oh. rootstock that's way more vigorous and disease resistant. You don't grow your own? Well, you buy, you buy the seed, you buy your own. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you, you would, you'd buy, you want to be planted at exactly the same time to be able to graft. You know? and, I intend to be an expert at graphing next year. <laughs> I'm a baby. I'm neophyte. I'm just Basic learning. Basic idea. Yeah. 
You can also buy graphic plans. They're kind of pricey, yeah, but, yeah. but you can learn to do it. You know, and pretty soon we're going to have Tom and Morris video up. Yeah. Yeah. So he gave a he gave a little demonstration on it, um, and I can I did it. My success rate was poor, you know, but I, I was a little behind. My clips were barely holding on. And you, you have to catch them at the perfect size. And I'd go to Johnny's and buy the right equipment. Okay, you can spend a little more, but you get a knife to make sure you get the cut perfect every time. Um, and that makes it a lot easier. Anyways, but the strategy is investing in the number of plants. Since you're not going to grow up tons of plants probably, right? Investing in the best plants that are as far along as they can be is going to give you way more production. And meanwhile, you're planting right into where you had lettuce and stuff. The lettuce is still growing all around it. You only harvest as you think it's impacting your next crop because now you're favoring the summer crops, right? You're letting the winter crops still give you all they can but they are now, you know, the, uh, the grown kids that should have left the house. You know, they're still in the basement, you know, but, and you're going to feed them, but maybe you're not going to, like, you know, pay for their car. <laughs> That's kind of where it's at, folks, you know. Um, okay, so you have that kind of, and really, that's an example. If you want to just think about how to maximize that shift, it's a key time, and if you're not like us, you only have one greenhouse, so you want to figure out, how to keep as many of those winter things going while moving your summer stuff along. You know? And you may decide, I don't want to do that heroics. Then you're not going to plant your tomatoes out until the middle of April. You may still grow grafted tomatoes. You may still make them big. But you may just change the schedule. That's all. And that's really going to be how much you, you know, how involved you're in. Maybe the first year you're going to be way involved. And maybe the second year you're going to mean to be way involved and find out, gee, I wasn't. The, the, the boom is off, and maybe I'm just going to be more realistic about that. And then you may move, move to a more realistic cycle. You know. On the other hand, you may ace it every year and just be you know, rolling in tomatoes, rolling in um, squash, and then likewise, you can do the same kind of things. You know, there you can't. I, nobody's much doing it, but they can apparently graft squash too, and they are grafting eggplant and peppers. I don't know much about that though. What I know about is tomatoes, but. You can definitely step them up into bigger packs and be putting bigger plants out there. And I would say for a greenhouse, that is way worth it. We have not done that, by the way. But this year, as I looked at our production and thought, if I made bigger plants, we can, we can improve this production by probably 25, 15 to 25 percent. And that's going to be impressive. You had a question? Um, I'm missing something here. Why would you want to graft a tomato? You're grafting a tomato because there are rootstocks that make lousy tasting fruit that are much, much more vigorous and right. disease resistant. So you get a much more productive... So you would grow, let's say you're going to grow from seed, you would grow the crummy tomato and the good tomato, and then, and then you would put you the good tomato... The, you cut the off the crummy. top of the, it's called maxi port is the main one you buy. That's, uh -huh. the, that's the, the, the one you graft onto. So you throw it at the top and you take something like Monero or Prudence Purple and you graft it on top of that maxi port. Uh -huh. Now you have plants that make huge leaves, tons and tons of growth, but the energy they're producing gives you good tasting tomatoes rather than their pretty unimpressive kind of cherry sized tomatoes. You know? It's not like they don't make a tomato you can't eat, it's just nothing you're going to write home about. You know? But you graft on tomatoes you love and get all that bigger. That's why you do it. Okay. Um, and there's, by the way, if you drive out here and take Schoolhouse Road to 191, you're going to drive by a whole new complex that's offering jobs at $10 an hour. That's an Israeli company that's going to be grafting vegetables for the entire East Coast vegetable industry. Wow. Grafting vegetables is about to become a huge thing. You know? It has been a huge thing in places like Israel and Japan, yeah. places with less land for a long time. But now it's time for us to start catching up. So you're going to, you get to be on the cutting edge if you figure it out. You know? um, and maybe the price, maybe they'll sell to the home market too. I have no idea. Yeah. What was the variety you said was a good use? Maxi Ford. Maxi Ford is the one. There's, a, there's like two varieties that Johnny sells. Maxi Ford's the one I know. Mm -hmm. And it's worked, it's worked well for me. I can't claim great expertise. I only got like three or four to make it. Mm -hmm. you know? But I wasn't paying a lot of attention. I'm going to pay a lot of attention now and get my skills down. Okay. So for eggplant and um, peppers, because they stunt at temperatures, starting at 53 degrees and lower, I don't tend to put them into the greenhouse until the middle of April. By then, using row cover, I can pretty much keep them above that temperature and they won't stun. Um, and so that's, that's our schedule here. Middle of April for them, 
But as early as we can get the tomatoes and squash and cucumbers in, yes. When you're giving the dates, are you talking about the dates that you're sowing the seed? Or no, no, plants in the greenhouse. Okay. Yeah. Sowing the seed for, for cucurbits, go back about three and a half weeks because you're going to put them in bigger pots. We use at least, you know, are you familiar with the different sizes of cells? So like there's 72s, there's 128s. They're never in flat. Yeah, right, okay. Then there's 36s. And that's basically those big four packs, right? And there's 18s, and those are those really big ones that are kind of tall, right? And you can only fit three of them in a flat, you know, and so there's six each, so you get 18. We start them in either 36s or 18s for the cucurbits, because they grow so fast, they don't like to be stunted. Most people don't think you even grow them in a pot, right? I mean, for your, for your scale, I'd say do them in four-inch pots, you know? Because how many are you going to put out? And a four-inch pot one, you watch them. The minute you see roots at the bottom, transplant them. They don't like to be root bound. On the other hand, don't throw them away. If they are, you can still make them work. Give them a little extra nitrogen. You know? All the books will tell you they won't work, though. But if you give them a little extra nitrogen, you'll pull them out of it. You know, they won't go to seed on you. You don't give them the nitrogen, though, and they're, they're root bound, put, like making flowers when they're babies. Mm -hmm. And their production is never the same. You know? All these kind of fruiting plants, your goal is to get them in the ground before they go to flower. Now, if you've left them in the pot so long as they go to flower, you've missed a certain level of vigor. So your goal is to try and, you know, if you can't do it for some reason, it's too cold or something, step them up. And this is a trick, okay? Okay, so one year in CeeLo, I managed to get strawberries in and protect them enough that I was pick my first straw strawberry in early April, right? And then by the 15th of April, the temperature was going to 15 degrees. Now, I saved the strawberries with just row cover and plastic, just like I talked about for everything else, right? They didn't take any damage, right? But I had a bunch of seedlings that had to go in the ground, had to go in the greenhouse. Right? It was too cold. What I did was leave them on the tables, but I just took them all, and they had root, they made root balls already, right? So I got them nice and wet so the root balls slid out easily, and I just filled the bottom about uh, inch with more good brand new potting soil, because every cell pack, right, is going to kind of shrink while it's sitting there, you end up with about that much space at the top. I knew that I was going to, as soon as that cold spell was gone, I was going to plant. I wasn't going to pot these all up again. I didn't have time, money, re you know, potting soil, or space for that many plants. So I simply pulled them out, threw a little more in the bottom, let them drop down again, and gave me a week. Uh -huh. They weren't root bound, and boom. I do that with all kinds of seedlings. You know? If I'm behind schedule, you just, it's key that they're already root bound. If they're not already, they're not root bound, but they've already made a root ball. If they haven't, then you don't have to do it yet. But if you're trying to do it, the ones that have it, it's going to be a mess, and you're going to hurt them. You just wait until they come out really easily. And then get them good and wet and just pull out, like when growing things like lettuce or something, I just grab handfuls of them, pull them out, throw some soil in there, put them back in, firm them back in, and boom, they're on their way. You know? So it's a great way to buy yourself time, which for greenhouse management, you want to be able to do. Because the weather and your life are going to get in the way of perfect schedules. You know? So you need to have these ways to... Give yourself a little bit more time. The other thing to mention is that I mentioned a little bit more nitrogen. That is a solution to all stunted plants. You know, if you, because you left them in the pot too long, it doesn't always work. But my favorite example was my future growing partner. I'd given her a lot of compost. She needed it for her, her potting so her, her seedling business. And she had like eight flats of this gorgeous red butterhead. And they all, she said, I could tell the color's changing, they're losing their sheen. I missed the boat, they're too late. And I said, can I have them? She said, yeah, sure, but they're too late. They're not going to work. I took them home, and it was my first attempt at market gardening, so I used fish emulsion for my nitrogen source instead of urine, which is a home gardener, is what I would recommend, you know. If you let it sit for a month, it's no pathogens, but don't, don't violate your unspoken compact with the public. They don't want you doing that because they're afraid of cooties. Mm. Use fish if you're selling to the public. But for yourself, it's a much more sustainable solution. But, and that's what I would have done if I wasn't going to sell them. But I knew I was going to sell them. I gave them fish three times a week. And that spring, sold every one of them to the high-end restaurants in, in um, Asheville and got a good rep for it because they were gorgeous. And they would not have worked if I had not like laid the nitrogen to them. They would have definitely gone to seed. They were in the seed mode, but they have all this nitrogen and it kind of pushes them back into vegetation, vegetative growth. Mm. Obviously, you don't do that as you're going into short days. Too much nitrogen, not good. Yeah. yeah. So what's this little urine thing you're talking about? <laughs> urine is an incredibly balanced 
fertilizer, leaves the body sterile, except for possibly salmonella and a couple of tropical diseases. Even those, after they're now saying a month, I thought it was six months, of sitting, the pH changes and those diseases die too. And as somebody in a book said, you can't give yourself a disease you don't have. So if you know you're healthy, you can use it for yourself, no problem. It's a great fertilizer for the home gardener. It's really the most, it's way more sustainable than fish emulsion. So, so you're peeing in a bucket? You're peeing into any kind of container and dilute it 10 to 1 for drenching. You can also follow your feed. You do dilute it 25 to 1. And keep it for six months? No, a month is what they say, doesn't it? Okay. I will warn you that if you do that, it stinks. <laughs> very, very badly, yeah. yeah. But the stink goes away really quickly. Um, but if you know you're healthy, and you're just doing it for yourself, then you don't have to worry about that. You know? Those diseases aren't that common, and it's not a problem. It's, they're now testing it for hay fields in, in, in New England. And it's going to be part of our fertility system within the next 100 years. We have no choice. Right. It's just time to get back to the, what, the intended fertility system, which is okay. animals, plants. Right? That's how it should be. Yeah. You know? And it's inevitable. Hopefully it won't be painful, but it is inevitable. Um, anyway, if you at all are bothered by that, or you're feeding anybody that you know would be bothered by that, fish seaweed will work just as well. It just costs a lot more, you know? Okay. Okay, let's see this thing about being heroic now. Everybody knows what I mean by being heroic here, right? It just means taking more measures than most people would, be, would take to make sure things stay warm. Wall water, I described it to you. Mm -hmm. um, setups that mimic wall water. If you go to restaurants, they get their oil in these big clear buckets, kind of flimsy plastic. They'll give them to you. Um, you can never get the oil out. They're hard to use for other things. But you can fill them with water and set two of those at an angle so you're making a little um, alcove for each plant. And it'd be the, almost the same effect as a wall of water. Mm. You know? So that, that can also be done. It'll work that way. Um, okay, let's see here. Also, it can just be multiple layers. Remember I described Michael Wells and the multiple layers in the greenhouse? That'll give you the same effect too, right? Um, and then I'm just saying the same things. The bigger they are, the sooner they're going to come in. The earlier you can get them in, the sooner they're going to come in. You just decide how much work you want to do that way, you know, and start appropriately. And no, you live in the mountains, so you may decide I'm starting them in mid-February so I can put them out at, you know, towards the end of March. In most years, that would work fine, and you're going to be going, darn that, Pat, now i got to pull every plant out, put more soil in because we're getting the equivalent of the Easter freeze. It's going to be down in the teens. I can't do it, you know. So I can't guarantee the weather. One of the joys of being a gardener is you know you're a gambler, right? <laughs> I mean, you don't garden unless you're willing to gamble that your efforts are going to pay off, yeah. and sometimes they don't. This one pays off more often than not. I think it's well worth it. You know? No guarantees. Sorry. Okay. You could do like a wall of urine, right? You could do a wall of urine. Yes, you could. You, could. you might have some friends that came in and were a little bit worried. You know what? It would store more heat because it would be darker. Yeah. It would store more heat. And then, then you could take some out, get the right pollution, poke a little hole in the bottom, and get a slow drip to the plants, right? <laughs> Tea, tea drip. What do you call it? Yeah, well, that's, yeah, there, there's compost tea. PT drip. People do, do talk about PT. Tea tape. Um, yeah. Tea tape. Tea tape, yeah. right. Except it'd be PT. Right, right there you go. Um, that's hilarious. Okay, so I, as I said, you want to wait till mid April or so for peppers and eggplant because they just don't take the cold as well. Okay, also by mid-April, you can, you know, you can push this too. You can be as heroic as you want. I mean, all of this stuff can be taken way further than I've ever taken, right? You could decide, I want to put beans in the ground in late March, early April. It's going to be too cold. They're not going to do well, right? First thing you need to know, the dark-seeded beans are way more cold tolerant, okay? So varieties, the two that we like the most are Nor'easter and Vortex, okay? But you could also say... I'm going to put an extra clear tunnel over that bed so the soil warms up even more. Then I'm going to come at night, I'm going to cover it so it can't cool down. And if you want to do that much work, you can probably put your beans in as early as late March, early April. We wait till mid-April, and they come up fine. 
We pick those two pole beans I described because it's a lot better in the greenhouse to go up than up. Yeah. And we are picking beans always in early June. And those beans go well into the summer, then we'll do a row outside, they go well into the fall. We have non-stock beans. We send tons of beans to the hungry, have all the beans we need. Very, very productive. Peas, on the other hand, would not work in a greenhouse in the spring because it goes too quickly to hot yeah. and they'd stop. Um, I did peas a couple times very successfully in my garden by planting them in mid-July in Silo. Here I might wait a little bit later because it's later to frost. I'm pretty convinced I could do that in the greenhouse here too. Uh, plant them a little later yet, but not too late. I've tried playing them as late as um, late August, early September. They do not work. Mm. They flower, but they never set fruit. It's just the light's wrong and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So you've got to back it up and start earlier than that, and I haven't done it. Frankly, we're busy, busy enough with other stuff that I'm just not thinking about peas then. Mm -hmm. I'm wishing I had come fall, because the two fall pea crops I had were some of the best pea crops I ever had. Because they were growing in the cold, they never got disease. Mm -hmm. It took hard cold to kill the plant before I stopped getting production. So that's something that's worth playing with. Let me know if you get the schedule figured out before I do. Mid-July. Um, I, I do in mid-July. Mid-July works great. Yeah, one year at, at Mount Mare I did mid-July, and then it got so cold and rainy that they started fruiting in August. And then it got hot again and they wiped out. And I kind of haven't really done given much focus since then. I was so frustrated by that particular event. You know? okay. uh, but I'm glad to hear that you're doing it regularly. We're in Madison County, so we're a little elevation. Yeah, so see here I think you started a little later. Yeah. Maybe just a week, but probably a little bit, you know, because it's a little bit less hot uh, later and hopefully, you know, you never know about that though. But the, they can go a little longer down here. Yeah. Okay, so let's see here. Oh, and something I forgot to mention as I talk about what you can grow here in the summer, and so I mentioned it in passing later, right, um, is last year Rocco decided he was going to try it. We have these pillars that hold up the greenhouse, and it's really kind of hard to put much of anything in there. He bought hog wire, which is pretty rigid, expensive panels, and wired them to those pillars and planted melons and ran the melons up the wires. And I said, I said to him, because I'd grown pumpkins, on a fence and they held themselves and they didn't fall off. They didn't have to worry about them falling off. Not true with melons. He had to make little cloth slings for each one. But he got some really nice melons out of that greenhouse. Uh, and you know, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time getting good tasting melons in the mountains. Invariably, we get a hurricane right about when they're coming in and there's so much water that they just taste like water. There's yeah. no sweetness. In the greenhouse, you control the water. So we were pretty happy with them, and I wished I'd made the time. One melon grew in between the conduit that was running to the controllers, and was growing so strongly it actually bent the conduit. <laughs> we had to cut the melon out of there. Oh. Those things are powerful, you know, uh, and quite tasty. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the varieties of tomatoes that we do. We do tam i, tam -i maru, mucho. Um, I never can remember how to say that. It's just too long, too, un too un uncommon in my time. Posano is a paste. Um, Monaro is that one I talked about that looks like Cherokee purple. and is a real winner. It's probably my favorite greenhouse tomato right now. It's not quite as productive as Tommy Maro, but it's better flavored. Um, it, if you allow it to get mixed up with your Cherokee purples, you'll be disappointed. Because <laughs> your Cherokee purples won't taste very good, but if you're not thinking of it as a Cherokee purple, rather a greenhouse tomato, it's very good. It looks just like Cherokee purple. Um, and then um, Margold is the yellow pink that I think is quite a disappointment. You know, it looks great, but the flavor's not there. No. You know? um, and then Rebelski. Rebelski is one of our favorites. It's very vigorous, very productive. Um, and those are the ones, basically the main ones that we put in the greenhouse. And then Corinto cucumber, I already told you about that, right? I mean, its productivity is mind-blowing, incredible. Um, we grow in market more. It does pretty darn well in the greenhouse. The seed's a lot cheaper, but especially if you don't have much space, I'd go with Corinto. You know, I mean, the seed may be pricey, but boy, does it pay. You know, yeah. it pays in a major way. Um, on the other hand, you might want to grow some market more because it's open pollinated, and you can save seed, and it's good to do that too. I, yeah, I grow Diva in the greenhouse. It does, it does. Oh, it. My partner, the first time she tasted one, she looked around and said, "Is this legal?" Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, it is by far 
an amazing, amazing cucumber, but its productivity is not nearly as good as these. You know? yeah. So what do we do? We grow, you know, four or five diva plants, and we got diva for us, and then we grow tons of corinto for the hungry. You know, um, and so you could do the same. You could grow loads of corinto for you know your bulk cucumber eating, but then for your pay attention, go to heaven. You got your diva. You know. Um, we're just beginning to experiment, experiment with greenhouse pepper varieties. I'm not going to give you the names because we grew the ones they say you should grow only with heat. And we didn't. We have a, a movable. I've got the catalog here. You can look at it, you know, and see. Did you find the minutia finally? Yep, that's it. Okay, it's mini t minutina. M I N U T I N A. And that is the, the plantain cultivar that makes the crispy salad green. I can show people too. It's got a real toothy look. It's a really, I'll pass it around, you can look at it. It's a really interesting green, I recommend it. Um, but also in there they have two sets of greenhouse tomatoes. And because we have these curtains that can come over and hold heat in, we stay warmer longer than most greenhouses. I gambled and grew the one that they say to use for heat, which we don't do. And they're doing quite well. I'm very impressed. I'm definitely growing them again next year. I'm considering seeing if I can get them to vault, vegetatively propagate and keep them on the table this winter because they're $1.70 per seed. But you know what? If you're buying peppers or selling peppers, your first harvest will pay for that. The peppers are like this, and they're big and meaty, and they're tasty, and they're not at all um, parsimonious in their production. They give you a lot of production. So they're worth it. You know? and you just have to, if you look at the price, you're not going to pay for it. But then if you think about how much it costs for a colored pepper and how many they make, you know, it's going to be worth it. You know? um, especially, once again, remember, you're in a greenhouse. Your greenhouse space is very expensive. So you don't, I mean, I'll tell you right now, we do really well with the variety that I wouldn't think we should use in a greenhouse, but it works fine. It's the one we grow outside, right? And that's Pepper King in the North. We grow that because we're in a cool climate. They don't mind the cool nights. They make nice looking peppers. They produce a lot. And you can grow those in the greenhouse. We've gotten them, them, Jimmy Nardella, an Anaheim, and a bull, and a bullnose variety, Cor uh, Corno di Toro, whatever you know, the Italian sweet frying pepper. We grow. We have that mix. That's what we usually grow. We can get those to five feet in the greenhouse sometimes and wow. be very productive. These guys, these guys will go nine to ten feet. What's the name of that? Pardon? What's the name of that? The names of them. They're in Johnny's in the greenhouse section, and I didn't, you know, I didn't learn the names because it's just an experiment. I don't know them well enough to act like I know them. But if you go to the Johnny's section, you get two types. One type is for greenhouse with heat, and that's the one we grew. And then the other one is for hoop houses. I try both. I think that the one for the for heat, if you do what I say, make a big plant and get it out there, and then maybe think about movable insulation over the outside of your greenhouse. I think that one's going to be a winner, and it's even more productive. You know, it gets even taller and stuff. I'm not sure that the other one gets nine to ten feet, but um, really incredible production. You know, really, really worth it. Um, we blew it totally. They take pruning. All of these guys, by the way, you don't let them go crazy. You train them to one or two liters. Everybody know what I mean by a liter? Okay. Tomatoes, peppers, eggplants are all going to have multiple places where they grow up, right? And that's called a liter. And if you're putting them on a trellis, you, can, you have to have support for each liter. So we do our, our cucumbers to one liter, okay? Um, some people do them to two liters, right? Everything else that wants to come off, we tip out the growing, the growing tip so that it doesn't get any bigger, you know? Um, and likewise, tomatoes, you know, you can do one or two liters. We tend to do one liter on those. Um, likewise, on peppers, looks like we're going to have to do at least two or three the way that pepper grows, but it's going to give us the production for that. This year we didn't do it, and only the ones on the leaders are doing well. The other ones are getting so tall and just bending over because they don't have the support. Yeah. Your cucumbers you do vertically as well? Totally. And, and did I hear you say that you do that? You bury the, as it, you pull it down, bury the stem? Yeah, totally. That's the Corinto. That's why we buried probably 60 feet of stem this year. Like I said, back and forth or what? yeah, we go back and forth. Exactly, back and forth. Yeah, yeah. It's it takes a little bit of thinking, actually. It's a little bit of a challenge, but you figure it out, you know. Um, and production is, like I said, 
You know, we were pushing 3,000 pounds, having wiped out in mid-September. There's no reason to think we wouldn't be pushing, pushing 3,500 to 4,000 pounds, having not let the um, squash beetles take those plants down. Is that a pickling cucumber? Or no, it is not. It is a nice, long slicer. There are greenhouse pickling cucumbers. We've tried them. They're pretty darn good. But I've never seen anything produced like Corinto. Mm. You know, if you're going for production, and it's actually fine flavor. I mean, it's not, you know, some, some hybrids are super productive, but they don't taste at all. There's nothing wrong with this cucumber. It tastes good. Um, and it gives you a really nice, big slicer. You know, it's a great cucumber. Wow. Okay, let's see here now. All right, we've got to speed up here a little bit. Eggplants and squash. There's no, I don't know of any particular greenhouse varieties. They all do fine in there. Squash are going to be best if you do successions. Successions are where it's at. Um, they do great, they do great, and then they just start to run out of steam. So you want to have some more coming on, you know. Even more so in a greenhouse because they produce even more. We've also learned we do not do, like you might if you're in a production mode, you might put them every foot to 18 inches, and that could be the most production. In that greenhouse, you want at least two feet, if not three feet. They get massive, you know. They really put size on. They do really well with that size, though. They give you loads of production. We pick hundreds and hundreds of pounds of squash from our greenhouses. Um, I just say go with your favorite varieties. You know? I think they all do equally well. Um, eggplant, we mostly here are partial to the Japanese eggplants. We find that they grow faster and make it to us a more satisfying fruit. Our two go-to eggplants are Oriental Charm and Ping Tung Long. Those are, you can also do Orient Express. All these are noted for being highly productive. Precocious, they come on early. But we always grow a little bit of, um, what is the name of that one? Rosa? Rosa. It's the, the globe one that's like striped lavender and white. Pardon? Rosa Bianca, thank you, yeah. And that's because Rocco and Kendra really like that shape. And so we're growing for the hungry, but we should also make sure the people who grow it are getting what they enjoy. So we grow maybe eight to ten plants of that. And it's not as productive, but for those people that really like that shape, we grow it. You know? um, we produce a lot of eggplant. We give a lot of eggplant away every year. Like I said, the plants are four and a half to five feet tall. You know, they're really producing massively. Um, okay, pest. And I got a picture of that. If we have time for pictures, I hope we do. Um, there are two pests for eggplant. There's not a lot of pests. Okay, I'll take it back. This year and last year, cucumber beetles, even though we farmscaped them out of being a problem for the last 15 years in my, my gardening experience and ever since I've been here, because I'm pretty convinced of the polar vortex, pretty much I've done some research. I've had people say it to me. I'm pretty much convinced now that I said for years I couldn't tell what was controlling the cucumber beetles. I just knew we didn't have them anymore. I'm pretty sure it's the egg eaters of the insect world. And the two stars for us are the C. mac ladybug. She doesn't look like the other one. She's more elongated like a cucumber beetle and she's pink. Okay? And she's fast moving. That's why, because she's got to cover a lot of terri to find, territory to find enough eggs. Mm -hmm. And then the Pennsylvania soldier beetle, which is the shape of a lightning bug, but doesn't have that lamp on the back, right? And it's gold and black. And those two guys eat tons of eggs. And they're usually in our greenhouse very early. Last two years, didn't see them till late June. I think that they are overwintering as adults, and they're counting on crevices and stuff, and the polar vortex took them way back. Whereas the cucumber beetles, juvenile stages in the soil. So we had clouds of cucumber beetles. It was a disaster. They brought on a secondary infection of aphids. It was a zoo. I mean, we just didn't do well at all, for starters. So now I'm ready for it. If we see that again, if we have a polar vortex again, we will be managing those cucumber beetles early. We'll spray surround early, we'll hit them with neem, we probably will never get to that number. You know? Normally we don't have to worry about that. You know? It's not a problem. The other problem that is common is um, Colorado potato beetle on eggplant. They can get out of control. Farmscaping largely controls it. If you're seeing that you're getting behind a little bit, you can simply come through and knock them into soapy water in the morning and you'll, you'll knock them back and allow the farmscaping to, to take over. Once, they, once 
but predators find them, their larvae are just juicy and tasty as can mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. The adults, not much feeds on them. You know? The two-spotted stink bug, I know someone that saw one with its proboscis in between the neck of the potato beetle sucking it dry. Wow. Some of those predatory bugs are quite serious predators. Assassin you know? bugs. Um, yeah, assassin bug gives you a bite, it can hurt for months. Yeah. You know? um, so there are some, but you're not going to get as much control. You're going to mostly rely on the, the things that are more, more likely to get control. Any other, like, of those unusual pests, like so we've had spider mites be a problem on eggplant in the greenhouse, we would dredge with mead, and that'll take care of the problem. And it doesn't take long before natural balance is kicked back in, and we have control. Um, the other pest that's really kind of a shocker, and apparently you don't get it unless you're near rhododendron, mm -hmm. and it's just luck, to, or bad luck to get it, and that's the lace bug. If I can get to show you a picture, you'll see why they're called lace bugs. They're really quite amazing looking insects. And they can build up, if, you're, if they're near, if rhododendron are nearby, they can, for some reason they like eggplant too, they'll move in. They can do a lot of damage. Um, the solution is very simple, surround stops them. You know, if you just put maybe one or two applications of surround, and you knock them way back. Our eggplant was severely impacted early in the season, and we did one application of surround with, with neem, and we actually used a little bit of wood vinegar, a byproduct of biochar, which makes the neem more effective. Stopped them, in, stopped them in their tracks. I thought we need more than one application. One application, haven't seen one since. You know, gave us excellent control. By the way, you will see an occasional tomato hornworm. To me, they're just a joy to see. They usually, I mean, if they get ahead of you, they can do some serious damage, but they usually aren't very high numbers. If you had high numbers, BT would take them out. I recommend that you find them, that you pay attention to where you last saw horse nettle and move the tomato hornworm to the horse nettle. Now you have one guy you don't want working against another guy you don't no, want. Yeah. You know? that, that to me is the perfect solution because the, the, the moth of that um, worm is an incredible thing to see. It, it fills the same space at night that the hummingbird fills. And it's pretty magical to see it. It's really, you know, if you don't have to kill them, you know. Likewise, I don't know if you know, but the swallowtail, blue swallowtail butterfly, yeah. it's, you know, larva is the parsley worm or the carrot worm. Yeah. And it'll, it'll devastate those guys. I pick them up on Wooden Queen Anne's list. I'm not killing those things. You, know. <laughs> you don't have to kill everything. You know, some right. things. Right. But, I mean, maybe if you're on a larger scale, you do need to, and I have no judgment, you know. Those of us that can help that life to go on can, and those that need to make a living should mm -hmm. most certainly make a living. Um, okay. Let's move on here. Uh, Pat, yeah. can I use my backpack sprayer to spray a solution of surround or no go? Yeah, you can. It'll be a little harder, but I've done it. It will work, yeah. Okay. Um, your neighbor, though, if you have trouble, you give me a call and I'll bring the backpack power sprayer down and we'll just get it on there. <laughs> um, it can be done, you know. Um, Okay, so also I'd look at successions of Vortex and Nor'easter, but I'd probably go outside with one. But you might want to then do another one that'll go well into the fall indoors, you know. So you can have, you can have, if you can have beans till you're sick of beans, you know, real easily. You, know, you could be eating them now still. They'd still be producing. Okay. Um, okay, and then I talked, the marmorated stink bug, that, I talked about that in the greenhouse though, right? We all, you remember what I said about that? I don't think we have to go over that again. Okay. Those are the main pests that we have in the greenhouse. Um, if you're growing brassicas in there in the spring, if you for some reason are pushing them longer than they should be in a greenhouse, you'll start to see cabbage worms and stuff. Farmscaping will take care of them. BT will do it if you need it. You know. Okay. All right. Being in the dry, the dry, so to speak. Okay. okay. Ironically, the hardest thing to deal with in a greenhouse is heat, not cold. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it can really, it can really hurt your crops. You know, and it can, it can bring on secondary disease infections and bug infections and stuff like that. Like I said, surround can really help. Uh, properly oriented your greenhouse, this is critical. I'm glad I remember this one, okay? Mm. Most people think that the way to orient a greenhouse is so that the broad mm. side faces south, so it gets all that sun, right? You know what's going to happen? You're going to have to bend it because it's going to get so much heat to overheat. The best way to orient it is north-south so that in the morning, when it's still pretty cold, the eastern sun hits the whole broad side and warms it up really well. And then when it gets high, it's not hitting it as much. Right. And it gives you plenty of heat still, right? But it's not overheating it. You may not have to open the doors in the wintertime, mm -hmm. right? Then, as it's cooling off and getting quite cold for evening in the winter, 
the western sun's just streaming in there, right. warming it up again. So you want that north-south orientation, you can do it. You get much better, um, much better use of the sun. You know? And then come summertime, it's going to be the same thing. You're not going to get that huge overheating in the afternoon, that early heating in the morning. You know, you get the least heating you can get in the middle of the day. So that orientation will help a whole lot. I mentioned surround, both on your plants and on the inside. Some people resort to um, shade cloths. It's just a lot of shade. You're losing, you're losing production. And it's also pricey. So I try not to use it, you know. Okay. Um, diseases. The foliar diseases, really, they're not very bad in the greenhouse. And this is not a, a, a class about how to deal with those kind of diseases. We have that class that's online. Um, I did a whole six hours on that. You can look it up and talk, see. I gave you a good routine for late blight. We have other combinations for other diseases. Um, look those up and use them. You won't see very much in a greenhouse probably, right? What you may see is soil diseases, right? And why you may see soil diseases are two things. If you're in one place, you're not rotating, and that's a big problem. The more you grow cover crops, the less of a problem it is. The more diversity you create with cover crops, the better it is. If you use compost tea and maximize diversity that way, it's better. This year, Marsha was busy on the new farm, didn't do tea nearly as much, and we maximized production. Literally, I wish I had that picture to show you. We had one hand, that's what you call a group of tomatoes. They all come up in, like, in sections, right? There'll be tomatoes here, and then they'll miss a few feet, and there'll be the next section. That's called a hand. We had one hand of tomatoes, 10 full-size tomatoes in one hand. That kind of production is wonderful, but boy, does it stress the plants. The first thing you're going to see is blossom end rot. We saw it a lot until we learned. Marshall taught us this. If you're getting that kind of production, you pick anything with color. I mean the least blush. You know, yeah. actually, you could pick them when they're really light, light green. And they'll, they'll mature and taste almost as good as the ones that vine ripen. Might be a 3 or 4% difference at the most. They really, once they've got that stage, they got everything they need for flavor. And that way, by getting all that off, the plant's putting way less energy into yeah. taking care of that tomato, and then it has more for the next so it can get the... Everybody understand blossom and rot, why we get it? Yeah. Basically, it's about calcium. Right. And it can be because of too much demand for the plant, which is what's happened with us, or irregular watering. You know, you really want to try and water so things are evenly moist all the time. If you let it dry out and then come back and water a lot, what's going to happen? A lot of your tomatoes that aren't split resistant are going to split. Yeah. You know, um, and you're going to cause other problems too, including blossom end rot. You let it go way dry, and boy, you're going to see the blossom end rot. You know? So that's how to solve that. The diseases that we run into in greenhouses, and not very much, but a little bit, are Protophic capsici, the one I talked about, Fusarium, and Verticillium. And this year I talked to our pathologist, she was great, but she didn't believe in anything organic, and she told me we weren't going to get any control with anything I was trying to do, and I said, I'm still going to try compost tea, and trichoderma, trichoderma is a fungus that eats other funguses, mm -hmm. and we applied that, and stopped the Fusarium infection cold. We did not cure the plants that had it, but we stopped it cold, and I got to write to her and tell her that. And it didn't spread. And I said it really nice. I thanked her a lot for all her help and told her about other things she'd helped us with and stuff. But I just got a little aside. I wanted to know that, yes, some of these organic things can work. I wonder if she accepted it. Um, I, I don't think she thought I was lying, but she may think that there was something else that did it, you know, that I, she, we don't know why. It hasn't been triple replicate reductionist science proven, exactly. so it's not true. I mean, you know, yeah. so it goes, you know. Yeah, do it again. Now yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so just pick one that show the least sign of color, and that, that will really reduce that problem. If you don't have that problem, by all means, let them go vine ripe. They, they're the best, you know. But if you start to have that problem, that's your solution. You can do foliar seed feeds of calcium. You can buy Fifth Season has a few different products yeah. that are organically allowed. That'll stop the problem. But I'd rather just do management and not have to do a spray. Can I just grind up eggshell and put it in tea? Um, I don't know that that'll work. Why would eggshell work? Why would it work? Yeah. Why wouldn't it work? I don't know how sol how soluble it is at that stage. You, know? you could try it, but I I can't tell you it worked. You know? Yeah. I mean, you could if you're going to try that, I'd say try some vinegar in there or something. I don't know that it's going to be, you know, just because it's in there doesn't mean it's gone into solution in the water, and the particles aren't going to do it. You know. Um, I just don't know, Cal. I mean, it may work. You know, but I wouldn't want to promise you. You know.
So I covered trellising pretty well, I think, right? Yep. Okay. So then, really, we're coming towards the end. In early August, you're going to go back to the cycle that becomes winter gardening. It's the same crops, you know? And stars, I think I've mentioned some, you know, stars include the cooking greens, all of them, you know, but also those root crops, you know, the radishes. There's a bunch of radishes I love to grow for fall. One I really adore is totally time sensitive, and that's the watermelon, or it's also known as Masato Rose, or red meat, okay? It can get softball size. It's always sweet, it's always spicy, but not, a, not overpowering, powerly so. Crisp and juicy, gorgeous on the inside, either rose colored on the inside, which is why it's called watermelon, because it's green on the outside, rose on the inside. More often, it's very splashes of rose with white, and that's almost prettier. Mm -hmm. They're so gorgeous that I once had a chef yell at me because he wasn't using enough. I had like hundreds of pounds, and he was using them just to make these ribbons of decoration. Oh. And I convinced his underlings to shred it and put it in all these things for these groups that came in, and they were loving it. But he was furious at me for wasting this wonderful resource. I'm like, do you realize how many hundred pounds I have for you? <laughs> you have, he wanted it to be this rare, valuable thing because of how pretty it was. But it doesn't have to be rare and valuable. It can be very productive. You must plant it sometime between the beginning of August and the first week of September. Otherwise, it will make a tiny root and go to seed. It's totally light sensitive. On the other hand, shunko, shunkyo, S-U-H-U-N-K-Y-O, is not at all light sensitive. And it makes a nice, half long, fat, red, tasty radish that's not too hot. And both of these have wonderful eating greens, too. I love multifunctional vegetables. You know? yeah. So all of those. And then there's lots of other great radishes. We, we like alpine for a fall daikon in the greenhouse does very well for us. It doesn't get as long, it's about that big, but it gets fat. And it's very productive, you know. Uh, I showed you rutabagas out there. Rutabagas planted sometime between mid-September and early October will do very well in a greenhouse. You know, I've tweaked it and planted them other times and gotten them to work, but that's a sure thing. Mm. And then I let them stay in until they've been through January, into January, so they have tons of cold. And then I start harvesting them and I love them. They're just so good and really productive. All these root crops, What's great about them is they really ramp up your production, right? You can plant them really close together, and you can fill the bed, and they give you tons of volume, and lots of them have greens you can eat too, so it's win-win, you know? You get a lot of food from them, okay? Um, uh, let's see. So, essentially, the stuff I talked about for winter, it's about the same difference. Um, and then basically the last thing to consider is you're managing this greenhouse, right? That means you don't just take, you have to give back to. You know, you're going to get the most production you've ever gotten from your greenhouse if you pay attention to the fertility. You know? So no matter what size greenhouse, take at least a fifth or a quarter and just give it a, a rest to cover crops. You know? At least a full season, maybe even two seasons, right? Otherwise, you can't do that for the whole greenhouse. You need production. That's why you have a greenhouse, right? Under sow, religiously. Come in and sow cover crops underneath as those plants, you know. Any tomato, when it's about that big, any pepper, any eggplant, they're going to dominate. They're not going to be hurt by an under sown crop, you know. They're going to do fine, you know. And then when they start to thin out, that crop is going to start to take over. One exception, cow peas. Uh, cow peas can really, you know, I, would, I, I actually would say you want to think about the summer cover crops. I mean, likewise, Sudex, I think you'd have to mow it back a little bit. It would, it would start to get ahead, you know. I go with more like buckwheat and millet um, and something like soybeans, you know. Cow peas, because they vine, can really start to get ahead. On the other hand, we've done it, and it just takes a little bit of manage, management. You can knock them off again. They don't cause that much problem, you know. And the good thing is, cow peas are also, the leaves are edible. So in the summertime, when you don't have a lot of greens, if you've got cow peas growing as a cover crop in your greenhouse, you can go in there and pick all the younger greens, and they're delicious. And you get tons of greens that way, too. And so then you're feeding the soil and feeding yourself, and it pays off, you know? Other things to think about is, you know, a greenhouse is a soft, small enough space. I'd look at one of the biochar products. You know, you're really going to be getting a lot of production per foot, square foot. Um, 
you know, we partner with, you know, John Nilsson, he's got a whole bunch of ones, but there are other people who have them out there too. I think about, you know, using a, char a charcoal product because it's going to really help you to maximize that life, you know. I'd also invest one time excellent application of compost. Then I wouldn't keep doing it. You can build up too much phosphorus and potassium doing it that way, but then I do a little bit every time I plant. And I make really good compost or buy it. If you can't do either of those, go to worm castings. I mean, a worm box is really easy to do. I mean, I don't know if I have time to tell you here, but I'm happy to tell you during the meal how easy it is to do. And the worm castings are spectacular, diverse life, and that's what you need to be putting in there. Try to um, give it compost tea if you're making it, right when you're cutting that cover crop down or rolling it, because that's going to speed up how fast it breaks down. Um, and it's also that life is going to be protected by that knockdown cover crop, you know. And also, I talked about it out there, I don't know if people heard it, but the best way to plant is no-till. You can even do that in a greenhouse. You simply grow your cover crop up, and then when it will die from being knocked over, you seed it to the next cover crop, and then knock it over. And then it'll come up right through it. Or if you have a flail mower, you know, and there's a bed out there, I can show you the pictures on my phone, that I did that um, in Right before we had that super moon um, event that was happening in solar eclipse, I did it the, the Wednesday before that, and then we mowed down a huge tall cover crop. You would think it would bury the seed, right? And I came back on the Tuesday after that super moon, and the, the, the cover crop was that tall. Wow. And it just popped incredibly. And so it had that covering cover crop instead of soil, and it took off. Yeah? What's your recommendation for putting out crops that are on a raw like clay? Um, you got heavy clay soil. Um, I would say you probably want to amend where you put each hole, you know, where you put each plant. And if you want a direct seed, I would think about starting with lasagna beds probably. I'd make it, you know what a lasagna bed is? I'd make a lasagna bed while you're growing the cover crops to break up that soil and build it. And the less you till it, the faster the cover crops are going to fix that. The more you till it, the longer it's going to take to improve that soil. You know? So you might incorporate compost once, then just go to cover crops and go to multi-species cover crops. Mm. Look at our video. Is the whole video on there now? Yes, soil and diverse cover crops. There's like seven parts. It will blow your mind. I tried the broad form, but I turned in a lot of wheat, wheat, a lot of wheat litter. Mm -hmm. from all the and did that help or did you break the broad fork? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not breaking that metal creature thing. Uh-huh. Steel one? Yeah, okay. But the, the clay is so compact, I don't know sure what we're going to do. How about those yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. But, the, but the, that's probably the multi-species cover crops. Yeah. So a bunch of the cover crops that, I'm ta that I've talked about are spectacular for opening up that kind of stuff. She ca called one clod buster. It's an oil seed radish, a forage radish. You can get that fat, go that deep. Yeah. You know? And so when it rots, right, if you're growing cover crops and maybe top dressing with compost, some of that's falling in there and that's changing that structure incredibly. Mm -hmm. You know, air is going to pass in there. All the plants you're planting are pumping exudates in there. They're going to be feeding the light that's going to change it. The fungi are going to change it. Likewise, the Facilia tanacetifolia, it's got a root like comfrey or borage. They go deep and strong. They bust that soil open. Unlike those two, it's not particularly invasive. Yeah. You, know? um, so you wouldn't use the broad fork then? Mm -hmm. I worked the soil once and I'd stop working it. You, know? you work the soil once to get your amendments in there that you need. And then every time you work the soil, you're setting the soil back. There's no place in nature where you work the soil, you know. But I'd put a bunch of compost in there and leaves the first time. You know, if you don't think you did that well enough, I'd do it one more time. But then I actually used to do a talk. I called it one step forward, three steps back. And that's when I used to double dig my whole garden. And I would haul in tons of manure and double dig it every year. And I had heavy clay and it never got any better. Because I was putting so much oxygen in that there was a feeding frenzy and everything got eaten. I had great production, you know. But the soil never got any better. So, yeah. When I stopped working it, then I started to see changes. You know? If I use plants to open up that soil, you know, plants are what opens up the soil. When we come in and, and bust it open, we're disrupting all that fungi. You know, we're disrupting all that light. And we're putting way more oxygen than is natural in the soil. And what happens is the organic matter that's so critical to changing your soil, it's food for the microbes. You know? And your plants will do great, by the way. You know, I got a friend that got mad at me because I said I didn't want to sell our tiller to him. I said he could use it. He said, don't tell me how to grow. This system works. I don't need to fix it if it's not broken. You know? And it's like, no, you don't. But you're not going to make the progress forward because all that potential organic matter is going to get eaten up every time you till. 
And you're gonna, you see great results from that. That's all food for the microbes. The plants will grow like crazy. You're just never going forward. In fact, for me, I felt like I was going backwards. I don't know if it was three steps, but I felt like I wasn't getting forward like I needed to. Yeah. So, so you don't stir your soil at all? I mean, how do you, I, how I do you think, if you, if you broadcast a cover crop, how does it? I mow down or roll down the previous growth. It could be weeds, whatever. They cover up the stuff and the crop comes right up through it. It works like a charm. You know? Where I have, we have to do work, we work with soil some. We work it for things we have to direct seed, like carrots, you know, corn. But you know what? I was giving a talk at the growers group two years ago, talking about this, and as I gave the talk, I realized, if I was on top of it, if I went out there now, we we're gonna grow corn and carrots next year, and I'd get a mini lasagna bed just in the space where I'm gonna seed, by next year, by the time I was ready to plant, it would all be rotted, and the soil would be soft and wonderful, I wouldn't have to work it at all. So that's what I hope to come to next. And that's the kind of stuff I'm going to be teaching this May. You know, that's, I figured it's time. There's tons of systems out there for large-scale no-till, tons of equipment. You're on your own for small-scale no-till. So I, I, I'm pretty, yeah. pretty thoroughly convinced it's the future of agriculture. You know? We can't afford to keep doing it. Every time we work the soil, we get erosion. Nobody's making any more of this. It takes a long, long time to make an inch of soil. And we're mining our soil. We have to stop doing that. If we go to no-till, we will stop doing it. And we'll get more production. We see more fertility and greater production every year that we don't till here. And I, this is not, I don't mean to guilt trip somebody. If the only way you can get your garden in to use a till, is to use a tiller, then by all means, get the garden in. It's far better that you're growing your own vegetables than you're, they're getting them from California, right? Maybe you can till a little less, though. Don't till it till it's so fine that you love how it looks until it rains and then it turns into a dough. Right. Um, just work it as fast as you can if you have to till. You know, I don't mean to say don't till, but let's try to figure out ways not to because it is the future. And frankly, the, the big future, the, the long-term future, is the incorporation of animals with food production. That is the natural cycle. That's where we need to get. Obviously, the home gardener, not that easy. But down the road, we might figure it out. That's about it. I don't know. You, is it time for food? Okay. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just put the pictures on and I'll just flip through them while we're eating. Yeah. And we'll get to see them. It'll be like kind of, you know, dinner entertainment, okay? Yeah.